Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! been wondering, wondering how many people realize the power of the printed word. Of course, maybe you're wondering, too. Maybe you're wondering how come a frontier town lawyer like me, Chad Remington, should feel he's entitled to get up on a soapbox about the printed word, uh, newspapers, and the power of public opinion. Well, like all lawyers, perhaps I'd better present my brief. See if I can't convince you just how important newspapers can be to a raw, tough territory like the frontier. Not too long ago, I received one of those infrequent telegrams signed by an old friend of my father's, Ike McCauley, who prints and publishes the greatest little newspaper in our part of the country, The Independent. Ike told me he was in trouble, intimating bad trouble, trouble that might need the advice of a lawyer, and I gathered a good deal more. So, mustering out that ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon, who runs the livery stable over which I have my tiny office, we started out for the toughest, most rowdy, and largest town any place west of Abilene, Dobie City, on two of the least spavined horses from Cherokee Stable. Can't my fat brain barrister, would you be so kind as to answer a question for me? Now, look here, O'Bannon. If it's anything to do with stopping in a barrel house before we get to Doby City, the answer is a definite no. And you may be an attorney, my boy, but you're certainly not a mind reader. First off, should I choose to titillate my tonsils, I have a small flask of my genuine Cherokee and then rattlesnake oil with me. Second, that was not the question I was about to... Oh, oh, rain up, Cherokee. What? Compound of corruption was that? Well, it wasn't a bee or a blue tail fly. And I think if you'll look to your left and see the gentleman who's approaching us with a Winchester in his hands, you'll have your answer. So why? Then he blew blazes, Chad. That is what is known in circles I no longer frequent as one tough looking barman. If you're just out for some target practice, mister, you got two more shots coming. There's three for a nickel. I haven't had to practice with this rifle for 25 years. I can hit any target I aim at any time. Well, then I take it your shot wasn't meant to hit either one of us, but it was just a friendly little greeting, huh? Yeah, uh, you might say it was friendly, because I'm here to give you some very friendly advice. Turn them cayuses around and head back where you come from. Have you the audacity to stand there and think that you own this country? Hardner, I don't have to think. I know what I'm talking about, and I'm telling you to slope. Well, uh... I've found you can argue with a judge and argue with a jury, but you never get very far arguing with a Winchester that's aimed right at you. Dad, you mean to say that you're going to let this barrel-chested behemoth dictate to us? No, Cherokee. I, I mean I'm going to see that that rifle barrel gets pointed somewhat. Give me the hand! You bulldog him like a yelling calf! Friends, you better let go of oh, that rifle before something snaps. Light it! Don't do it! Now, get up on your feet. Remington, now you are in trouble. Remington? You hear that, you Cherokee? It wasn't an accident. He was waiting for us. You try going on to Doby City, and you'll find other people waiting for you. The doctor and the undertaker. I'm afraid we won't need either one of them. 
I carry our embalming fluid right along with me. Who sent you out here? Who put you up to this? Well? Certainly sounds as dumb as he looks. I'm waiting for an answer. And you got an awful long wait coming. Because I ain't... Hey, let go! You... Hey, excellent chance. Just proves the validity of the old saying. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Cherokee, I think we'd all be better off if you lend me a hand and help tie this critter up. I'd like a few hours in Doby City before he gets back and reports to whoever it is that doesn't want us there. <laughs> It didn't take us long to get to Doby City after that and to find Ike McCauley from the office of the Independent. Ike's story was just a strange one. Strange and mostly baffling. Chad, I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it is. This other newspaper, this uh, new one, isn't too far from putting me completely out of business. Cough, I can't understand how this other paper... What's his name again? The Doby Democrat. I can't understand how the owner not only can get these... News items that you say are yours exclusively. But after getting them, how he gets them printed and his paper published before you do. If I I knew the answer to that, Cherry Kiki, I'm sure he wouldn't have telegraphed to me. Now, take the cattle prices that I supply every week. I started that several years ago, and it's a costly proposition. However, in cattle country like this, it's a real service to my readers to know what the prices are in Omaha, Kansas City, and the other big markets. Mm -hmm. Certainly is. Tells the ranchers where they can drive or ship to get the most money for their stock. But how do you get these prices, Mr. McCauley? Well, I have six men, one in each of the six large stockyard centers. And each Thursday night, they telegraph me the prevailing prices at the close of business for the week. And your competitor, this other paper, gets the same information at no expense at all? And gets it published and on the street from six to twelve hours before I do. Chad, I'm telling you, the way my circulation is falling off, I, I can't stay in business just another two months. Mm. Who, who owns or runs the other paper, I? A fellow by the name of Jason who moved in here only recently. And if the raid he's going, will end up controlling practically everything around here by the simple device of influencing public opinion any way he wants it to go. Well, obviously he tried to influence us not to come into Dobie City. And it wasn't very public. That was quite personal. <laughs> Yeah, there's something very personal about a Winchester that's pointed right at you. I the obvious answer so seems to be that this Jason, whoever he is, is either paying for or stealing the information from someone who works for you. Man, I, I sure doubt that. You do? Why? Well, first, I have only two people working for me, and I trust them implicitly. And second... How could Jason get the information out of my composing room and still get his paper out half a day before mine? Yeah, that does seem to be a stumbling block. Uh, but let's get back to the people who work for you first. Who are they? Well, my printer, Foley, he's been with me almost since I started publishing. And the only other help I have is my brother's daughter, Nellie, my niece. Oh, what did he say? Young and attractive, he's no doubt? Yes, Nellie's only 23 and she's real pretty. I brought her in here when my brother died. All all he left her was dead. How did that happen, Ike? I mean, you've always been reasonably well to do. Matter of fact, don't I remember your your brother having been in his apartment or yours? He was until he started drinking and gambling. I warned him about it for years. Then, finally, I I had to let him go. Bought him out. When Jim died, I felt the thing to do was to take care of Nelly. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you willing to try a little experiment, Ike? Uh, this being Thursday, it's the day you get your telegrams from your stockyard correspondence, isn't it? Yes, the wire should be coming in any time now. Well, then, what, what I'd like to do after the telegrams get in is to change the prices before you turn them over to Nellie or Foley, or whoever it is that takes charge of them. Change the prices? That's right. And if there is a leak here, Jason will get the wrong information and print it in his paper, which won't, won't do him any good, and will prove to us that the leak is here somewhere in this building. Well, I I didn't telegraph you not, not to take your advice, Chad. So if that's what you want to do, I'll, I'll string along with you. About an hour later, having hidden the telegrams with the real prices safely, we went back into the composing room and met Foley and Nelly. Now... Let's see if we can't get this set up and on the street this time before the Democrat comes out. Uncle Ike, 
I know you think that Mr. Jason is stealing this cattle price information from you somehow, but I don't, don't think he's the kind of man who'd do it. Oh, really, Nellie? You, uh, you know Mr. Jason? Well, I've met him. He seems nice, real nice. And anyhow, how... Why shouldn't he have his own men send him the prices just the way you're doing it, Uncle I? For the pure and simple reason that, well, he wouldn't spend a plug nickel if he could get it for nothing. Yeah, that's the way I feel about him. Well, then you know Jason, too, eh, Foley? Well, I don't actually know him. I mean, I've seen him like everybody else in Dobie City has. <laughs> you can't miss him. Big ten-gallon white hat, checkered vest, boots embroidered with gold threads, smoking big cigars... <laughs> No, sir. Any money that one spends, he spends on show. From your description, Foley, Mr. Jason sounds like he'd make a very successful medicine man. Uh, well, if we stand here flapping our jaws, the Independent never will get printed. So what do you say we go about our business and leave the newspaper to those who know about it? <laughs> as soon as a reasonable time had elapsed, I left Cherokee at the hotel and walked down to the office of the Dobie City Democrat. I wanted to get my hands on a copy of their paper. I walked in and up to the counter. There was a man seated at the desk with his back toward me, engrossed in what he was writing. From the loud plaid shirt, I gathered it was Jason himself. There was a small stack of newly printed papers on the counter, and as long as the man in the office hadn't noticed me, I picked one up. There were the out-of-town cattle market prices in a box on the front page. But not the false prices we turned over to Nellie and Foley. The actual prices that had been telegraphed in. This was quite a shock. Only the first shock I got in that few moments. Because just then the man turned around, got up and walked over to the counter. Yes, sir. Is there something... Well, Chad. Chad Remington. Ship. What are you doing here? Where would you expect the owner of the paper to be if not in his office? Wait. You're Jason, the owner of the Democrat? Mm Mm-hmm, one and the same. And if the new name of Jason bothers you, (laughs) a numerologist told me to change it. Said that's why I never made a successful lawyer like you. You never even finished studying law. Yeah, I know, but my clients didn't. Well, what brings you in here, Chad? I came in to have a little talk with the owner of the paper. Now that I know it's you, I realize talking isn't going to do much good. Because as in the old days, Chip, we're again on the opposite sides of the fence. I got a feeling that before I'm through in Dolby City, I'm going to bust down that fence and wrap the rails right around your stubborn head. Oh, is that so? Well, Chad, if you think you can do it, go right ahead and try. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you just try and see where it gets you. (laughs) Because I think it'll only get you stretched out right up in Boot Hill. return to the second act of Five Gun Final, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. Frontier Town. I found it pretty difficult to explain the genuine feeling of shock I suffered in finding Chip, the owner of the opposition paper. Not only did it make the job a little distasteful, but now knowing Chip, I knew he was slick and smooth and capable. Of course, that was only part of my frustration. The other part was finding the little scheme I'd devised of changing the prices had meant nothing. That Chip Jason's paper had the true and accurate cattle prices neatly boxed on page one. My first impulse was to walk out of the office with the half-meant warning I'd given Chip and let it go at that. But I couldn't quite bring myself to it. I hadn't seen him in about ten years. Not only was there a lot I wanted to say to him, but a lot I wanted him to remember. <laughs> You ought to sell your Blackstone and law library and go into the publishing business too, Chad. You can have the men who make the laws. 
When you're a newspaper publisher, you're the man who makes the men who make the laws. You haven't changed a bit, have you? No, phrases be. That is, I've gotten a little smarter, I think. My philosophy of life is actually just what it was when we were studying law together. Yeah, I remember. That's how you got your nickname, too. Chipper. Nothing ever bothered you, not even your conscience. How could my conscience bother me? I never had one. No, I guess not, or else you couldn't do things like this. Publish these stockyard quotations. Why, those quotations are the backbone of my success. A real public service to my readership. I wouldn't care if you bought the news. Oh, but I do. I pay a good price to get that cattle information. Don't lie to me, Chip. I'm not lying. I don't like to be called a liar. No real man does. You keep that up and you'll find out how real a man I am. You're the last man in the world I'd want to look at over the barrel of this. But if it comes to a showdown, well... You'll be making a mistake, Chad. I'm a pretty influential gent in this community. Too influential to trifle. But not quite influential enough to make me quit this case. That's up to you. Entirely. Especially if McAuliffe has enough money left to pay your fee. I'm not worried about my fee. Well, if the old man does run out of cash, he's still got that niece left. You know what I mean. <laughs> you better get out of here, Remington. Get out. And fast. And you better learn to talk like a gentleman if you remember how. Goodbye, Chad. Let's just make it hostile awake. And in case you don't remember, that means goodbye for now, but I will be seeing you again. <laughs> For me, Chad, I can't understand why you've got me chained to this hotel porch when we could be across the street in one of those places of entertainment. I told you before, old man, and I got some thinking to do. A lot of things. He told me that what's his name was no good when you knew him years ago. No, it isn't that Chip's just no good, but hell, he's always felt that a man doesn't have to work for a living. Just work enough to get a little money, and then that money will bring power. I hope you're not going to let this. Uh... Your former friendship with this gentleman deter you from trying to clean this up. You ought to know me better than that. How can you clean something up when you don't know where he's getting the information? I thought surely that changing the figures in the telegrams today would... Well, go on, go ahead. Cherokee, look. Across the street. Across the... Well, well, I'll be blamed. Isn't that Nellie, Ike McCauley's niece? Sure is. And the gentleman she's with, who's holding her arm so closely, is Chip Jason. <laughs> Come on, Cherokee. We're going to follow those two, and after Chip takes her home, we're having a little talk with Miss Nellie. A mighty serious talk. I don't care what you say. Chip Jason's been the only person who's been decent to me ever since I've gone to work in this town. My dear Miss Nellie, you mean to stand there with your sweet little face looking angry? Tell me you think it's wise to consort with someone like this Chip Jason after all your Uncle Ike has done to you? Uncle Ike. The only thing he's done for me is to make me work for the money which really belonged to my father anyhow. Doggone it, Nellie. You shouldn't even think things like that, let alone say them. What right have you got to tell me what to do? Uncle Ike or not... What I do with my life after I get through working for that $12 a week he so magnanimously pays me is my own business. No one's life is their own business, Nellie, particularly when there's a sharpshooter like Chip Jason involved. Now, if you Leave wanna... me alone. Do you hear me? Leave me alone. That girl got a temper. She certainly didn't want to talk about it, did she? You, if you were selling your uncle out? Now, uh, look, you old charlatan, there's not one shred of proof that she's selling out anybody. If she happens to be, at least she's admitted her motive. Somehow she seems to be very bitter about Ike being forced to buy out her father. Well, then... If Jason is getting the information from Ike's composing room, it still leaves Mr. Foley to check up on, if we want to be positive. Foley? How do you propose to do that? <laughs> I got a very unintelligent idea. Oh? Uh, that, uh, you're going to like it. Am I? If Mr. Foley's like any of the printers I've ever known, then he's in one of the five saloons in town drinking. Why didn't I become a printer? So I'm going to advance you $10 and turn you loose to find Foley and buy him some drinks. Hallelujah. Counsels, curb your impatience. Sucker is at hand. I said to buy drinks for Mr. Foley. You've got to abstain yourself so you'll be able to pump Foley for whatever information you can get out of him. <laughs> that, sir, is not only placing Satan behind me, but in front of me and all around me. 
A hero that I am, I'm no man to fight off eight, Satan. Now, you better do as I tell you, Cherokee, because if you start imbibing, your head will be so big in the morning, I'll have no trouble hitting it with both of these fists. <laughs> now, go on, and don't drink anything but the chasers. Bartender, two more to save. Now, what was that you were saying again, Mr. Foley? Huh? I, no, I wasn't saying nothing, except he's to you. Here's mud in your eye. Down the old... Water. You, you want some water? Oh, here, we'll take mine. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. I have poor water. Oh, now that ain't healthy. Water's good for you. Water may be good for the average person, Mr. Foley, but I happen to be a man of iron. Water makes me rust. Now, what was that you were saying again? Something about good old Ike? Here's to good old Ike. As fine a man as ever run a newspaper. And the finest man I've ever worked for. Now, then, let's have one on me, O'Bannon. Uh, no, I don't think so, Mr. Foley. If it's all the same to you, I'll be going over to my hotel and floating to bed. <clears throat> Water and horrors. I may be amused now, but I certainly wasn't then. In the first place, it was a little disconcerting to learn that Foley loved Ike like a father and had no motive for selling him out to Chip Jason. And second, after six glasses of water and five drinks of good bourbon slyly spilled in the brass receptacle at the bar, Cherokee was no man to share a hotel room with. You know what they say about a woman spurned? Well, Cherokee had a fury that was much worse. And something else, Mr. Remington. Just for what you made me submit to... Starting the first of the month, I'm raising your rent five dollars. Oh, go on, you old fraud. That sublime sense of self-sacrifice you're enjoying is making you feel so holy that even a teetotaler like me can't stand you around. I should get Satan behind you and help him push. Now, are you sure that's all Foley said? I have never been more cold sober in my life. And I assure you, I've repeated every word he said verbatim. And since my brain is clear as it is, I'll save you a lot of trouble by telling you that there's no doubt Nellie is selling out her uncle. I'm oh, sorry, Cherokee, but while you were wrestling with Satan, I concluded it can't be Nellie. Can't be? Nope. Thirty minutes after we gave Nellie the cattle prices to set up, Chip's paper was printed with the accurate information. There's only one way that could have happened. That Chip had access to the telegrams before I got them. Can this be possible? Well, we'll soon find out. Because in your precarious, sober state, you're taking a horse and riding over to Acacia Springs. Acacia Springs? Acacia Springs. And you're going right to the Western Union office and send a telegram from there stating that there's been a flood which has closed Doskin Pass and that any ranchers wanting to drive their cattle to the railroad had better pick another route. What do you expect to accomplish by that kind of a telegram filled with misinformation? I expect to wind this thing up by tomorrow and get back home where I won't have to occupy a room with you moaning like the ancient mariner. Now, now go on, Cherokee. Get going. Chip Jason couldn't wait for his regular edition. He came out with a special edition with a banner line in 72-point type announcing the flash flood that had closed Doskin Pass. Five minutes after the paper hit the street, the town marshal had arrested the local telegraph operator. And armed only with his confession, I set out to pay one more call on my old friend Chip. Where I give my news is my business, Chan. Chip, you're in for a big disappointment. Because the only real news in Dobie City right now is this headline in the Independent. Here. Dobie oh, said Jason arrested for fraud. Are you loco? This is an out-and-out lie. Oh, then I suppose this is, too. This confession from the telegraph operator that he'd been taking money from you to give you all news information that came over the Western Union wires. Why, that's a lot of... <laughs> you were pretty smart, weren't you, Chad? And so were you, playing up to Nellie McCarlick and taking her out in public to make it appear that she was giving you the information. That was pretty slick, too. I should have known you'd have figured that. But there's only one thing wrong with this headline, Chad. They haven't arrested me yet, and they're not going to. You're right about that. They aren't going to arrest you. I am. And I'm placed... Chip, leave that gun alone. I'm sorry you made me do that, Chip. You went for your gun first. I know you're in the deep end. You said you were going to wrap that fence rail right around my head. The only thing you hit were my... Stomach and shoulder. <laughs> what 
made you suspect the Western Union operator, Chad? No, I was bothered about how Chip got the news so far in advance of the time when Ike got the telegrams. But what cinched it in my mind was remembering what happened to us the other day on the way to Dobie City. You mean about that gun toter who tried to warn us to go back home? Exactly. Since Ike sent me a telegram asking me to come over, someone must have had access to the wire. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> because you were too busy wrestling with Satan. Well, now that it's all over, I suppose there's no harm in telling you that I wrestled with him and won the bone. But I did it with a little trick. Oh, so? What trick was that? Well, Satan got me down once and knocked the wind out of me. Knowing I needed some stimulation to win the bout, I took three small slugs of bourbon while he wasn't looking. Then I got up and threw him horns, hoofs over hoofs, and right out of the rain. Well, well, the dickens you did. The devil I didn't. <laughs> Across the rugged Indian territory rides a tall young man on a mission of mercy. His medical bag strapped on one hip, his six-shooter on the other... This is Dr. Six-Gun. The National Broadcasting Company brings you another episode in the exciting adventure series, Dr. Six-Gun. Gray Matson, M.D., was the gun-toting frontier doctor who roamed the length and breadth of the old Indian territory. Friend and physician to white men and Indian alike, the symbol of justice and mercy in the lawless west of the 1870s, this legendary figure was known to all as Dr. Six-Gun. The territory is a place where men look up to the skies and call out to heaven in many different ways. We have seen the wagons of the Mormons rolling west, Dunkards, Mennonites, the Catholic Padres of the Spanish missions to the south and the west, and in the Indian country the worship of the Manitou, the sun, and the spirits of the dead goes on as it has for a thousand years before the coming of the white man. Uh, sometimes these different peoples, overwhelmed with their separate truths, have uh, been somewhat impatient to each other. Of course, I am a neutral. I am the brother of whoever made needles or pins or a yard of ribbon. And who am I? <laughs> Pablo, the gypsy peddler. <laughs> and this is my friend Midnight. <laughs> and he is a raven, but a philosopher. <laughs> oh, man of brother. <laughs> you see, a humanist. Words, too. <laughs> and a universalist. <laughs> of course, in the territory, a place of violent death and violent life, Many men face eternity with a curse and a defiant pistol shot into the quiet sky. Such a man was Harvey Fraser. He was standing at the end of the bar at the Bull Ron Saloon one night drinking quietly. I was sitting at a table with Doc Six Gum when O'Shea, proprietor of the Bull Ron, came up to the table. Evening, Doc. Everything all right? O'Shea, Tiny's cooking is improving week by week. <laughs> this steak is much tenderer than the one I had last Monday. It uh, ain't Piney that's improving, Doc. It's the side of beef both them steaks come off of. It's aging and mellowing. Mm. Too bad the same can't be said for your whiskey. <laughs> I don't get the turnover in beef I get in whiskey. It ain't got time to age. Sometimes it ain't got the time to quit sloshing around in the barrel from the wagon ride over from the distillers in Chisholm City. Well, <laughs> you keep right on serving it, O'Shea. I'm figuring on all the cases of whiskey poisoning and delirium tremens to support me in my old age. <laughs> you can't fool me, Doc. You keep talking temperance every time you get the chance. I don't mind. Every man to his own brand of foolishness. Which reminds me, I wish you could talk a little temperance to Harvey Fraser over there. Was that the tall cowpoke at the end of the box? Yeah. He comes in here every week and starts in on a bottle. He gets quieter and quieter and meaner and meaner until... Well, last week he would have shot Luke Garrett clean through the head. Only his hand wasn't steady enough and he missed. Why do you serve him? His money's as good as the next man's. Besides, he'd get liquored up somewhere else and then come back here looking for me. What do you want me to do? I was wondering, uh, isn't there something, you know, a little powder I could kind of sneak into his drink so he'd uh, just 
Pass out, peaceful like. Don't look at me. Oh, now, Doc, couldn't you see your way now, clear look, to O'Shea, give me... Uh... you've got your professional ethics and I've got mine. You serve him your liquor and I keep my medicine for six folks, okay? I might have figured you'd say that, Doc. Well, maybe I can kind of tag him behind the ear with my pistol butt when he ain't looking. It ain't as neat, but it'll keep the ethical situation a little more comfortable all around. <laughs> About a week after that, Doc and I rode out to the west of town. Doc was riding a circuit of calls, and I had my pack. Pablo, what do you know about this Colonel Turo? Oh, nothing. Why? Oh, he's my first call. He must have bought the Jessamine place down by the river. Sent a note in with a rider and find it Arthur Turo, Colonel. Oh, is he with the Army Post at Fort Kane? No. No, I, I know all the officers there. There hasn't been a transfer. I expect it's a southerner still carrying his Confederate rank. Wonder what he'd say if I introduced myself using my rank, Private First Class Matson. <laughs> I must try that sometime. Doc was right. The military title was left over from the war. Colonel Turo was a tall, graying man, soft-spoken, but with a glint of steel showing through. You think she'll be all right then, Doctor? I see no reason why not. She's a healthy young... Uh, healthy woman. You can say it, Doctor. She's young and I'm not. Well, anyway, she'll have no trouble giving birth, as far as I can see. We figured she's in her fifth month. Well, I'd like to thank you, sir, for traveling this far from town. I would come in myself, but I've been so occupied during the week with putting the ranch to rights. And since I do not travel on Saturday and... I hesitate to intrude on your Sunday... Oh, I'm afraid my Sunday's far from sacred, Colonel... Babies, broken legs, and gunshot wounds have a habit of occurring on the Lord's Day. Sunday? Yes, of course. Oh, uh, you, you mentioned Saturday, didn't you? I suppose you're Seventh-day Adventist. No, I'm afraid my attachment to Saturday as the Sabbath antedates the Adventist by some thousands of years. I beg your pardon, Colonel. I'm sorry to confuse you, Doctor. I am, as a matter of fact, of Hebrew persuasion. Oh, does that surprise you, Doctor? Yes, I suppose it does. Frankly, I never met many... Well, what's the right term, Colonel? You have your choice of many, sir. The most desirable ones being Hebrew, Israelite, Jew. It doesn't matter. Well, out here in the territory, there aren't many of you folks. I recall one doctor when I was a student in Boston, but uh, he was a German mostly. I was just surprised. I thought you were a southerner. I am. Well, I mean... Uh... Uh, pray don't concern yourself, doctor. I know quite well what you mean. As a matter of fact, my family has been in Louisiana and a part of Georgia since revolutionary times. We may have perhaps been something of an anomaly since we ran our plantation on free labor. That is unusual. Uh, perhaps. You see, Doctor, if you know your Bible, you remember that the children of Israel were slaves in the land of Egypt. Of course. Led to freedom by Moses. Well, we have a holiday each year to celebrate that uh, liberation. And I suspect my father became increasingly uncomfortable each year thanking God for the deliverance of his ancestors from bondage while he held the ownership papers of some hundreds or more slaves, several of whom served the dishes of bitter herbs that are supposed to remind us of the bitter days of slavery. I can see that he might. My father, being not only a righteous man but a good planter as well, freed the slaves and set a reasonable price, taking it out of wages over a good many years. By the time I came into the property, all our people were free and working for wages. It made us somewhat unpopular in the county. But uh, you fought for the South? Yes, it was my country. Pray do not point out the inconsistency. I'm well aware of it. And now, Doctor, I'd like to invite you to join us this evening. At, uh, it is the eve of the New Year. The, the New Year? Our calendar is somewhat ancient, Doctor, and has tended to drag a little. Take my word for it, though. It is the new year. And so Doc and I were invited to spend this alien holiday with Colonel Turo and his young wife. We had apple dipped in honey, which we were told signified the wish for a sweet and prosperous new year. We did not see Colonel Turo again until next week. 
He came into the bull run on Friday morning and found Doc eating his breakfast. Good morning, Doctor. I'm pleased to see you again. Well, Colonel Turo, what brings you to town? A business, I'm afraid. I've been arranging to import some budded stock to replace the Longhorns. Uh, won't you join me for breakfast? Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. O'Shea? Huh? Oh, what is it, Doc? This is Colonel Turo. He'd like some breakfast. Well, sure thing. Uh, what'll it be? Steak? A little pie? Hash? I think just a boiled egg and black coffee, if you will. Oh, that ain't enough breakfast for a fly, hardly. It'll do nicely, I assure you. Well, all right, but a boiled egg ain't hardly a challenge to find it. <laughs> uh, Colonel, I don't know if I thanked you enough when I was out to your place. I just hope I wasn't intruding on your, your observances. Oh, no, no, not at all, sir. I was about to ask a favor of you. Sure, what is it? Well, it's rather complicated. You see... I won't get my reply from St. Louis about the cattle until afternoon stage gets in from Chisholm City. Now, at that time, I would be unable to reach my home by nightfall. It's a clear trail, though. Besides, it's the full of the moon. You shouldn't have any trouble. I'm afraid I have made my problem clear. At sundown this evening, the Sabbath stops. I see. Now, I'm afraid I've compromised my inheritance a number of times. Probably if that were all, uh, I I would ride home and... Well, in a modern world, the old ways sometimes are not followed too strictly. But this evening is the start of... Uh, well, the Hebrew word would not mean anything to you. But it's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's an important day. It's most solemn of our year, Doctor. It's the day when all the sins of mankind are brought forward for judgment. When we repent and mourn and consider our conscience carefully. It's a day that weighs most heavily on us. For example, I told you of my father freeing his slaves. Well, it was on the Passover that the idea occurred to him. It was on the Day of Atonement when he examined his heart and set them free. I see. Then you don't want to be traveling on that day. That's right. And more, inasmuch as there is no congregation to hold any services in these parts, I would like to spend the day alone in meditation. Now, at the lodging house, I have been sharing my room with a stockman from Texas. Well, uh, <laughs> he's a cheerful sort, but he, he's not exactly conducive to meditation. <laughs> I wondered if there might be a room in your house. Why, of course, Colonel. It'd be a pleasure. I won't be any trouble. It's our custom to fast on this day, so even that difficulty need not trouble you. Be no trouble, Colonel. I'll be proud to have you as my guest on a day that means a lot to you. Contrary to the impression I may have given you, sir, I am not really a particularly pious man. But this day, I feel somehow it is a mark of respect to my father and my people. I suppose you've met Southerners overcome with mourning for their fallen country. Yes, yes, I have. Well, sir, on this day, we mourn our country that fell almost 2,000 years ago. Colonel Turo sat with Doc through the afternoon, waiting for his message on the afternoon stage. He passed the time telling Doc of the customs of his people of the South before Fort Sumter and trading war experiences. It was about an hour before sundown when O'Shea came over to Doc's table. Doc. Doc. Uh, hey, excuse me, Colonel. What is it, O'Shea? It's Harvey Fraser. He hasn't been in here today, has he? Yeah, yeah. He was in before you, became, uh, before you came in. He's, he's been fired off the barrel A. And he was in a mean mood. I gave him one drink, and I told him I wasn't going to serve him no more. Well, I thought that was contrary to your professional... Uh... Now, look, I'm not joshing, Doc. I told him I don't mind a rocket drunk or... Even a fighting drunk. But I'm plain scared to death of the quiet, mean kind. I told him to get out. I had my gun on the bar so he'd know I wasn't punning. And he got. Then what's the problem? Well, I told you he'd get his liquor somewhere else. Picked up a quarter mule down at the livery stable, and he's been sucking on it all afternoon. Oh, you think he's coming back here after you? I know darn well he is. Charlie seen him coming up the street. Uh, he should have given me them pills or something. I... There he is outside the swinging doors. Now, wait, wait. Put those guns up, O'Shea. He may not be shooting. Well, anyways, he finished his bottle. Where is he? 
Where is that sniveling psalm singing barkeep that won't serve a man liquor? Now take it easy, Harvey. Why, I you Now, Harvey, you're just talking plain foolish. Yeah? Well, you ain't got a gun on me now, O'Shea. As a matter of fact, I got one on you. Now, Harvey. Drop your gun belt to the floor. Go on. Uh, let me put him up on the bar. I, I don't want to get sawdust in the barrel. Now, now wait a minute, Fred. Don't, don't you horn in on Doc. I'm running this here drive. Put them guns down, no shame. All right, now you gonna serve me? Ain't you had enough for the quarter mule? I said, are you gonna serve me? Sure, 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 Harvey. What's your pleasure? A whiskey. Make it full measure. And I'm going to let it go at that, O'Shea, because I ain't mad at you. I'm looking for some low, sneaking red polecat that took my job. Where does that man work, Doctor? The Barrel A, I think. Oh, you know what that crawling hound done to me? He fixed it so as I got fired. The boss says I don't need so many hands now, so, Harvey, here's your time. I don't get it. What's the Southerner got to do with it? Maybe I can explain I suppose the owner of the barrel A decided he didn't need as many men after he sold half his range acreage to a newcomer. That's right. Who are you? Arthur Turo. I bought the land from the barrel A. Why, you... Look out. You're wearing a gun. Make your move. I want to talk to Make you. Make your move or I'll gun you down right now. All right, all right. Get his gun, O'Shea. My hand. Stop my hand. He didn't hit you, Fraser. He got your gun. I was aiming for his hand. That's some shooting anyway. You've got some move from leather, Colonel. In the old days, it was a fashion in my country among the gentry to duel for slights to their honor. In my case, I was often slighted, and I seldom lost to duel. <sighs> Doc, I can't feel my fingers. Just soak them in cold water. They'll be all right. Maybe you better soak your head, too. I'll take care of that, Doc. I got the dish pail right here. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you wanted him to sober up, didn't you, Doc? <laughs> You've done this to me, Mr. Colonel, whatever you are. You lost me my job and hurt my hand. All right, now you listen. You and this pot-bellied barkeep are plenty brave when you got my gun. Well, I think you're a no-good cowardly hound. We don't want you or anybody like you in the territory. Coming in and pushing other people out. I thought we settled this. No, no, we didn't. Now you listen. I'll be waiting for you in the street tomorrow morning. Cold sober so my hand's steady. If you get any guts, you'll be there. And we'll settle it then. O'Shea, give me my gun. Give it to him. Here you are, Harvey. Now, get out. I'll be waiting for you tomorrow, Colonel. Well, Doctor, if you don't mind, as it approaches sundown, I think I'd like to retire. Sure, sure, Colonel. Come on, I'll show you the way. We all walked over to Doc's. There was no mention of Harvey Fraser and his challenge. When we got to the house, Colonel Turo opened the carpet bag and took out a prayer book and a long white shawl with a black striped reach end and fringes. This was my father's prayer shawl. And so the legend goes, his father's before him. Doctor, I'll just ask you to hold my gun. It's not proper for the day, you know. The custom is to follow the biblical injunction to do no work. which is held to mean to carry no money and, of course, no weapons. Actually, Doctor, being alone and not a learned man... I can only make a respectful gesture toward the service. But I do what I can. And so, throughout the evening, Colonel Turo sat by himself, wrapped in the old prayer shawl, and read from the prayer books, murmuring the strange language softly to himself. In the morning, Doc had breakfast at the Bull Run, and the Colonel stayed in his room. I think Doc was much impressed. The unfamiliar ritual was somehow awesome. It's real strange. Here you learn in Bible school all about these people. Chances are you never get to really know any. Not in this part of the country. (laughs) You could have fooled me. I would have thought the colonel was an American. 
Oh, say, when did your father come over from Ireland? 1848, when the potatoes gave out. Why? The colonel had kin way back that signed the Declaration of Independence. Huh? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean, Doc. <clears throat> uh, what did the colonel say about Harvey Fraser? Nothing. Well, Harvey rode into town at sunup. He's been waiting around ever since to catch the colonel on the street. Oh, say, you, you mean he seriously intends... He sure does. He's telling anybody who'll listen that the colonel is a yellow dog who's going to sulk in his room all day because he's scared. But I told you, it, it's this very important religious time for the colonel. That don't make no never mind to Harvey. You'll be telling everybody how he made the colonel back down. But the colonel can't fight or even carry a gun today. It's, it's against his religion. I don't know if Harvey will wait till tomorrow. He's really got blood in his eye. He comes in here for a drink maybe every two hours, just so he won't get too much and unsteady his gun hand. Looks to me like the colonel is over a barrel. Doc went back to the house, and about noon, the colonel got up and started for the door. Wait a minute, uh, Colonel. Where are you going? For a walk. Uh, wait. Uh, I thought... I mean, is that allowed? Oh, it's considered proper to take a short walk on the holy day. But you know, Colonel, this uh, is a pretty wild town. I'm aware of that, sir. Maybe, maybe because of the day, it'd be better to stay in. I don't take your meaning, sir. Well, Colonel, be honest. Harvey Fraser is out there waiting for you. Oh, yes. Yes, he said he would be, didn't he? Oh, you can't go out. Why not? Because he'll gun you down. Doctor... In my old home in our country, if a man challenged your courage and impugned your honor, there was only one thing to do. You meet him. Oh, then, then you're going to take your gun. No, no. Not today, Doctor. But you, you can't just go out there and walk into Harvey Fraser's bullets without your gun, without fighting back. Not today, Doctor. My honor has nothing to do with respect for my father's. Not in this case. I cannot compromise one for the other. Oh, if you'll excuse me, Doctor, I'll take my short walk. Colonel, you... You've still got the prayer shawl on. Yes. I trust the townspeople won't find it too startling. An interesting custom. You know, often a man has the same shawl from boyhood. And when he dies, it becomes his shroud. Well, good morning, Doctor. And peace to you. And so, down the street, the Frenchman's Ford walked Colonel Duro. His flat-crowned hat set square on his head, and around his shoulders the yellowing silk of a prayer shawl shipping in the light breeze. He walked slowly and steadily, as if it were in respect to the day, as if the measured steps along the board sidewalk were but an aid to meditation and prayer. Doc came charging out of the house after him and crossed diagonally to the bull rock. Oh, say, listen, the colonel's out taking a walk. Where's the sheriff? No, no, Doc. Listen, if Sheriff Hanson doesn't do something, oh. we've got to find Fraser and... You the... found him, Doc. What? Didn't see me at the end of the bar? Well, I'm glad to know the colonel's out walking. I'll give him a chance to enjoy the fresh air. Then I'll go out and meet him. He hasn't got his guns. <laughs> Don't hand me that, Doc. man who shoots like that ain't without his guns. Oh, Shay, a little drink. A short one, just for sociability, but not enough to shake your hand. Harvey, let the colonel alone. This is an important day for him. Yeah, sure is, Doc. Get that drink, O'Shea. Yeah. You see how far the old goat got down the street? Huh? Coming back this way. All right, O'Shea, my drink. Here you are. And I'm right sorry to run off like this. But I got an appointment with a polecat for a little walk down the street. Adios, Doc. There was nothing too unusual in the scene. A dozen times in the last year, two men have stood in the dust of the street at Frenchman's Ford. A dozen times, the loungers in front of the livery stable have died for cover, and the barber has run out to put up his shutters. Harvey Fraser stood in the street, his legs planted wide apart, his pets and jammed back on his head. 
his hand hanging limp on the level with his gun butt. We've seen that many times in the territory. And then, Harvey started forward, walking slowly to meet the colonel who stepped down the middle of the street now, as if he were on parade with his regiment. All right, you yellow dog. Make your move. Can't he see the colonel hasn't got his gun? I don't think he cares. I'm going to stop him. I wouldn't, Doc. Harvey gun you down, and in these parts, he'd get off scot-free. Jury don't hold with one fella interfering with another man's fight. It's murder. There ain't nothing to do but wait, Doc. That's all. Closer, they came together on the street. And we could see that the colonel seemed to be talking to himself in that strange tongue of so many years ago. Draw. Go ahead, you old wall-eyed steer. Draw. I give you your chance, sir. Don't come no closer. I'm going... I'm going to gun you down. Draw. Right, you think I won't, you... What's the matter with my eyes? There. I drew my gun. Now make your move. If you take one step more, I'm going... He's down. Come on, Jose. He just fell down like he'd been poleaxed. I got his gun, Doc. What happened, Doctor? I'd already said the prayer for the dead for myself. Shall I rope him, Doc? I don't think you'll have to, O'Shea. When he comes to, he's going to be violently sick to his stomach. Is he ill? I'm too old a man to believe that the Lord intervened in Frenchman's Ford the way he did in Babylon. If it was the Lord, Colonel, he done it through Doc. Uh, ne never mind, O'Shea. Well, he ought to know. Uh, Doc took my advice, finally. He fixed Harvey's last drink while he was looking out the door. And say... <laughs> By the way, what did you put in it, Doc? I'd rather not say. But well, he isn't going to be too comfortable for a few days. <laughs> I should thank you, Doctor. Colonel, I should not have let you go out. No, it was my decision. And now, if you will allow me, Doctor, I should get back to my prayers. I'm afraid I have a grave sin for which to atone. I allowed it to profane a holy day with violence. A sin. How do you figure that, then? False pride, Doctor. Pride, so that a thing as shallow as honor could be allowed to interrupt the holy day. You have been listening to Dr. Six Gun, brought to you each week at this time by the National Broadcasting Company. The Bakers of Weber's Bread present your all-star Western Theater. comes your all-star Western Theater, starring America's great Western singers, Boy Willing and the Riders of the Purple Sage. Our guest star today is the Western Screen's famous cowboy singing star, Jimmy Wakely. My name is Cottonseed Clark, and here are the Riders of the Purple Sage. I'm dressing up in style for in a little while, I'm gonna ride into town. For every cowboy pal I know will lift his heel and go and pay they rolls around. And so I'm feeling fine because there's lots of time until we're all homeward bound. To work and play with cattle, sweat and swear in battle until payday rolls around. Payday rolls around.
back now to your favorite men of the musical West and the song you've been waiting to hear them sing. The riders of the Purple Sage go across the alley to the Alamo. <laughs> Western pleasure for you folks. A return personal appearance to your all-star Western theater of the screen's outstanding cowboy singing star, Jimmy Wakely. <laughs> Jimmy Wakely is heard with the writers of the Purple Sage on a story of the West written especially for them entitled, The Lone Bandit. has its beginning in Ranger headquarters at Fort Davis, Texas. Ranger Captain John Sherman is giving orders to four newly enlisted men. You men are new in the Ranger service, and here is a chance for each of you to prove himself. About a hundred miles west of here, just beyond Alpine, is a new cattle town called Bear City. An element of crime is causing them much concern. Your orders are to investigate and eliminate things. You will operate in your own way according to your own plans. Here are your orders and your credentials. Good luck to you, man. Well, boys, there's Bear City. That's a peaceful-looking little town to be having trouble. So you can't judge a book by cover, somebody once said. Yeah, you know, I'm always suspicious of a peaceful-looking town. Well, before we ride into town, what do you think? How about splitting up in pairs? You take Dean and I'll take Floyd. We'll go around and come in from the east, and you guys ride on in this way. That sounds good enough for me. And if we play strangers to each other, it might come in handy. That's good. You don't know us, and we don't know you. We'll find a way to keep in touch with each other without anybody getting wise to us. That's good enough. All right, Dean, let's go. I'm right with you. This is a prosperous looking joint. Did you ever see a saloon that wasn't? <laughs> you got something there. You know, Dean, if you ask me, this would be a mighty good place to learn what's going on around this town. Yeah, but you can hang around just so long, and then everybody will start getting suspicious of you. Yes, and I've got a way to solve that problem, too. Then how about letting me in on it? You see that piano over there? So what? Well, there ain't nobody playing it. Well, any fool can see that. And again, so what? Then maybe there's a job open. I'm beginning to get you. Let's ask the barkeep who runs things here. Well, it's B, man. Who's the boss man here? 
That's him standing right over there with the white hat. Tom Beck. Much obliged. You wait here, Dean. Yeah. Are you the head man here? That's right. What do you want? I'm looking for a job. What can you do? Well, I just noticed that you didn't have anybody on that piano. That's right. Ten a week and 50% of your tips. I'll take the job. Then start playing. Thanks. Well, what do you think? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. Being told strangers in town doesn't make it too easy to ask questions. Well, you're right about that. Well, just I... a minute. What's up? Did you see what we just passed? What are you talking about? We didn't pass nobody. No, I'm talking about that barber shop. Well, I passed a million of them. And I've never known a better place to find out what you want to know than a barber shop. You might have something there. Come on, let's get a haircut and meet the Bear City Barber. Yeah. Hey, come right in, gentlemen. Come right in. What can I do for you? Well, I reckon a haircut will do for me. Uh, shave. I'll take a shave when you get through with him, huh? Happy to be of service, are you? Uh, just have a seat right here. You the only barber in town? I sure am. But most of the folks around here shave and cut their own hair. Of course, I have a few choice customers. You men are strangers here about, ain't you? Yeah. We just rode down a while ago. Where could we get a job? Well, jobs are kind of plentiful right now. If a man doesn't mind hard work. Don't mention hard work to me. I'm for making a dollar the easy way. You can say that again. Well, you boys know what you want to do. But no good ever come of making money the easy way. That's what brought so much crime to this town. You mean you got troubles here about? Troubles? Young man, Bear City has been harassed by a vicious criminal for the last six months. Why, money and valuables are as unsafe around here as a baby is in the lion's den. A vicious criminal? You mean there's just one of them? Yeah, it seems that way. And no one has been able to apprehend him so far. Well, what about your sheriff? Can't he put a stop to him? Ah, the sheriff of Bear City might as well be throwing buttons on shirts for all he knows about enforcing the law. You know, Chloe? Yeah? I think I'm going to like this town. Sounds good to me. Why, surely you men don't respect crime. Well, not exactly. And I have less respect for sheriff. Well, just as a friendly tip, I wouldn't go about town talking that way. Why, someone might even accuse you of being the lone bandit. The lone bandit. So that's what they call him. Yeah. I guess up to now he's kept his tracks pretty well covered. Mighty well. I suppose the closest he ever come of being caught was about three weeks ago when he robbed the express office. Old Fire Wilson, the agent, slipped up on him, but uh, he got away without being identified. You know, if you ask me, you got to admire anybody who's that clever. My, my, I hate to hear young men like you two talking like that. If you want my advice, you'll stay clear of any path but the straight and narrow. That's the only road to travel. Oh, come on, Pop. Ask for a haircut, not a sermon. Hey, Jim. Yeah? What's up, Dean? Hey, Boy and Al are over near the bar, and they want us to meet him just outside of town as soon as it gets dark. Good. Watch it. Here comes the boss. You better leave. Yeah. Where's that partner of yours that wanted a job? That's him going there. Hey, Dean, come here. Yeah? What do you want? You still want a job? I sure do. You know, we ain't eating any two hours of the money. He's making punk in that piano. It's just for one day, but I'll try to keep you busy with other things later on. Well, what kind of a job is it? Don't ask no questions. We'll be here at 10 in the morning. Yes, sir. I'll be right here. You'll be here, too, Wakely. And you can skip the piano playing tomorrow. All right, Mr. Beck. And don't forget to weigh your guns and have your horses ready. I'll see you later. Now, what do you reckon he's up to? I wonder. There's something funny about that guy. Sure is. Well, I'll move you around the place a bit. All right. I got a half hour off. I think I'm going to grab a haircut. Then I'll meet you back here. Good. That'll be just about dark, and we'll get out and see four and out. <laughs> There the 
they are over there. Yeah. Easy, boy. Oh, 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 boy. Well, you guys finally made it. Yeah, we come out of town the back way in order to avoid any suspicion. Have you found out anything? Very little, I'm afraid. How about you boys? Well, nothing for sure. But what little hanging around that saloon we did put me in a mighty suspicious frame of mind about that fella Beck that owns the place. Yeah, you could have something there. He's a funny acting guy. Yeah, he's got us down for some kind of a job in the morning that requires guns ready and horses. Then follow through. You know, I wouldn't be at all surprised that he's behind this whole thing. We heard that this crime wave was a one-man job. Yeah, but Ranger headquarters must have figured it differently to send the four of us on one job. I don't get it. That gossipy old barber, Thompson, claims that this lone bandit has given everybody the slip so far. Yeah, I had a talk with a barber myself. He sure knows a lot. Did you ever see a barber that didn't? I still think that Beck is our man, and that there's more than one man involved. From what I can gather, the local sheriff is a good, dependable man. So if it becomes necessary to need him, I guess we can identify ourselves to him with safety. It might come in handy. I heard the barkeep at Beck's place talking about a coat this lone man had left behind when he came here getting caught on that express company job. Yeah, I'd like to see that coat, too. It's on display over at the sheriff's office, I understand. I still think it's going to pay us to be mighty careful. You may be right. Suppose you men be around the saloon in the morning about ten. And see what Beck is up to. Good. We'll see you in the morning. Right now, we'd all better part company and get back into town. Well, it's 9.30. I reckon we'd better mosey over to Beck's place. Yeah, I think I'll stop in at the barber shop and get a shave. I'll meet you there in a few minutes. Say, I never saw you particular about your looks before. I don't let that bother you. Besides, I like to hear that Barber Tompkins run off at the mouth. Well, then I'll go into the back place and run around for a while. I won't be long. While I'm at it, I think I'll drop in at the sheriff's office and take a look at that coat. Well, I'm glad you identified yourself to me, Wakely. I'm anxious to cooperate with you boys any way I can. Much obliged to you, Sheriff. Now, this is the coat right here. Whoever this lone bandit is had to get away a little too quick and left it behind. The way I figured it, he took his coat off uh, to work on the express company safe. And when Cy walked up to unlock the door to get something from his office, the robber made a quick getaway out the back without, uh, that is, leaving the coat behind. Yeah? You find nothing in the pocket? Not a thing. Let me see. You know, he must be a man about my bill. Well, I'd say he was, according to the way that coat fits you. Sheriff, I think I found what I was looking for. Now, don't let this coat get away. Found, found what? What do you mean? Well, I'll have to explain later. But you were wrong about the pockets being empty. Well, there's Dean over there on the other side. Wonder where Wakely is. Well, here he comes through the doors now. I don't know what this fellow back is up to, but there's something big in the air. Listen, he's going to say something. All right, men. Let me have your attention. I've enlisted 25 men for a job. Till now, none of you know what that job is. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, the Bobtown stage will pull out for Bear City, loaded with money belonging to the Cattlemen's Association. You men are to go to Bobtown and ride God on that stage. That money has got to be put into our bank safe. In the interest of the Cattlemen's Association, I'm putting the bill. Now, at 7 o'clock tonight... I'm holding a citizens' meeting here in my saloon. We're going to organize this town once and for all. That does it, Floyd. What do you mean? Beck is our man. How do you figure that? Well, to begin with, he's building himself up as a big public-spirited citizen. Mm -hmm. He hires protection for the cattlemen's money. When they get it in the bank, he calls a meeting of all the town people. And while they're meeting, his men are blowing the bank, huh? Beck is our man as sure as I'm standing here. I do. As soon as Wakely and Dean get back off of that stage trip... Tell them to meet us at the edge of town before that meeting gets going. Don't worry, I'll get right to them. Well, boys, you're not joining in the ride to Bobtown? No, Mr. Tompkins. That ain't my idea of how to make a living. I just can't believe that nice young men like you two boys really mean that kind of talk. Oh, forget it, Barber. Come right on time. Yeah, we got to make this snappy. It's now the time for the meeting down at Beck's place. Well, boys, the money is safe in the bank. The money's in the bank, but 
but it's far from safe. I could agree with you there, but uh, you tell me what you mean first. Well, I'll say that as soon as Beck's gathering gets underway, that bank safe will be blasted higher and tight. By who? By Beck's own men. Why, it's as plain as a nose on your face. From what folks tell me, everybody figures their money is mighty safe when it's locked up in that bank. That's just what Mr. Beck wants them to think. Not necessarily. What do you mean? Well, I mean that tomorrow morning when the bank opens, that money will have disappeared. Now you've been holding out on us. What are you getting at? Just this. Dean, you and Floyd attend that meeting. Boy, if you'll come with me, we're going to give everybody in this town the surprise of their lives. Now, come on. Let us in on this. Yeah, what are you getting at, Wakefield? It don't make sense. All right, here's the dope. This morning, I went to the sheriff's office, and I took a look at that coat. Well, it looks like everybody in town is here. Almost everybody. Yeah, almost everybody. You know, the more I think about it, the more I think Wakely is right. Yes, from what he says, he can't be far wrong about it. Huh? Hey, just a minute. Beck's all ready to call the meeting to order. Yeah. All right, men. Let's have your attention, please. We all know the purpose of this meeting. To try and eliminate the series of robberies we've suffered the past few months. Some time ago, we appealed to the Rangers for help. But as yet, they've done nothing for us. Now, here's my plan. It's time that we dug down in our pockets and finance a little law and order in this town. It's about time Foy and Jimmy showed up. Yeah, this guy's been talking close to an hour. Boys, boys, I'm trying to hear what Mr. Beck had to say. Oh, hello, Barber. And to start off the problem of raising money, I'm going to make my pledge right now. Just a minute, Mr. Beck. Howdy, Sheriff. What's up? I'd like to say something to these men, if you don't mind. Well, that's all right, Sheriff. I reckon all of you men know the story behind this coat I have in my hand. That's the one the robber left in the express office, isn't it, Sheriff? That's right. When we find the owner of this coat, then we have the man or men behind these robberies. Yeah, but how are you going to find him, Sheriff? Yeah, how are you going to do it? Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Wakel, I'd like to ask you and Mr. Willing to step up here in front for a minute. Come on up here, boy. Now, Mr. Wakel and Mr. Willing have agreed to help me with a little experiment. Now, let's see. I, I need one more man to help us. Uh, Mr. Tompkins, would you be so kind? You're about the right side. Happy to help you, Sheriff. Always glad to help. Well, that's nice of you. Now, let's see. Uh, M- Mr. Tompkins, if you'd be so nice, just slip this coat on, will you, please? Well, uh, oh, why, sure, I... There. Uh, how's that? That's fine. Now, gentlemen, Mr. Wakeley, Mr. Willing, we'll continue with this little experiment. A- and you, of course, Mr. Tompkins, if you don't mind. Oh, happy to be of service, Sherry. Thank you. Well, first off, I guess uh, you people wonder who we are, being strangers here. So now we can tell you. We were sent here by Ranger headquarters at Fort Davis. Tonight, we captured the bandit who is responsible for the many robberies in this town. You know, I should say that that calls for a big round of applause from all of us. Yes, sir. Well, now, uh, we have to the man responsible for the robberies in custody. And incidentally, you all know him mighty well. Gentlemen, as the most insignificant citizen of this town... I think we should be forever grateful to these fine young rangers for catching this criminal. You bet. Yes, and I know you're all just as anxious as I am to know who they have in custody. That's right. All right. And I know this will come as a big surprise to you all. Just who is he, Mr. Wakeley? You, Mr. Tompkins. What is that? What do you mean, that? What do you I've got him, Jim. Now, don't make a move, Barber. Well, you, you can't get away with this. We've already gotten by with it, Mr. Tompkins. Well, boys, there's no need for me to tell you what you've done for our town. First relief we've had in weeks. But tell me, what made you uh, suspect the barber in the first place? Well, I'm afraid Wakely will have to tell you about that, Sheriff. Well, it was when I first examined the coat here. Look in the top lapel pocket. Let's see. There's nothing there. Turn it inside out. Well, well, what do you know about that? Hair in it. That's right. And in different shades. Well, I'd be doggone. But I first suspicioned the barber when he shaved me this morning. When a safe expert gets ready for a job, he spends a day or two working on his fingertips, getting them very sensitive and raw. That's to make his feel and touch more perfect. 
I knew when he started to put uh, shaving lotion on my face. It burned his fingers. Then I noticed that he'd been working on them. But uh, what about the bank robbery? Boy and I planted ourselves at the bank while the town meeting was in progress. We saw the barber enter the bank, the back door, and a few minutes later came out with the loot. We followed him back to his barber shop and saw him hide the money. Then we followed him to the meeting. Well, just where did he hide the money? Where he hides all the rest of it. In the big hollow shell under the seat of his barber chair. Well, I reckon that closes this case. Well, and about all I can say other than thanks is hats off to the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Wakely. Heard with our guest star on the Riders of the Purple Sage were Joe Forte as Beck and Horace Murphy as the barber. And now here's Boy Willing back to the microphone with Jimmy Wakely. Well, Jimmy, it's been a lot of fun playing Texas Rangers with you again. Thank you, Boy, and believe me, I enjoyed it. And right now, I'll bet the folks would like to hear a song from a favorite cowboy singing star of theirs. Well, I'd be glad to sing it. That is, if I have time. You can have all the time you want. Besides... What else have you got to do? Well, I thought I'd drop over and get a haircut. I'm getting kind of suspicious of my barber. <laughs> Here he is, folks. Jimmy Wakely singing a great song of the West, Melody from the Sky. Love is everywhere. It's music fills the air. You seem to hum a melody from the sky over on the hill. I see a whippoorwill. I hear its song become a melody from the sky. The bluebird singing to his lady love above a love song taken from the whispering breeze in the trees. Love is everywhere. It's music fills the air. Seems to hum a melody from the Now for a very special musical treat from the Riders of the Purple Sage, here's Boy Welling. Thank you, Cotton. Here's a song of yesteryear that'll bring back a lot of memories to you folks. Our next majestic record, the song that has returned to popularity, I Wonder Who's Kissing Her Now.
thank Jimmy Wakely for dropping in to visit with us. And we'll be looking forward to seeing all of you folks again next week. It's amazing what a man will do to himself over a woman. And still more amazing what a woman will do to herself over a man. This story happened in Virginia City, Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen. Herewith, an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just one minute, we will bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentleman. What are you stopping here for, Clark? The country club is still a half mile away. I know, Scarlett. But I don't want to drive up to the club in this low-priced car. But the snow is six inches deep, and I'm wearing my ballerina slippers. Well, you'll just have to hoof it, baby. I'm not driving any further. Then you're much too big for a piggyback. Oh, the snow is cold. Take bigger steps. Oh, that won't help. Why don't you get a big car like a swept-wing Dodge? A Dodge? I can't afford a big car like that. Oh, yes, you can. Even though Dodge is a big car, it's priced below 59 different bottles of the low-priced field. What? You mean I can own a big swept-wing Dodge for less than I paid for my car? That's right. And you get all that big car roominess and big car luxury. With a Dodge, you get all the car you're paying for. Okay, Scarlett. Let's forget the Dodge, dear, and go see our Dodge dealer. Oh, wonderful, darling. On these cold feet, who could dance anyway? Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. Virginia City, Montana Territory, was particularly noted for three things. It's gold, Henry Plummer and his band of outlaws, and the vigilantes. The vigilantes disposed of the plumbers and were replaced by a more lawful authority, so that by the time I arrived, only the gold remained, and of course those who sought it, the miners. They filled the town day and night, spending their hard or easily won money in saloons, gambling houses, and hurdy-gurdy establishments. I was attracted to one of these on the night of my second day in Virginia City. It was a brilliantly lit saloon called Skinner's, and outside was a large sign proclaiming the appearance of Miss Eulalia Robinson. I went inside. guns in the establishment, because the next man that does it is going to get thrown out on his saddle. With your kind permission, I have the honor of presenting the world-famous actress, Miss Eulalia Robinson. She has appeared before the crown heads of Europe and honors us with a presence tonight by a special appointment to Her Majesty, the Queen of England. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Henry Irvin's leading lady, Miss Eulalia Robinson. <laughs> For our first recitation, Miss Robinson will give us a scene from William Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. Else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek. For that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Fain would I dwell on thorns. 
She was in her late thirties. Not a good actress. Not even beautiful. But her manner, the dignity of carriage, created an illusion of beauty which captivated her audience. She remained on the stage for a solid hour, and by the time she was finished, I could see that every man in that saloon was completely taken by her. And more than one imagined himself to be hopelessly in love. Boy, ain't she something. Now that's what I call a woman. Hey, where are you going? I want to meet her. Who do? Hey, father, where are you Mr. Skinner? Yeah? My name is Kendall. What? Uh, Kendall. Kendall? Yes, that's right. I'd like to meet Miss Robinson. Yeah, you and a hundred more will tear the place down. Now, I'm a correspondent for the London Times, a uh, newspaper. Newspaper man? Yes. Uh, sure, come on. Duck under here. How'd you like? That's real culture, huh? Well, she's quite a success. Yeah, she sure is. What, uh, what paper do you say you write for? London Times. Well, is that so? Well, Miss Robinson will get a kick out of that. You and her both coming from England. Oh, that was just fine, Miss Robinson, real fine. Say, this Mr. Kendall. He writes on the London Times. Mr. Kendall. How do you do? May I present my business associate, Mr. Grimes? How are you? Grimes? I guess you folks have plenty to talk about. I'll go on back and get the boys quieted down. Virginia City never heard anything like you gave us tonight, Miss Robinson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Skinner. Not at all. I'll see you later. Well, won't you sit down, Mr. Kendall? Oh, wait a minute. Uh... Kendall, you got uh, identification or something? Proving you're a correspondent? Uh, not on me, no. I don't think it really matters. Well, it does to me. You know what I mean, Kendall. Miss Robinson is popular. A lot of fellas like to come busting in and make any excuse. You know what I mean? I got to watch out for her interests. I understand. And she's kind of tired right now. Why don't you let her go to tomorrow? If you'd rather, Miss Robinson? No, not at all. I'd rather enjoy being interviewed tonight. And I say it's not a good idea. You're being extremely rude, James. Perhaps you'd care to take supper with me, Mr. Kendall. Why, oh, I'd be delighted. No. No? No, no, she's not gone. I hope you'll forgive me, Mr. Kendall. He thinks that every man who looks at me is thinking dire and grateful for <laughs> My intentions are completely honorable, Mr. Grimes. Lately. I don't want to discuss it anymore, James. Now, both of you, please wait outside. I must change my clothes. I shan't be a moment, Mr. Kendall. Uh, listen, Kendall. I'm sorry I acted the way I did, but if I don't keep an eye on her, nobody's going to. You know what I mean? I think so. I mean, nothing personal, but uh, as her business manager, I've got to take care of things. Now, she gets awful tired traveling around this way. Best thing for her right now is to go back to the hotel and get some sleep. As a business manager, Mr. Grimes, I should think you'd be happy to have a newspaper interview. Oh, sure, sure I am. But you know how these actresses are. They're like kids. They don't even know what's good for them. I hadn't been aware. Well, take my word for it. So you go on ahead. Now, I'll, I'll tell her you see her tomorrow. Under the circumstances, I'm afraid she'd think it was rather polite, don't you? Uh, why not wait until she comes out? All right, we'll make it tonight. A nice quiet supper at the hotel, three of us. Mr. Grimes, I get the distinct impression that for some reason or other you don't want me to be alone with Miss Robinson. Am I right? I'm her business manager. So you said. And she doesn't talk to anyone unless I'm around. Strange, I got the impression that she didn't want you around. I don't care what you think. I'm coming along if you don't like it, no either. There, that didn't take long, did it? Are we ready, Mr. Kendall? Yes. Laylee, you're going back to the hotel. Good night, James. I'll see you in the morning. We walked down the street to the hotel. She talked about some of her experiences in the territory, rather nervously, I thought, seeming almost deliberately to avoid her background of successes in England. I ordered champagne with dinner, and I could see that rather than making her feel more at ease... The drink only increased her anxiety. I'm afraid that James is right, Mr. Kendall. I must be tired. Champagne makes me feel quite giddy. But I will have just a tiny drop more. Of course. You know, James is very angry with me. <laughs> I gathered that. He's a jealous man. You wouldn't think so, would you? But he is. I don't think I blame him. He has no reason to be. We're only business associates. It's not as though we were married or anything. 
Jane doesn't believe in marriage. She says it deadens one. Do you think so? I don't know. I've never been married. My work hasn't allowed for it. Did you meet Grimes in England? Oh, no. No, that was in Boston. He saw me perform and asked to represent my interests. I see. Oh, he'll be very angry about this. Me being with you tonight. May I ask you something? Please. Why are you afraid of him? Afraid? Oh, afraid of Jane? How utterly ridiculous. Does it show so very clearly? Yes. May I have some more champagne? You know I'm not English, don't you? Yes. I never played with Henry Irving. Never saw England. Never did any of the things they say I did. I didn't think so. By appointment to Her Majesty. Jane thought that sounded fine. He took it from a bottle of Scotch whiskey. Do you know what I am, Mr. Kimball? I'm a liar. My whole life is a lie. I'm not even a good actress. I was completely charmed by your performance. How sweet. How gentlemanly and nice you are. Mr. Kendall, you're terribly attractive. You're the most attractive man I've ever met. No. No, that's not true. My husband was the most attractive man. You see, I lied about that, too. You are married. I was. James is always afraid I'll tell someone. Why? Well, the, the marriage didn't end very nicely. Why do you tell me? <laughs> too much champagne. Mm, I don't think so. I'm tired, then. I wish I could cry. Do you know, Mr. Kendall, I haven't been able to cry for three years. And there are so many kids. The shots had come from outside. Just for a moment, I saw a shadowy figure at the broken window. Then it was gone in the night. Miss Robinson was lying on the floor. A thin line of blood ran from the corner of her mouth. She was unconscious. moment we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Today on CBS Radio's Suspense, Vanessa Brown and Jim Amici will co-star in Affair at Loveland Pass, a western thriller with a psychological twist. Exciting dramas waiting for you, too, on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Join us on most of these same stations later today as action-packed stories come your way on CBS Radio's Suspense and yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. Heard. Who did it? I'm not sure, Mr. Skinner. The doctor's on his way. I'll be here in a few minutes. Oh, she doesn't look good. I think the bleeding stopped. The boys down in the saloon are mad. Words got around here in a lynching mood. Sheriff's trying to ease him down. And Mr. Skinner, was was Mr. Grimes there? I didn't see him. Uh, I just wondered. I guess he ought to be told. He's staying down at Nugget Hotel. Yes, it might be a good idea. Well, I'll, I'll go on down myself. Now, listen, Mr. Kendall. If there's anything she needs, you sing out. Anything at all. One of my boys will be outside. You just say the word. Right. I'll be back. What a strange feeling. Miss Robinson? No pain at all. I've always thought there would be. The doctor is coming. I don't really mind, you know. Don't talk. Funny. I never believed him. He always threatened to do something like this. Dr. Todd, where's the wound, please? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, kindly wait outside, sir. Yes. Oh, 
calm days? Skinner told me to wait. What's the doc say? Nothing yet. I sure like to get my hands on that feller at Dunn. Yeah, I imagine a lot of us would. She's a lady. A fine lady. Not like them herdy gerties around here. It don't matter if one of them stops a piece of lead. She real bad hurt? Pretty bad. You figure it was some crazy liquor he'd up, son of a gun, Dunny? I, I don't know if he was drunk or not. I mean the fellas would come to see how the lady is. We don't know yet. There's more downstairs. We just wanted to know we're going to get the son of a gun to dry gulfster. Doc Todd come yet? He's in there now. Well, you give him this. There's $300 of better gold dust than that. You tell Doc he pulls her through, he'll get another like it. The boys wanted to know they're with her. Sure do. I'll tell her. You do that. I got a couple of dollars. That goes for me, too. Give it to the Doc. I will. I can't operate yet. She's lost too much blood. She's going to be all right, huh, Doc? Don't ask fool questions, boy. I'm not God. Right now, she's asleep. Well, you're you're Kendall, aren't you? Yes. Lucky for her, you were around. If she'd lost any more blood, she'd be dead. Well, you might as well get some shut eye. I'll stay with her. I left the hotel and went out into the street. There were 50 or 60 men standing about, quietly, waiting. I told them all that I knew. Then I saw Mr. Skinner hurrying up. He motioned to me, and we walked away from the crowd. Grimes, couldn't find him. Oh? Hotel clerk said he hadn't seen him all night. Now, I've been thinking. Is there something wrong between these two? I heard arguing this afternoon in her dressing room over at the saloon. I didn't think anything of it then, but with this... I think we'd better find him, Mr. Skinner. He did it? I don't know, but it's possible. I'll get some of the boys. Uh, No. What's the matter? Are you a friend of his? You trying to protect him? Neither one, but all they need is an excuse. If they even suspect someone, they'll hang him. I prefer things more legal. He's a killer. We've had that kind before in Virginia City. Miss Robinson is not dead... Now, what I suggest is that you talk to some of the men who aren't likely to take matters into their own hands. Tell them we're trying to find Grimes. If he doesn't know what's happened to Miss Robinson, they can bring him back here. Then what? We'll let the sheriff handle it. All right. But I'll tell you, Kendall, if he puts up a fight, I want to be there. It'll be a pleasure to shoot him. The search began. At first, only a handful picked by Skinner knew what they were looking for. But the word spread, and with it, rumor. Grimes was the man. Grimes had done it. In an hour, every man who knew or cared about what had happened was a hunter. The quarry, innocent or guilty, was James Grimes. And it was obvious that if found, he'd have very little chance of standing trial. At about three o'clock in the morning, I returned to Miss Robinson's room. Any change, Doctor? No. They get the fellow that did it? Not yet. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? How come a man would want to kill a woman like this? She's the way I remember a woman should be. Why don't you get a cup of coffee, Doctor? I'll stay with her until you come back. I think I will. Stretch my legs a minute. For where, Grimes? Well, they're after me. They're trying to kill me. Any reason why they shouldn't? Is she dead? No. I warned her. I've been warning her what had happened. Put away the gun. And get myself killed? You'll be safer with me than the mob outside. You! You're the trouble. The reason for everything. It's been men like you everywhere we go. Every town she has to find someone. I warned her. I told her I wasn't going to stand it any longer. I heard a different reason. A different reason. What did she tell you? About her husband. An unhappy marriage. She said that? Told you about her husband? Yes. You want to know what really happened? She had a husband, all right. In Boston. I didn't know it at the time. I met her. I fell in love. She went away with me. 
after we were married, she told me. She... She is your wife? Surprising. Look at her. It's another one of her little ways. She thinks it's better if people don't know. She thinks I don't know why she wants it that way. I guess you could say we killed her husband. He committed suicide after she left him. Oh, you don't know. You don't know what it's been like. But I told her what I'd do if she went after another man. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter anymore. I hope she dies, and I want her to feel these things. If she dies, they'll hang you. Yeah. Mm. Mm. James? Lay. I'm sorry, Lynn. Such a jealous boy. I never meant anything. No, don't lay me. I like to flirt. That's all. A woman likes to flirt. It doesn't mean anything. Mr. Kendall knows that. Can't you stop acting? Even now, can't you stop? Listen to him, Mr. Kendall. Has he been telling you what a terrible woman I am? I suppose it's true. But you're not much... Man, James. Really? You don't have to listen to this crime. Kill her. I'm outside. Kill her. No, no, you don't. Give don't. me the gun. Give me the gun. Lily. She's dead. Give me my gun. I can't. You'll get a trial. Perhaps they'll understand. There'll be no trial. Now, Grimes, come back. Grimes, Grimes! I think I was rather glad I hadn't stopped Grimes when he went through the window. They killed him. But in this case, perhaps it was better than a public trial and hanging. Miss Eulalia Robinson and James Grimes were buried side by side in Virginia City, Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Larry Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Jack Moyles, and Jim Nusser. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Jimmy Stewart with a welcome to the Hollywood Star Playhouse, brought to you by the Bakers of America. Star Playhouse. 30 minutes of mystery, thrills, drama by Hollywood's finest writers featuring Hollywood's top stars. Brought to you by the Bakers of America through the cooperation of your baker. Hello there, this is Wendell Niles. In a moment, we'll bring you Act One of today's transcribed story, The Six Shooter, starring Mr. James Stewart. Friends, Depend on your baker to help you serve better meals through bakery foods. Whether he's the baker in your bake shop, the baker who supplies your grocer, or the baker who calls at your door, your baker is the man who provides so many of the good foods that mean mealtime satisfaction for you and your family. Because almost every day of the year, very likely every meal of the day, you enjoy something that a baker makes. So, for variety, convenience, economy, for nutritious good eating, count on your baker to help you serve better meals through bakery foods. And now, Act One of The Six Shooter, starring Mr. James Stewart. Start.
stopped, but the wind still carried slivers of moisture that cut into the boy's face as he rode along the edge of the creek. When he saw the yellow light from the back of the office, he pulled up and slid out of the saddle. Then he tied a wet bandana under his eyes and walked to the door. All right, hike. Way up, both of you. And stay away from that shotgun. Now, now look here. You, 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 get over to the safe. Better hurry it up, mister. All right, now open it. I said to open it. All right, toss me that sack. Okay. Thanks a lot. You, you... Now, you rotten little... I hadn't figured on going through Clay City. It was an hour out of my way, and I was already a day late to the Jefferson Ranch where I'd signed on for the roundup, but... When Scar started limping from a loose shoe, didn't have no choice. We had to head for the nearest blacksmith shop, so we turned north. Howdy, mister. What's the trouble? Uh, the horse losing a show. Well, let's have a look. All right, raise it up, fella. Come on, come on, boy. Yeah, it's split, mister. He needs a new one. Okay, boy. Can you take care of it? Oh, sure. Bring him over here. Hey, uh, what happened to Red, fella used to own this shop? Went to Nevada chasing silver. I bought him out. Oh, I... yeah, you, you don't look very much like a blacksmith. Huh? Oh, I'm stronger than I look. Heavier, too. What do you think I weigh, mister? Oh, I don't know. Go on, go on. Take a guess. 120? 30? Mm, well, no more than that. You a betting man, mister? Oh, well, sometimes. Well, I say I weigh over 130. If I don't, you get the new shoe for nothing. If I do, you pay me double. What do you say? Well, you got a set of scale? Don't need no scale. What do you say, mister? Is it a bet? <laughs> well, don't seem to be no way of proving it. Oh, all you got to do is lift me up. You look like a man who can judge weight. What do you say? Okay, all right, it's a bet. All right, mister, just heist me. If you don't think I weigh more than 130, the shoe is free. <laughs> all right, I, I never tried to judge a man's weight before, but all right. There, there we go. <laughs> well? Oh, I'll be done. Huh? I'm packed solid, mister, real solid. Well, you're packed tighter than a steer. Hey, you must weigh 150 pounds. Yeah, you see, you see, what did I tell you? 158. <laughs> the horseshoe's gonna cost you money, mister, but you ain't the only one. Ever since I bought the shop, there ain't been a stranger come through Clay City but what he paid double for his first horseshoe. <laughs> he ain't sore, mister. No, no, that was a fair bet. Sure it was. I told you I was heavier than I looked. That's what folks call me, Heavy Norton. My real name's George, but everybody calls me Heavy. Hey, what's your name, mister? Ponsett. Britt Ponsett. Fella, they call the Six Shooter? Well, doggone it. I've heard about you, mister. I've sure heard about you. <laughs> oh, would have recognized you if I'd have noticed your gun. Sure is fancy, ain't it? Hey, do you mind, uh... Showing it to me? No, no. Here, catch. Hey, real fancy. Just like Sheriff Schofield said. He says he's seen you fire six shots with it while Whitey Jackson was getting off his first bullet. That time down at Eagle. Well, the sheriff kind of likes to build up a story. Oh, he swears it's the truth. Here's your gun, Mr. Ponsett. Thanks. Sure, sure. You was mighty quick in getting into Clay City. Uh, how'd you hear about it so fast? Hmm. How'd you hear about what? The holdup at the Fargo station last night. Ain't that why you come? Nope. No. I was headed past town. I turned off because Scar got that loose shoe. Well, now, ain't that a coincidence? Fellow holds up the Fargo office, kills one man, maybe two, gets away at $5,000, and 12 hours later, you ride into town. Well, they got any idea who did it? Nope, not a single solitary one from, from what I hear. 
Like I say, the deputy agent was dead when they found him. Other fella, Fred Wilmer, a friend of his, got shot up pretty bad. Ain't done no talking yet. Doc says maybe he never will. Does Sheriff Schofield take out a posse? Nope, ain't nobody to go. Most of the men signed up for the Jefferson Roundup. Left town day before yesterday. Here the Jefferson Ranch is paying good money this year. Yeah, yeah. You uh, seen the sheriff this morning? No, not lately. It might be over to his office. Uh, I think I'll walk down that way while you're fixing up Scar. Sure, sure, Mr. Ponsett. That's a darn good idea. Sheriff Schofield will be real glad to see you. A couple of doors this side of the sheriff's office, I saw the Wells Fargo sign nailed up next to a window. The place wasn't locked, so I went inside. One of the chairs was upset, and there was some damp stains on the floor. The cast iron safe against the wall was standing wide open, so I kicked it shut. Went out in the back stoop. There was some more blood on the steps, and then just red mud. Right at the edge, I saw the hoof prints. They trailed off along the side of the creek. Whoever made them headed west. The horse had been wearing one shoe different from the other three. A, a, a sharp rock must have cut into it sometime or another. Not enough to split it, you understand. Just enough so that the print left a jagged line, like, so like fancy handwriting. Find something, Britt? Hmm? Oh, oh, hello, Sheriff. Ah, it's heading your way. Yeah, I just saw Heavy. He told me you was in town. Did you find something? I don't know. I don't know. You see these hoof prints? Yeah. Uh-huh. Don't mean nothing. The trail gives out a mile or so down the creek at Fork. Uh-huh. Has Clay City had any other trouble lately, Ed? No, not a bit. I guess any town's got to expect to hold up once in a while, though. No, I heard it was a little more than that. Yeah. That's right. Fred Wilmer able to talk yet? Afraid not. Doc said he'd let me know first thing he'd come around. Took him out to his ranch. You been out there to see him since last time? Wasn't no reason. Well, it might be a good idea to be there, you know, just in case. You're... Thought maybe I ought to stick in town. Oh, I don't think anything more is going to happen here, Ed. I'll get Scar and I'll meet you out at Fred's place. Huh? I can handle this alone, Britt. Oh, sure, sure. I'll just offer to keep you company, Ed. I'll meet you there. He's all fixed up, Mr. Ponsett. Tied him up around the side so he'd be in the shade. Thanks, Harry. Uh, you. Did you find uh, Sheriff Schofield? I-, I told him he was in town. Yeah. Did you figure out anything? Oh, uh, not so far. Oh, you will. Sheriff's a good man. Why, you and him together, you'll get whoever done it. No, maybe so. Maybe so. You're the only blacksmith round here, ain't you, Heavy? Only one for 40 miles. Uh-huh. You ever see a horse with a shoe that's got one jagged edge, left hind leg? A lot of shoes got jagged edges, Mr. Ponsett. Yeah, well, I'll show you what I mean. I ain't much of an artist. Now, here, it, it, uh, it kind of looks a little like this. Hmm. Seems to me I seen a shoe like that just the other day. Uh, oh, sure, I remember. Told him I ought to get a new one for it. Ben Schofield, that's who it was, just the other day. Ben? Yeah, the sheriff's kid. You know him, don't you, Mr. Ponsett? Oh, sure. Sure, I ain't seen Ben in a couple of years. Uh. Oh, you wouldn't recognize him if you did. He just sort of growed up overnight. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he has. We'll return for Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring Jimmy Stewart in just a moment. Today being Easter, it's interesting to note that of the many ancient observances of Easter, some customs have continued almost unchanged. One of these, of course, is the Easter egg, which symbolizes reviving life or the rebirth of mankind. Then there's the cross-marked bread, eaten by the Saxons in the Middle Ages to honor their goddess's spring, Aostra. From this came our hot cross buns of today. But history says that the custom of serving small loaves of bread with a mark of the cross as part of religious festivities dates back centuries ago when it was first practiced by the Egyptians. 
That's not so strange, though, when you realize leavened or raised bread, the forerunner of our present-day bread, was invented over 2,000 years ago by the Egyptians. Imagine of all the many, many different kinds of foods that have fed people down through the ages, bread has been, and still is, our most important food. Here are the reasons. Bread more completely satisfies hunger and is a greater source of strength than any other known kind of food. And now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring Jimmy Stewart. Sheriff Schofield was sitting on Fred Wilmer's porch swing when I got there. Doc was inside with Fred, so I squatted down on the stoop and waited. About half an hour, the doc came out and told us we could go inside and see Fred. Fred was lying on a cot, breathing hard. And white cloth across his chest was stained pink, and his voice sounded like it was full of air. He was just sitting in the express office talking... Sam and me didn't hear the back door open. Must have left it unlocked. Turned around and there he was, holding his gun on. <laughs> you got a look at him, Fred? Handkerchief over his face, Sheriff. I couldn't see nothing. Just the gun. He told Sam to open the safe. There wasn't nothing else he could do. Sure, sure. He took the money, walked over to the door. Yeah? Looked at us for a minute. And then shot. He didn't have no reason. He hit Sam in the face and he hit me in the chest. He didn't have no reason. <laughs> ah, take it easy, Fred. Take it easy now. It's just like he enjoyed shooting at us. That's how it was like he enjoyed it. Maybe he was scared. Oh, he wasn't scared, Sheriff. He didn't have no reason. Thought he killed us both. Then he started down the steps. I got my hand on the shotgun and... Let him have it. You hit him? I don't know. Maybe he gave a yell and rode off. Uh, I, what kind of a fellow was he? He was young, old? I couldn't see his face. Young fellow, I'd say, though. How young? Oh, 17, 18, full grown. Very tall, short? Medium. About the size of your kid, Ed. <laughs> About that size. <laughs> Got enough for you, Ed? Yeah. That's enough. You you think you'll get him, Brad? Sure, Fred. Sure. Sure. Come on, Ed. Didn't have no reason to shoot, no reason. Oh. Let's go, Ed. We're wasting our time, Brett. He's got a day's head start. He'd be 40 miles from here. Well, not if he's shot up. Now, you go on if you want to. Well, you're the sheriff. You've got to make the arrest. You ain't never been so particular before. Well, maybe not, but this time I'm particular. Are you coming? We don't even know where to start. Oh, I thought along the creek. That's as good a place as any other. <clears throat> It's a waste of time, Britt. Well, we got time to waste. Come on, let's go. We picked up the trail along the creek headed west. It wasn't hard to follow, and every once in a while we'd see a few drops of blood spattered against the shrub brush. About ten minutes later, we came to a fork where Ed had said the trail gave out. Scar stuck his nose down into the water, and I looked around. The trail didn't give out. Turned south. I nodded in that direction. Ed didn't say a thing. Just followed. And about five o'clock, we stopped to eat. Ed built a fire, and I opened up a couple of cans of beans I had in my roll. Oh, you ain't hungry, Ed? It's early for supper. Yeah, yeah. Ed, I talked to Heavy before I went out to Fred's place. I asked him who had a horse that would leave a mark like the one we've been following. So? And he said Ben did. Your son, Ben. I thought you ought to know that. A lot of horseshoes leave the same kind of mark. 
Fred said it was a young fellow. It wasn't Ben. Where is he at? Jefferson's ranch, working on a roundup. He left Clay City the day before yesterday. Couldn't be Ben. There's a lot of wild youngsters in these parts, but Ben's a good boy. Couldn't be him. You sure? That mark don't mean nothing. Plenty of horseshoes leave the same kind of mark. You know that, Brent. You had enough to eat? Yeah. Come on, let's go. The moon came out, thin, yellow. Not real bright, but enough so you could follow the trail. About three miles, there wasn't no blood. He must have wrapped something around the wound. Wrapped it real tight. And then we found the bandage. A piece of shirt tail sopped through. For the next mile, he'd been bleeding a lot, worse than ever. He was hit pretty bad. Looks like it. He couldn't have gone much further because I... Oh, oh let's go. Ed. Yeah. Pull up. Over there in the gully, that cabin. Yeah. Whose is it? Used to belong to Jake Levant. Died a couple of years ago. Ain't nobody living there now. There's somebody living there. What? Huh? Out and back. There's a pony. You better go ahead on foot. Red? Yeah? We're gonna take him alive, ain't we? If we can. We gotta take him alive, Britt. Ben. I don't know, Britt. Not for sure. It could be Ben? It could be. Where's he been the last couple of days? I don't know that neither. Had an argument with him two nights ago. He needed some money. He'd been playing poker and lost a lot. Well, Five thousand's a lot. I wouldn't give him none. He got mad, said he'd get it, said he'd get it himself. And I hit him hard across the face. I hit him twice. He started to hit me back. Then he walked out of the house. I ain't seen him since. I wish he had hit me back. Now, we got to get across that clearing, Ed. Over to that clump of trees. He may see us. Yeah, we'll have to take that chance. You ready? Yeah. All right? Sure. We'll stay in these trees for a couple of minutes. Okay. And then we'll rush him. Ain't gonna be easy to take him, Ed. Now that he's spotted us. You ain't gonna kill him, Brett. I ain't gonna let him kill me. It ain't his fault, Brett. It's mine. You know that ain't so. No, it's the truth. It's my fault. You didn't raise him to be a killer, Maybe Ed. I did, Brett. I was a sheriff, seeing that everybody kept close to the line, seeing that everybody lived honest, especially Ben. I broke him, Britt. Broke him like you break a wild horse. I tried to take all the fight out of him fast. You know what happens when you do that to a horse? He gets tame, but the fight still learns. Someday he turns wild again. I'll rush him alone, Ed. No. Stay here, Britt. Well, Sam Norton's dead. Maybe Fred Miller, too. Killing Ben won't bring him back. He's my son, Britt, my only son. You don't have no kids. You don't know. I'm sorry, Ed. No, we're going back to town. Not without him. We're going back. Now, you can outdraw me, Britt, but I'll still have time to get a shot off. I'll try to get him alive, Ed. I'll try. No, don't turn your back on me, Britt. Don't be a fool. Don't make me do it, Britt. I wasn't being brave. I knew he wouldn't shoot. A man like Ed Schofield just don't change overnight. You can figure a man like Ed. That's what I thought, anyway. But I hadn't figured what would happen next. I haven't figured on him running out into the clearing, standing there in the moonlight, gray against the black sky. Ben! It's me, Ben, you dad! Can you hear me, Ben? Brett Ponson's coming after you. Throw out your gun, Ben! Brett Ponson's coming! Now listen to me, Ben! It's your dad! I saw him go down, real slow, like his legs had buckled under him. I couldn't tell how bad he'd been hit. He rolled down a gully out, out of range, and I crawled forward. I pushed myself past a couple of rocks and head toward the back door. The kid was in the kitchen. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him moving around, going from window to window, looking out, waiting for me. 
I slid past another rock. I could run to the door or wait. The kid made up a mind for me. I slipped down fast and the bullets nicked the rocks. The kid had good hearing. He knew I was right there. I took out my gun and waited. I knew he'd get nervous first. Young fellows always do. I wasn't so young. I could wait. It was more than five minutes before the door started opening. His pony knew I was coming, too. He started for the horse. I aimed at his leg. For a second, he stopped moving and just hung in midair like a hawk. And he sprawled forward out of sight behind a log. I raised up a little and hunched myself along the side of the cabin. Everything was quiet now. Even his pony. The moon went behind a thick cloud and I came around the corner of the cabin. Suddenly the moon came out again, just in time for me to see his 45. Just in time to see him coming up over the top of the log. His revolver slipped out of his fingers and I saw him trying to reach for it again. He couldn't make it. I stood up and walked over to the log. The kid was lying face down, gasping for breath, a little short gasps. He pulled himself up to the flat of his hands and then he passed out. I turned him over with my foot and I looked at his face. Where'd he get you? In the shoulder. I'm going to be all right. Britt, is he... Did you have to... He ain't dead. Thanks. I guess he didn't hear me calling to him. He didn't know who I was. Ed. What? Ed, it ain't Ben. What? It ain't Ben, Ed. Yeah. You sure, Britt? Yeah, yeah, this kid's got red hair. There ain't no reason to lie to me, Britt. I ain't shot up bad. I ain't lying. I ain't lying. I knew it wasn't Ben while I was going up after him. I knew it. What are you talking about? Hey, just come to me. A man don't change overnight. Neither does a boy. Well, if it ain't Ben... It... Uh, lots of tough kids in these parts. You said so yourself. Where do you suppose Ben is? Where you said, Jefferson Ranch, working in the roundup. They pay good. No. A boy don't change overnight, Ed. Huh. You able to ride back to town? Yeah, sure. I may have to take it a little slow. I'll get the kid. Britt. Yeah? You know something, Britt? I couldn't believe it was Ben neither. No, when he shot me. I just couldn't believe it. You know that, Bruce. I know it, Ed. I know it. Jimmy, that's one of the most heartwarming, at the same time suspenseful yarns we've heard in a long, long time. Thanks a lot. Well, Wendell, when it comes to that thanks department, let's just be mighty sure we include Parley Bear, her background, Bert Holland, and Bill Conrad, who played the sheriff. Bye. Be sure to come back, Jimmy. In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, we'll introduce Miss Diana Lynn, the star of next week's story on Hollywood Star Playhouse. Say, I wonder if your family weekends are anything like the ones at our house. You see, ours are very informal, and... Lots of times, our meals are very irregular. I make a point of seeing that Mrs. Niles doesn't do a single extra bit of meal fixing she can help. So if you ever drop in on the Niles some weekend, you better bring along a husky appetite for sandwiches. We love them. Any kind. But a great favorite with the boys and myself is a, a ham egg burger. Ever tried one? Well, listen. They're so simple, I make them myself. I take hamburger buns, slice them in half, and toast them. Then I spread two tablespoons of canned deviled ham, a scrambled egg, a 
and a couple of tablespoons of grated American cheese on each bun. I toast them in the broiler with a low heat until the cheese begins to melt. Yes, that's a ham egg burger. Honestly, it's just about a meal in itself. Oh, maybe we top it off with a piece of cold apple pie right out of the refrigerator and a cup of coffee or two. That's all. So tonight, why don't you try a Nile special, a mouth-watering ham egg burger. Now, here is the star of next week's thrilling story in Hollywood Star Playhouse, Miss Diana Lynn. I guess we all dream about the perfect job we'll land someday. You know, good pay, easy hours, a perfect atmosphere to work in, an ideal boss. Well, I landed my dream job, only it turned out to be not a dream, but a nightmare of terror. James Stewart can currently be seen in the Universal International Technicolor production, Bend of the River. Tonight's transcribed story was written for Mr. Stewart by Frank Burt. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any similarity to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to be with us again next Sunday for the Bakers of America program, Hollywood Star Playhouse. Enjoy another half hour of fine entertainment brought to you direct from Hollywood by your baker. The baker in your bake shop, the baker who supplies your grocer, and the baker who calls at your door. All helping you serve better meals through bakery foods. I came here to tell you I'm not an executioner. It doesn't feel good to kill a man. Not a bit good. But your husband didn't leave me any choice. Have Gun. Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875, the Carlton Hotel, headquarters of a man called Paladin. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds wonderful. And then, Mr. Palace? And then, perhaps a cordial for a nightcap. I do believe I'll be looking forward to this evening a great deal, Mr. Paladin. And I, too. Mr. Paladin. Oh, what? I've been looking for you. Uh, I find you. Hey, boy, your timing is abysmal. Oh, thank you, Mr. Paladin, but uh, credit must go to mailman. He just brings special delivery letter for you. (sighs) Excuse me, my dear. Oh, say, I'll meet you in the lounge later. Well... Oh, she is very high dungeon. Dungeon? Yes, sir, that's what I say. Very high dungeon. Uh, dear Mr. Paladin, I need you for an important assignment immediately, and so forth. There's a $3,000 bonus for you upon completion. Something, something, something. I appreciate you seeing you at your earliest convenience, so... Very truly yours, E.J. Randolph, Coloma Bank. Coloma. Oh, you there not long ago, yes? Yes, about two months ago. Oh, yes. Ah, here are your two tickets for opera tonight. Take them back, hey, boy. Yes, Uh, what? I'm leaving for Coloma tonight. Oh, must be real big trouble to interfere with lady who was almost kissed. Wire Mr. Randolph. Tell him I'm on my way. Dandruff bothers most men. Most women, too. So listen. Today, you can get rid of embarrassing dandruff in just three minutes. 
Yes, with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Unsightly dandruff's gone in three minutes. It's the quickest, easiest of all leading shampoos. That's not all. Using Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep embarrassing dandruff away. Simply apply in the unique Fitch manner. Before you wet hair, rub in one minute. This way, Fitch Shampoo penetrates right down to the scalp. Next, add water. Lather one minute to wash every trace of dandruff out of your hair. Then rinse one minute. All that loosened dandruff goes down the drain. In three minutes with Fitch, one rubbing, one lathering, one rinsing, dandruff's gone. And never forget, gentle Fitch can also leave your hair up to 35% brighter. To get rid of dandruff problems forever, brighten hair too. Use Fitch regularly. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today, only 59 cents. Coloma was a poor excuse for a town. It's out alone and awkward in the center of a dry, scorched plain with a few ranches stretching back towards the low mesas behind it. I'd been there before and I killed a man there. I didn't like the town. I didn't like the people. But Randolph had offered me a lot of money. I found him sitting behind his desk at the bank. Well, Paladin, sure good to see you. Hello, Mr. Randolph. Hey, sit down, sit down. Thank you. Uh, uh, how about a little rye to cut the dust? Hmm? Yeah, I don't mind. Hey, didn't waste any time getting here. Uh, the distance between San Francisco and Coloma is shorter when there's a $3,000 fee involved. <laughs> Right to the point. That's what I like about you, Paladin. That's why I sent for you. Well, here's luck. Thank you. <sighs> so, what can I do for you, Mr. Randolph? Uh, you did a job for John Griffin about two months ago. He hired you to bring back Steve Morrow. Remember him? You don't forget someone you've killed. Didn't mean any offense. No, no, I'm not offended. Morrow tried to kill me. I had to kill him. Griffin wanted Morrow because Morrow had killed his son. What's that got to do with you? Morrow robbed this bank before he killed that Griffin boy. He took $30,000. I still don't see the connection. Paladin, I've got to have that $30,000 back by the first of the month or I'll lose everything I own. And you need help? Yes. Yes, I need help. Badly. Fifteen years of hard work, building a business and a name for myself. Gone, just like that. Gone and signed over to John Griffin. John Griffin? How does he figure in this? Mm. He's the biggest depositor the bank has. He knows about the stolen money, and he's using that knowledge. He's given me notice that he wants to withdraw $30,000 on the first. If I don't have it... The deed to this building and most of the other property the bank owns will be signed over to him. And I don't have it, Mr. Paladin. Well, then, that makes my job fairly easy. Well, how's that? Find Morrow's widow. She must have the money, or at least know where it is. I don't think so. She's still living in that cabin up there on the mesa. Well, the sheriff and I have been up a dozen times searching the place, trying to talk her into telling us where it is. She hasn't got the money. If she had it, she'd have left Coloma and gone someplace else to spend it. Either that or at least paid up the back taxes on the farm. Huh. I thought for sure Rose had that money. Rose? Steve Morrow's widow. You mean Lucy Morrow. Her name's Lucy. Oh. Uh, I'm going to check into the hotel and freshen up a bit. And then what? Ride out and talk to Lucy Morrow. Morning, Mr. Randolph. Yes? Good afternoon, Miss Morrow. I'm Paladin. Did you think I could forget you, Mr. Paladin? No, I suppose not. I'd like to talk to you, if I may. I'm going to work on the rose garden. You can talk there if you wish. Yes, I noticed them as I rode up. They're beautiful. They are. It's an eastern variety, Calinaris. Oh. Must be rather difficult to grow them out here. Oh, it's worth the trouble to have one lovely thing here. 
They were a present from Steve. He brought me some cuttings after one of his trips back east. Why have you stayed on here? Simple. There's nowhere else to go and no money to go with. Your husband took $30,000 from the Coloma Bank. It's never been found. This house was turned inside out. Do you think I'd be living here like this if I had $30,000? Perhaps not. I don't know anything about that money, Mr. Paladin. I don't mean to bother you, Mrs. Morrow. Why do you bother me, then? You knew this before you came out here. I killed Steve. It hadn't been me. It would have been somebody else, somewhere else. He was an outlaw, a killer. I... Suppose I wanted to come here and tell you that I'm not an executioner. I was bringing him in, and he went for his gun. Doesn't feel good to kill a man. Not a bit good. I know you're not the kind to kill for the sake of another notch on your gun, but... Steve was my husband. Please don't come back here again. Or if you have to, wait until I'm gone. You're leaving? Yes. They're auctioning the place for $276 back taxes. Oh, don't look so pained. I'll get along. Maybe it'll be best. Get out of here, Paladin. Leave me alone, please. Good afternoon, Mrs. Morrow. I'm a mean widow, kid. And are you pleased with yourself? Sure, because I'm a germ. A bathroom germ. Bathrooms is where the meanest germs get to whim. <laughs> Do I have fun causing odor and spreading disease? Well, you better watch out, son, or your landlady may find out about Lysol brand disinfectant. Lysol? No, Lysol. That's what I said. Lysol. Well, anyway, a lot of women are finding that a dash of Lysol in their cleaning suds every week wipes out nasty bathroom disease germs like you. Disinfects from one cleaning to the next as no other product can. Wipes out many deadly viruses, too. Lysol makes every cleaner work work better. It's the easy, modern way to get bathrooms really clean and free of odors. Lysol can do that? Mm, and what's more, now besides regular Lysol, there's a new, sweet-smelling, pine-scented Lysol. And they're both out to get you. Hey, was you ever a mean widow kid? One more remark like that, and I'll open this bottle of Lysol. Help! The Griffin Ranch was the same as it had been, old and solid and well-kept, run by a man who was old and solid and tough, a man who had lost one son by Steve Morrow's gun and had one son left, a man who could not forget or forgive. Well, you look about the same, Paladin. Come on in, set a spell. I'd just soon sit out here in the fresh air, Mr. Griffin. Fine, fine. What brings you back to these parts? $30,000. Stolen money, eh? A lot of people like to get their hands on that. You ought to have a pretty good idea where it might be. Why do you say that? Well, you were the last person to be with that murdering fool. The way I had it figured, Morrow had the money with him when you killed him. I uh, hear you've been living pretty high on the hog up in San Francisco. Those are harsh words, Griffin. Oh, no, no. Don't get itchy. I was just only joshing. You wouldn't be back here if you had it. Steve Morrow didn't have that money when I found him. And according to his wife, he didn't even have it when he left the farm. Oh, uh, you talked to her? I just came from there. Well, it takes a lot of nerve for a man to go up and talk to the wife of somebody he killed. Hey, you suppose Steve Morrow hid it on that farm of his? Mr. Randolph and the sheriff searched it. I know. Oh, Randolph's getting fidgety. A while back, he got the idea that Morrow buried the money up on the mesa. <laughs> you never saw such digging and poking around. I swear the mesa's ten feet shorter on account of it. That farm adjoins your property, doesn't it? Yeah. On the south. Why? I hear it's up for auction. Should be worth at least a couple of thousand dollars to him. I'll get it for 276 the taxes. <laughs> Someone will outbid you at that price. I don't reckon so, Paladin. Nobody else is going to bid on it. Those who can afford to bid on it don't have any use for that farm. Randolph might have use for it. Ah, that old pussyfoot. <laughs> he wouldn't know how to plant potatoes. He might know how to dig for stolen money. Hey, tell me something, Paladin. You working for Randolph? Maybe. Maybe not. Ah. You are working for him. 
I might have known. You know, I'd just assume the money doesn't get back to the bank. Oh? I'd lose about $60,000 in holdings that belong to it. Those holdings will be mine come the first of the month. Well, that's not a pretty way to talk, but at least it's the truth. I see. What happens to Randolph, then? Out. Out in the cold where he deserves to be. If I ran my ranch like he runs that bank, I'd have been out of business a long time ago. Well, getting close to sundown, I think I'll be heading back to town. No, well, Paladin, I hate to see a man like you working on the dark side of the fence. I thought you always roamed the green fields. Uh, which are the green fields, Griffin? Mine are. By the way, you buy that farm just for the taxes. Steve Morrow's widow won't get a cent. Well, now, ain't that a downright shame? She didn't kill your son, Griffin. No, but her husband did. All I hope is that his kin are going to suffer on account of it. That's how I feel about Morrow and her. Come in. Paladin? Well, Mr. Randolph. You, uh, make it a habit, staying up this late? <laughs> I do my best thinking when the town's settled for the night. You've covered a lot of ground today. You getting discouraged? Did you come here to discourage me? There's a lot of territory between Coloma and the Mesa. Morrow could have hidden that money anywhere. Not without telling his wife. Now, since when does a killer stop to worry about his wife? Randolph, whatever you want to say about Morrow, he loved his wife. He'd have wanted to make sure she was provided for him. Why, he even spoke about her when he was dying. His last words were, Rose, tell her that... Wait a minute. Tell her? What are you talking about? Randolph, that money's up there on the farm. You mean she does have it? She doesn't know it, but it's there. But where is it, then? Why, we've torn that place apart. You just didn't dig in the right spot. I'm going up there now and get your money. You wait here. It's one o'clock in the morning. And I'll be digging by two. <laughs> Now, there's a luxury car that fits regular parking spaces in ordinary garages that's easy to handle in traffic. It's America's compact luxury car, the Ambassador by Rambler. Now, medium-priced car buyers can have the room, comfort, luxury, and performance they expect in a fine car, but without excessive length, width, and bulk. If other medium-priced cars have sized and priced you out of the market, then you owe it to yourself to test our best. American Motors' finest, the luxuriously compact Ambassador. Note the quality construction and careful attention to detail. Thrill to the superbly responsive 270 horsepower V8 engine. Enjoy luxury features like individually adjustable front seats that glide back and forth separately. Five minutes at the wheel of an ambassador will change your ideas about luxury cars. Test our best. The Ambassador V8 by Rambler. Finest car ever priced so close to the lowest. See, drive the luxurious ambassador now at Rambler dealers. <laughs> I dismounted at Lucy Morrow's, I thought I heard a horse nicker in a nearby clump of cottonwoods. I waited, but all was quiet except for the wind through the trees. Lucy Morrow was a light sleeper. She answered my second knock. What do you want? Uh, put the shotgun down, Miss Morrow. What are you doing here this time of night? The money. It's here on the farm. We've been through that before, Paladin. They ripped my place apart. Every floorboard, every inch of this cabin, the yard's full of holes. You saw it this afternoon. I know, Mrs. Morrow, but... The, the money isn't here. Look, this is my last night in the only home I ever had, and I don't mean to be bothered. Mrs. Morrow... Now get away from here before I blast that shirt right off your back. You wouldn't have to leave tomorrow if I find the money. I'm not wasting any more words with you. Miss Morrow... In your rose garden, is there a bush not doing well? Paladin, it's late and it's cold. Answer me, is there? Well, yes, there is one, but what's that got to do with the money? Flowers need soil at their roots, Ms. Morrow, not gold. What? You get me a shovel, I'll show you what I mean. You know, it took me a while to... Figure out that a dying man wouldn't call his wife Rose. Her name was Lucy. 
Hold the lamp a little closer. I think we've got it. Now. Yeah, this is it. The leather bag from the Coloma Bank. We'll open it. Yeah. Gold coins. $30,000 worth. Here in the Rose Garden all the time. Drop that. Huh? Raise your hand. What? Come on. Do what I say. Good. Now just stand steady. All right, Cleet. Let's move in. Keep that light high, woman. So as we can see you both. Lucy. Yes? When I say the word, throw that lamp at them high, eye level, then hit the ground fast. I'll say when. All right. <sighs> Now. No more. Don't shoot again. Just stand easy, mister. You shot him. You shot my boy. I didn't have much choice. Cleet. Cleet, boy. He hurt bad. Uh, I'll, I'll be all right, Paul. I'll get you for this, Paladin. Don't try anything foolish, Mr. Griffin. You're already in enough trouble. I'm in trouble. Trying to hijack stolen money. Trespassing, attempted murder. Paladin. Paladin, there's someone coming. Yeah, I heard him. I think it's Randolph. Randolph? He knew I was coming out here. He probably couldn't stand waiting in town. After all, the money belongs to his bank. Oh. Huh. Paladin! Paladin, you all right? Yes, we're all right. We're over here, Mr. Randolph. Well, what happened? What was all the shooting? Well, there was a little discussion as to who was going to get that bank's money. I won. You, you mean you have the money? You, you found it, all of it? I think so, yeah. Oh. oh, good. Good, that's it right now. Now, in regards to my fee, Mr. Randolph. Yes? I want you to give it to Lucy. What? Lucy? I think a woman ought to be able to keep her home if she wants to. At the auction tomorrow, you can decide whether you want to stay or leave this charming town. Thank you, Paladin. As for you, Griffin, get your boy back to your own ranch and bandage that leg of his. I don't think Lucy Morrow cares one way or the other what happens to you. Mr. Randolph wants to bring charges later. That's up to him. As for myself, I'm saying goodbye to Coloma for the last time. You back, Mr. Faladi. And ready to see the city bright and shining? Oh, best you go away two, three more days, maybe. Why should I? Her. Who? Her. Her lady over there. He very unhappy when you no take her to the opera. Well, didn't you explain it was business? Oh, yes, sir. Important business? Yes, sir, but uh, her business more important to her, I think, Mr. Paladin. Uh, he, he maybe kill you, huh? I hope not. Well, the best way is the direct way. Excuse me. Hmm? Oh. I hope you missed me. <laughs> you did miss me. Oh. I have no other cheek to turn. Then kindly turn yourself around and leave me alone. I can hardly do that. You see, I've thought of nothing and no one but you all this time. Really? Really. <laughs> Am I to believe? You are to believe only that which will make you feel better and me feel better. And both of us enjoy a lovely evening together. That, to me, would be a simple solution. So? Dinner? Well... Please. You are a very convincing man. The current issue of TV Radio Mirror has a feature story on the man who portrays Paladin every Sunday night on CBS Radio, Mr. John Daner. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin, with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Albert Alley and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Eleanor Tannen, and Joseph Kearns. Hugh Douglas speaking. 
Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. It's Hop Along Cassidy. With action and suspense, out of the Old West comes the most famous hero of them all, Hop Along Cassidy, starring William Boyd. The ring of the silver spurs heralds the most amazing man ever to ride the prairies of the early West, Hopalong Cassidy. This famous hero thrills his 60 million fans with action and dangerous adventure. In the role of Hopalong Cassidy is the popular star of the motion picture series, William Boyd. And appearing as that laughable old character, California, is Andy Clyde. Now to our story, Range War. The rolling green range north of the Bar 20 had a look of peace about it as Hopalong Cassidy guided his white horse along the cottonwood bottom toward Cy Ottoman's ranch house. It was the time of year that usually brought peace and contentment to Hoppy and the Bar 20 gang, but this year it was different. There was a worried look on Hoppy's face as he hitched Topper to the rail and walked up to Cy Ottoman's door. Sai, you in there? Ah, oh, Cassidy. <laughs> Morning, Sai. Morning. Yeah, what's on your mind? Well, I might be able to talk better sitting down. Oh, sure, sure. Come in. Come in. Here's a chair over there. Thanks. Ah, that's better. Ah, tell me, Sai, how's your spring roundup coming? Wound her up yesterday. Your tally's all in? Yeah. Why? Well, uh... Let me see. How do I do this diplomatically? What kind of a scheme you cooking up this time? Cy, I know you're still hot under the collar about that deal I put over last time. Oh, hogwash. I was a darn fool. You got to the man with the money first with them bar 20 cars. (laughs) It ain't that that I'm hot about, Cassidy. It's something else. What's that, Cy? I'm beginning to think you got some mighty ambitious line riders. Meaning what? Meaning about a hundred head of my stock didn't answer for roll call at my roundup. I reckon they strayed too close to the bar 20 line. You know, uh, that's interesting. You denying it? I sure am. That's why I'm here. Huh? We're short a hundred head, too. I thought they might have showed up on your tally. Oh, well, what do you reckon if you... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, come in. Boy, sir. And hop along, Cassidy. Just the gents I want to see. <laughs> well, how are you, Jess? Hi, Jess. Didn't expect to see you two sitting down over the peace pipe, especially since that little deal last fall. Never mind last fall, Jess Hendricks. It's over and done with. Oh, Lordy. What did you fall into? <laughs> Cattle dip. I know I smelled a high heaven. My clothes are clean soaked with it. Ain't no one else dipping, I know. Just picked up a bunch of steers from Texas, and I ain't taking chances with Texas fever in my herd. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the subject of cattle, Si, because that's why I come. Just got my final tally sheets and... Uh... And you're short a hundred, Ed. Oh, you got them, Cassidy. I knew them darn critters straight onto somebody's range. Wait a minute. I haven't got them, Jess. Huh? Then how did you know because about them? Si and I came up short, too. hundred head apiece? Uh, more or less. Mm-hmm. I guess there's only one answer to that one. Rustlers? Yeah. Here's them nesters, that's who it is. The Sweetwater Valley? Sure, there weren't no rustling around here before the valley was open to homesteaders, was there? Ah, wait a shake, Jess. Don't jump to conclusions. Well, what do you aim to do? Well, let's keep it quiet for a few days. Snoop around a little before we start any rustler talk. Hi, Joe, if it is them nested devils, I'll show them a new use for a long rope. And I don't think you'll be alone, Si. The nesters over at Sweetwater Valley have gone in for rustling. I think this county is in for a first-class range war. A week 
has passed since Toppy called at Cy Ottoman's ranch house, a week that has seen rumors and muttered hints. And the rustle of talk swept through the section like a prairie fire, all of it directed at the nesters, the homestead and small ranchers of Sweetwater Valley. It was all suspicion, though, at least until a young nester named Bert Larimore called at the office of Henry Weatherby at the State Bank in Sweetwater. Fifty, seventy-five, one hundred, two, three, four, five. How's that look to you, Mr. Weatherby? Uh, looks like cash money, Bert. <laughs> uh, I expect we'll be having a little celebration tonight, eh? Burning that mortgage. Yeah. Uh, would I be too nosy if I inquired about... Uh... <laughs> you mean, where'd I get the money? No, I'll be glad to tell you, Henry. Aunt of mine in New Jersey. She passed away a few weeks ago. She left it to me. I see. Does that answer your question, Mr. Weatherby? Yeah. Yeah, Bert, I suppose it does. Five hundred dollars cash? Well, that's right, Hoppy. Hmm. Well, I don't know, Johnny. Maybe Bert Larimore did have an aunt least. Well, Weatherby checked it. Only relatives he has are a couple of cousins in San Francisco. Six months ago, Larimore didn't have a dime to his name. How do you know? Well, I... I had a pretty good reason, Hoppy. And what's that? A small matter of $50 he stole from me. To cover a bet he made at the North Fork Saloon one night. Hmm. So now it comes out. That's why you... Yeah, that's why I broke up with his sister. I see. The stockmen are ready to move right now. Well, they're crazy. Maybe. But all they needed was that Larimore thing. What kind of evidence is that? So unless they get rich, does that mean that every homesteader in Sweetwater Valley is rustling cattle? The stockmen seem to think so, and it's good enough for me. Well, I'm short as many head as they are, and I don't think so. You better not think so either, Johnny, until we got proof. Well, maybe I'd better remind you about that little mix-up we had when you first came to the Bar 20. When that batch of self-righteous gunslingers came out here ready to lynch you for something you had nothing to do with. Just because you'd done a spell in prison. Well, I... Well, what? I'm wrong, Hoppy. I know it. But all that talk in town kind of gets under a fellow's skin. Yeah, I suppose it does. But there are two sides to the wrestling business, Johnny. First you got to steal them, then you got to sell them. I've had California out checking every shipping yard from Council City to Alderville, looking for blotched brands. There hasn't been a suspicious critter shipped out of this country for a year. Claremore got his money from stolen cows. Where'd he sell them? Hmm. Well, that's something to think about, all right. Well, I'm with you, Hoppy. But we better speak our peace because they're not going to hold off much longer. Come on, let's saddle up. Where are we going? I want to ride into North Fork and take a look around. And on the way, we can stop in at Laramore's. Maybe you can give us some more details on that ant of his in New Jersey. You go on in, Johnny. Topper's got a loose hind shoe. I want to take a look at it. Okay. We stay in here? No. Tell him we're riding on into North Fork tonight. That suits me. Johnny McIver. Hello, Marcella. Come on in, Johnny. Thanks. Hoppy will be long in a minute. This is quite a surprise. Yeah. Bert in? He's been staying in North Fork for the last few days. Oh. You're looking fine, Johnny. Well, I was going to say the same about you. You still is well, as pretty as ever. Thanks. I I guess I didn't keep my promise. I said I wouldn't bother you anymore. I mean, that, I mean after that business with Bert. I'd like to forget that, Johnny. And so would I. Marcella, do you, do you reckon we... Yes, Johnny? Oh, that's Hoppy. I'm going to have to take Topper to the blacksmith in town. Oh, uh, evening, Miss Larimore. Mr. Cassidy. Bert's in town. Oh, well, I guess we'd better be riding along then. What did you want to see him about? Oh, Hoppy, let's not... I think she has a right to know, Johnny. What is it? It's about that money Bert paid off your mortgage with. I... I see. Now, listen, Marcella. It seems we always get around to money, doesn't it? 
What business is it of yours if Bert has some luck and pays off the mortgage? That's a good question, and I'll answer it. There are a lot of ranchers around here who like to jump to conclusions when a nester shows up with money he can't account for. Especially when every ranch in this district is short on their cattle tallies. So that's it. You think he's a rustler? I'm only telling you what the rest of them think. Where'd he get that money, Marcella? He said he made a business deal in the East. You believe him? Of course I believe him. I guess I was wrong about you, Johnny. Oh, I wish I knew why you hate him. I wish I knew why you won't stop until you've ruined him. Listen to me, Marcella. Wait a minute, Johnny. Miss Larimore, whether you know it or not, we're hanging on the ragged edge of a cattle war around here. Of course I know it. Every homesteader in the valley scared to death, putting up barricades around ranch houses, waiting for a bunch of your murdering cattlemen to ride now, up... Now, let me finish. I've heard all I want to hear. You're tickled to death about this rustling business because it gives you a handy reason to shoot up Sweetwater Valley and run us out of here. All right. You want to know the one way we can stop it? We? Yes, we. Johnny and I are fighting it just as hard as you are. There's only one way to stop this thing before it blows up in our faces. Before you and Bert and a lot of innocent people get hurt. Go on. There won't be any range war if we take the excuse away. We prove there's nothing wrong with the money Bert turned up with. And if we run down the thief who's got those cattle. And believe me, Miss Larimore, that's the only way we can stop it. That's the blacksmith shop over there. Oh, he's closed up for the night. Ah, he sleeps in the back. Let's ride around the back entrance and see if we can get him up. We might be riding back to Bar 20 tonight, and I don't want a lame horse on my end. Pull up, Johnny. What is it? Look. Over there by the back window. Where? Oh. Oh, yeah. He's lighting a cigarette. Did you get a look at his face? That's funny. Wonder what he's doing in town. Who? Smoke Bledsoe. He used to run a profitable business down in Texas. What do you mean? Killing people. Oh. He's a professional gunman. Well, wait till he's gone, and I want to take a look inside that blacksmith shop. Maybe we better take the door off its hinges. I'll put the bar in deeper. I think we can pry it off. Okay. Here, I'll give you a hand. Right. There she goes. Now, let's see what Mr. Bledsoe was up to. Huh? Look. Yeah? Is he? Yeah, he's dead. Bledsoe doesn't walk away from him until he's sure of that. Let me light a match. Careful. Hold it down. That's it. Look. Under the desk there, those papers. Yeah. Hmm. What is it? Circle H. Sunflower. Lazy C. Flying O. Brands? Yeah, drawings of brands. And a funny thing. What's that? Every brand here belongs to a nester in Sweetwater Valley. I think our friend on the floor there made up an order of branding irons. And someone thought he might talk too much. So he had Bledsoe nail him through that window there. Well, better get the sheriff, huh? Not yet. Well, what about Bledsoe? We can get him later. I want to give Mr. Bledsoe a free reign right now. You never can tell, Johnny. He just might lead us to the man he's working for. <laughs> It's almost midnight now as Hoppy mounts the stairs of the rickety North Fork Hotel and walks down the hallway into a room full of angry cattlemen. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, here's the figures, everybody. Now, news I can calculate, there's over a thousand head missing. A thousand head? Now, wait a minute. Now, the question is... What can we do about it? Well, you don't don't have have it. Just a minute, boys. Hey, I'd like to stick my oar in, if you don't mind, being a paid-up member of the Cattlemen's Association. I think you're all going off half-cocked. No, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? Wars are pretty much alike. Well, they're cattle wars of the big kind. I don't like to see rangeland fenced off any more than you do. Well? But those nesters in Sweetwater Valley have a legal right to that land until someone proves a charge against them. Oh, now, listen. Now, wait a minute. 
minute, Hoppy. Oh, hello, Jess. Boys, I just got here in time to hear what Chastity said. I want you to know I felt the same way until a few minutes ago. You want proof, Hoppy. I've got it for you. All right, Jess. I want you all to show up at my ranch house tomorrow night at 8 and come ready for a fight. What is it, Jess? A little bird I found, Hoppy. A little bird that's going to sing for the boys when I tell him to. I'll be ready to listen. I don't think you'll be disappointed. All right, Si, let's get on with it. You bet. If the shooting's going to start tomorrow night, we've got some planning to do. All right, Bobby. Well, Hello, Larimore. Huh? Oh, huh. Johnny McIver. Mind if I have a drink with you? Yeah, I mean, no, not at all. Not at all, Johnny. Here, let me buy you one, eh? Well, <laughs> times have changed, huh? Uh, Last time I saw you, you didn't have the price of a small buttermilk. Yeah, yeah, I had a little luck, Johnny, a little luck. Uh, Sam, Sam, bring me a couple more of these, will you? Nice to see you again, Johnny, nice to see you again. Thanks. You're looking a little thin, Bert. Huh? Something bothering you? Oh, no. No, things are going great, Johnny, going great. No. Now, I'll take part of that back. Something has been bothering me. One thing. What's that? This. Well, $50. Look, let's say I borrowed it, eh? And here's five more for interest. Well, uh, I don't know if I should. Go ahead. Take it. Ah, oh, here's the drinks. Now, oh, here's to you, Johnny. Same to you, Bert. <laughs> Thanks, Bert. Uh Uh-oh. What is it? A friend of mine waiting outside. So long, Bert. Uh, Take care of yourself. What is it, Hoppy? Meeting just broke up. The shooting starts tomorrow night. Where does that leave us? I don't know. What about Larimore? Oh, I was just starting to work on him when you gave me the sign. Look. Fifty dollars. Told me he was paying off his loan. What's the matter? Smell that bill. Cattle dip. Wait. Wait a minute. Yeah, me too. Only one ranch around here is using cattle dip right now. Jess Hendricks. But why is he paying Larimore? Why is he... Quick, do- around the corner. What is it? It's Hendricks. Get into the alley. What is it, Jess? What do you want? Take it easy. It is at all. Yeah, it's all set. You're going to sing your solo tomorrow night at my place. Loud and long. Be sure you got it note for note. Listen, Hendrick, I'm getting scared. They'll kill me. There's no easier way of making $15,000, sonny. You'll have to take your chances. Bledsoe's here, and he'll hustle you out of the state before the nurses know what happened. Okay, Jess. You better run on home now and practice. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Double crossing little snake. He'll get paid off, all right. Smoke! Yeah? You saw Larimore, all right? Yeah. Got him tagged? Like he was already on a marble slab. Tomorrow night at my place. I'll sit him at the right hand window on the east side of the house, right? Yeah. Remember, the red lamp. The red lamp. And don't miss. I ain't likely to. I ain't missed for 20 years. Good. I'm counting on you. I'll go with you as far as the corner. Then remember, I don't want to be seen with you from now on. I got you. I'll get this straight. I don't want any slip-ups. We do everything just as we... Phew. That was quite a scene. Yeah. Judas and the 20 pieces of silver. Huh? Never mind. I guess Larimore was just practicing when he stole your $50, Johnny. Now he's selling out every rancher in the valley. Hmm. What was that business about the red lamp? I don't know. I suppose we'll have to go to the meeting tomorrow night to find out. All right. 
right, boys. I promised fireworks tonight, and I brought them. Johnny. Yeah? Sneak around the back of the crowd and keep your hand on your gun. Gotcha. All right, all right. well, come on, well, let's have What's it, up, Jenkins. Huh? All right, here she is. Hey, what's that paper you got there? This piece of paper here accounts for your missing cattle. It's a signed confession involving every nester in Sweetwater Valley. What? A signed confession from the nester? The man who signed it knows his life ain't worth a dime, but he agreed to come here when I promised him we'd see to it he got across the state line safe. Come on in, Larimore. My first Larimore. Sit down in that chair there next to the window. Okay, Jess. Okay. Now, I'm not going into details tonight, Larimore. What these men are interested in is, first, what happened to the cattle? Oh, it's in the statement there. We run them up through Winchester Pass onto Boulder Flat. You'll find them there. What about the brands? We watched them. Put on our own marks. I see. Who's we? Me. Rest of the nesters. How many of them? All of them. All All of them. Can you prove that, Larimer? I don't have to. Look at the cattle. The brands will tell you who's in on it. We're planning to run them up north next month. Ship them out of Montana. Well, you fellas need any more proof before we leave? Yeah, Jess. I do. What do you mean? Okay, Cassidy. If you want to ask the boy some questions, go ahead. Thanks. Light's kind of bad in here. First, let me move this lamp over here by the window. Go ahead. Lamp. Wait, the red lamp. Uh, Jess. Yeah? Wait a minute. Just moving the lamp here. Never mind the lamp. The light's good enough. What's the matter, Hoppy? Got the jitters? Yeah, and I don't want to question the boy. I want to question you. Me? What are you leaving? Only up? take a minute, Jess. Since we seem to be using this chair by the window as a witness stand, why don't you sit in it? Go on, Bert. Give me a seat. Listen, Cassidy, I ain't no mood. What's but... the matter, Jess? You scared us? Shut up, Si. Jess, I'm asking you to sit down in that chair. I'll answer any questions from here. I... The next one will come closer. Sit in that chair. I don't get you. What's Keep your seats, everybody. You're supposed to be after the truth. So am I. If you give me two minutes, I'll get it for you. Yes, I think you better do what Hoppy said. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I'll sit in the chair. Make yourself comfortable, Jess. I'm comfortable. Go ahead. All right. First off, I'll tell you that Larimore's confession is all right. Except for one thing. What's that? It's a lie. Well, what do you mean, Hoppy? Ah, it's simple enough. Jess has a connection in the state capitol. Sweetwater Valley is his if he can get the nesters out. Johnny and I uncovered that one this afternoon. You can prove that, Chesity? We won't have Why to. Why not? You are going to confess to it. Confess to it? So to get on with the story, Jess figured the best way to get the nesters out would be to start a range war. Range war? He hired a bunch of thugs from out of the state and ran off our cattle just before a roundup. He went to the blacksmith in town and had him make duplicates of every brand along the Sweetwater. And marked the cows after he got them up to Boulder Flat. You're out of your head, Jess. Take it easy, Jess. You're going to confess to that one, too. Then he had one of his gunslingers kill the blacksmith to shut him up. What about Larimore? Maybe you'd better ask him about that, Si. About the $15,000 Jess is paying him for the song he sang tonight. What about that, Jess? I suppose I'm going to confess to that, too. That's right. Now, stand back, everyone, while we listen to Jess's confession. Johnny. Yeah? Pick up that red lamp and set it down next to the window over there. The lamp? No! No, don't! Hey. Easy, Jess. Just let us know when you're ready to talk. Over here, Johnny. Stop! He's right! I did it! I did it! I gotta admit you taught us a lesson we won't forget for a while. <laughs> I hope so, Si. Hmm, the boys are running Larimore down to the jail. Yeah, who's that gal out there with Johnny? Larimore's sister. I expect she and Johnny have some talking to do. Jess. Yeah? We better get going. Sheriff will want to hear what you have to say. 
And besides, Smoke Bledsoe's looking forward to your company. Smoke? In jail? <laughs> Been there since morning, Jess. Charged with killing the blacksmith. But I still got to hand it to you at that. Even though he wasn't out there waiting with his gun cock, you sure sang a nice song. <laughs> Goodbye from Hopalong Cassidy. We hope you'll be back with us soon when Hoppy will again bring you more adventure and excitement. Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is transcribed and produced in the West by Walter White, Jr. Range War was written by Harold Swanton. All stories are based upon the characters created by Clarence E. Mulford. This is a Commodore production. as Captain Lee Quince. Specially transcribed tales of the dark and tragic ground of the wild frontier, the saga of fighting men who rode the rim of empire, and the dramatic story of Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. Sergeant Gorse, dismiss the patrol. Yes, sir. Prepare to dismount. Dismount. Welcome back, Captain. Thank you, Sergeant Jenkins. Major Daggett in? He's been expecting you. Come in. Oh, Lee. Glad you're back. That makes both of us, Major. Are you find anything? No trouble. Some of the dog soldiers are restless. But so far, no Sioux have left treaty territory. Oh, that's good. Yep. Except I've had a ten-day ride for nothing. Well, there's no matter. We have to investigate every report. You know that. I know. Well, like I said, I'm glad you're back. But I'm not sure you'll be. Why? You're in time to welcome an old friend of yours. Huh? Who? His orders read Lieutenant... R.C. Went. Robbie? That's right. Major Went. He is signed here? He's on the post already. He arrived an hour ago. He'll be reporting any minute. Want to stay and see him? You want me to? It's up to you. You'll have to face him sooner or later anyway, I suppose. Major, he's an old friend. Nothing can change that. You still feel that way? Yep. Where will he be assigned? C Company is short an officer. I thought... Can I have him? You can transfer Hancock to C. Why? Maybe I can ease things a little. What about yourself? You think he'll like serving under you? An officer who once served under him? He'll do all right. He's a good officer. Well, I can't say much for him now. Five posts in two years. And he couldn't face it out at any of them. Now we're stuck with him. A drunkard, a troublemaker, and a coward. Coward of Antelope Meadows. I'm not sure he deserves that reputation. Court of Inquiry that demoted him thought so. They demoted him for poor judgment, not cowardice. What would you call a man who ran away from a fight, left his commander and 200 men to be wiped out? He was under attack himself. He could have fought through to Bartlett and saved them. Maybe and maybe not. 
He might only have added a hundred more men to the list of dead. Instead, he tried to save his own command, and he succeeded. It was a difficult decision, but not necessarily bad judgment. The court of inquiry said so. The court of inquiry was in Washington. They went by the book. You know how different it can be out here, how hard a decision can be when you're under attack. Uh, hindsight's always easy. Uh, why are we arguing? Assign him to me. All right. Be a good Samaritan if you have to. Yeah, there he is. Come in. Lieutenant Went reporting to Major Dykett as directed. Yes, been expecting you, Went. I uh, believe you know Captain Quince. Hello, Robbie. Captain. It's been a long time since Virginia. Yes. Sorry I didn't see you. I've developed a habit of speaking when I'm spoken to. You're looking well. Major, have you uh, figured out a place for me? I didn't try to figure a place for you, Went. You're just another officer here. You'll be put where you're needed. I've assigned you to B Company. That's Captain Quince here. Very well. You can report to the officer of the day at your convenience. You'll be placed on active duty as of 5 a.m. tomorrow. You'll take morning call. Yes, sir. We hope you'll have a pleasant tour at Laramie. Do you, Major? Went, I said you're just another officer here. That's the way you'll be treated. But I expect a cooperative attitude from you like any other officer. A chip on that shoulder won't help. Very good, Major. Am I dismissed? Yes. I'll, uh, I'll come along if I may, Robbie, show you the place. All right, Captain. Oh, Lee. Yes, sir? One moment, huh? I'll uh, be right with you, Robbie. All right. You see what I mean? Liquored up, middle of the day. He's going to be trouble. He's gone through a lot, Major. Sometimes I think you're a soft fool. I'm warning you, Lee, don't try to fight his battles for him. Keep a tight hold on him. Don't worry. I'll take you over by the quarters, Robbie. They're a little better than the ones we had in Virginia. You might like Laramie. It's a good post. I've noticed a lot of women. More than I expected out here. A lot of the men are married. It's safe enough here. <laughs> it's good to see you, Robbie. It is? We had some good days in Virginia. <laughs> I was your commanding officer then. You were a good one. Now... Robbie, there are plenty of gray-haired lieutenants in this army for one reason or another, but not many of them cry in their beer. Thank you, Captain, for reminding me. Oh, you've got to give people a chance. What about them giving me a chance? Oh, you've got to meet them halfway, Robbie. Halfway. Good morning, Captain Quince. Oh, hello, Miss St. Cloud. May I present Lieutenant Went? We don't need an introduction, Captain. Hello, Robbie. Mrs. St. Cloud. It's good to see you. Thank you. I saw you earlier crossing the parade ground. What brings you to Laramie? I'm to be stationed here. Oh, I'm very glad. Are you? Of course. Captain, Robbie and I are old friends. Well, you must come and visit me the first chance you get, Robbie. Thank you. Oh, here's Philip. You never met my husband, did you? Philip, this is Robbie Went. Lieutenant St. Cloud... How do you do? He's to be stationed here. That's too bad. Philip. You remember Lieutenant Yeager, don't you, Went? He was my best friend, my roommate at the point. I'm sure you must remember him because he died with Bartlett that day at Antelope Meadows. Philip, don't. Come along, Maud. But, Philip. What were you saying about a chance, Captain? I'm sorry, Robbie. There's bound to be some feeling at first, but in time... You're I... an optimist, Captain. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll stop by the sutlers. They can still sell liquor on this post, can't they? You think that'll help? It's the only help I need, Captain. Good day. Prisoner accounted for, sir. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, uh, where, where are the orders? In your pockets. Uh, in my... Uh, Lieutenant, is anything wrong? What do you mean, Sergeant? I mean, are you all right? Are you feeling all right? Of course I am. Now, where is it? Here, sir. Shall I read them? You? Captain Quince sometimes has me read them, sir. I, I just thought... Now you he... stop thinking, Sergeant. Lieutenant... I'm perfectly capable... Morning, Lieutenant Wendt. Sergeant Gorse. Sir. What are you doing here, Quince? Don't you think I can take morning call by myself? Of course, Lieutenant. I'm perfectly all right. Absolutely all right. I'm not so sure. I think you'd better go back to your quarters. I'll relieve you here. Is that an order, Captain? That's a suggestion. All right. Straighten up, man. You're in front of a hundred enlisted men. Yeah, uh, that'll be all right. I... I'll go with you. I can... It's a long walk across the parade ground. The men are watching. Just keep your shoulder into mine. Sergeant, you'll read the orders of the day. Yes, sir. Come on, Robbie. <laughs> Here, keep this cold compress in your head. Mm, thanks. Robbie, this is no good. You can't keep this up. What? Running away, hiding in a bottle. Uh, you gonna report me? Did you report me that time in Virginia? But it can't happen too often, you understand that. I know. Well, Lee, thanks. You're the only one in two years that's been decent. I'm sorry if I can't come halfway. Maybe if you try to face it and not run away. Other men have been busted. Oh, it's not that. No. Do you know what my second-in-command said after Antelope Meadows? He said, we should all be dead. And we would have been if we hadn't been led by a coward. You weren't a coward in Virginia, and when that court of inquiry demoted you, you didn't have to stay in the army. You could have resigned. Yes. It I... took guts to stay. That wasn't the act of a coward. I love the army. It's my life. And I was mad. I thought I was right. I had the guts then. Then what's happened? Do you know what it's like to be sneered at? Hated wherever you go? To be blamed for other men's deaths? Like that St. Cloud yesterday, I've had two years of that, Lee. Maybe now I am a coward. Not unless you're willing to be, if you... Come in! Oh, Miss St. Cloud. Robbie, I... I heard you were ill. Word gets around, doesn't it? Are you all right? All right. You'll be fine, ma'am. Is there anything I can do for you, Robbie? Oh, no. Thanks. Well, I'll stop in again this afternoon. I am not so sure your husband would approve, Mrs. St. Cloud. Robbie, if you won't or can't come to visit me, I'll come to visit you. Good day, Captain. Ma'am? It seems you do have friends, Lieutenant. You, Maud. Well, Lee... Was I wrong? About what? Antelope Meadows. I don't know. It tortures me, Lee. You did what you thought was right. Now, right or wrong, you better forget it. How could a man forget a thing like that? I don't know, Robbie. a small detachment to patrol the line. We've had no further reports, but I want to keep watch. What about Syberts and eight men, Lee? Why not... Why not Went? What's the matter? Want to get him away from the post? No, it's not that. It might be what he needs. I'm not sure I trust him with a patrol. You think you fooled me with that relieved of duty because of illness? He's just about drunk the sutler's dry. He's getting better lately. That's not what I hear. Maybe he's not drinking quite so much, but... But what? I've heard reports about him and Mrs. St. Cloud. They've been seeing each other entirely too much. She's been seen going into his quarters. She tended him when he was ill. And he's been at her rooms when St. Cloud was away. They're old friends. 
Maybe. But I always did think that woman was too pretty. Major, I don't think there's anything wrong. But if there is, all the more reason to send Wendt out in that patrol. You trust him? He's a good officer. I'll send Gorse with him. All right, Lee. I just hope you're right. Send Wendt to me for orders. Right away, sir. Captain. Captain. What's the matter, Sergeant? Over at Old Bedlam. There's going to be trouble. What trouble? The two lieutenants. St. Cloud's gone looking for Wendt. Thanks. Cloud, I heard what's been going on behind my back. It's all over the post. He can't get by fooling around with my wife. I'll That's kill That's enough. That's a court-martial offense you're charging. You want to make it official? I certainly... And subject your wife to the embarrassment of it? No. All right. No. When? Do you want to prefer charges against him? No. Then the two of you remember your officers in the U.S. Cavalry and act accordingly. He better stay away from my wife. You won't have to worry about that for a while. He's going out on patrol tonight. Now, get out of here, St. Cloud. Uh. Uh. Lee. I don't want to hear about it. It's none of my business. But, Lee, there's no... You got a job to do. As soon as you clean up, report to the Major for your orders. All right, Captain. Yes? Captain, I, I no heard No harm you. done, Miss St. Cloud. Except to the dignity of a couple of officers. It's my fault. I should have known Philip wouldn't understand. But I want you to understand, Captain. Why me? Because you're his friend, too. All right. I was only trying to help him. We're old friends, yes, but... Once it was more than that. Once... Before I met Philip, it was going to be Robbie. I couldn't just stand by and see this happening to him. I see. Did I do wrong, Captain? Who's to say that, Miss St. Cloud? I don't know. Oh, I, I wish I were wiser. So do I, ma'am. So do I. Lee, this report just came in from the telegraph at Cheyenne. Trouble, Major? A Sioux raiding party attacked the railroad. If they're not still in the vicinity, they'll be heading north. Wentz moving to intercept Wentz? them. Yeah, he stopped at Pine Bluff and got the news. But he'll need reinforcements. Might be a big party, we don't know. Besides, with Went in charge... I can have B Company ready in an hour. Oh, will that be enough? B's undermanned. You've only got 63 men. It'll be enough. All right. Rendezvous with Went at the Forks on Little Bear Creek. And Lee, don't take any chances. Carry 200 rounds per man. This could be a fight. Captain, single rider approaching. Yeah, I see him. Looks like Gorse. Keep him going, Mr. Seibertz. I'll swing out and meet him. Yes, sir. Sergeant? Captain, Lieutenant Went sent me to intercept you. He's moving towards Horse Creek. He wants you to cut across and meet him. All right, good. Sure glad you're here, Captain. Why? 
Well, we had them cornered last night, but they got away. We could have taken them. How many? Around 30. Nine men against 30? We could have surprised them. The men are kind of talking, son. What are you trying to tell me, Gorse? The lieutenant wouldn't attack. Or couldn't. Had he been drinking? Yes, sir. Was he drunk, Sergeant? Well, no, sir, I couldn't say that. Then think about this, Sergeant. You men might not be alive today if he had attacked. Yes, sir, I've heard that before. It's still true, Sergeant. All right, let's join him. There's their signal, Captain. Here comes the lieutenant to meet us. Company! Company! Follow! Lieutenant? They're down in the valley about a mile ahead, Captain. You can surround them by splitting your force in three. Good. All right, Cybert, you take 20 men and the right flank. Yes, sir. Sergeant Gorse, you'll take 12 more men and join with Lieutenant Wentz patrol on the left flank. Yes, sir. The rest will stay with me in the center. Uh, I'd like the center, Captain, if I may. Why? It's closer. It'll lead the attack. I found them. All right. I'll take the left. Sergeant Jenkins, take over. I'll join you in a minute. Now, move out. Right, sir. Yes, sir. Good work, Lieutenant. And you used good judgment. Not attacking last night. Did I? Here, Captain, have a drink. Yeah, thanks. Why'd you do that? You don't need it. You've gotten your courage out of a bottle for so long, you think you have to have it. Don't I? No, you don't, Robbie. All right, Lieutenant Went. Move out. Doesn't look like we'll get much fighting, sir. No, Jenkins, we're pretty far away, but we'll block this end of the valley for them. Yes, sir. There they go, sir. All right. Company! Company! At the trot! At the trot! Oh! We got him rounded up, Captain. Wasn't much of a fight. When they saw us coming in from three sides, they just dropped everything and ran. Good. Any casualties? No, sir, I don't think so. Not a one. Captain! Huh? Over here. Casualties, sir. Lieutenant Wint. Robbie? Lee, I am sorry you smashed that bottle now. Garth, Holder's bringing the first aid, sir. No, no use, Lee. No use, you know that. Robbie, I'm sorry. Yeah, so am I. About a lot of things. Maud St. Cloud... A lot of things. But Lee, there's one thing I'm not sorry about. Antelope Meadows? Yeah. I was right, Lee. I couldn't have saved Bartlett. But I could save my hundred men, and I didn't. That's right. Oh, only one thing nobody understands. It wasn't my own life I was thinking about. I understand that, Robbie. Do you, Lee? Thanks. Oh, 
I wish... I wish... Captain. What is it, Sergeant? I saw it, sir. He deliberately cut in front of Holder and took the only bullet the engine fired. He saved Holder's life. I guess I was wrong, sir. Were you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. He was no coward. No? No, he wasn't. Come in. Oh. Miss St. Cloud. Captain? I've just been over to see. I won't be attending the services. I understand. Captain? Yes? Captain, did he... Did he say anything about me? Yes, he did, Miss St. Cloud. He said he was sorry. Not half as sorry as I am, Captain. I wanted to help him. But I was afraid to say the one thing that might have helped him most. Sometimes it's kind of hard to... I wanted to tell him that... that he was the only man I ever really loved. But I... I was afraid of the consequences. I should have told him, Captain. I should have told him a long time ago. Well, Philip will be wondering where I am. Good day, Captain. Good day, Miss St. Cloud. Fort Laramie is produced and directed by Norman MacDonnell and stars Raymond Burr as Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry, with Vic Perrin as Sergeant Gorse. The script was specially written for Fort Laramie by John Dunkel, with sound patterns by Bill James and Ray Kemper. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Jack Moyles, Harry Bartell, Lynn Allen, Paul Duboff, and Clayton Post. Company tension. Dismiss. Next week, another transcribed story of the Northwest Frontier and the troopers who fought under Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal.
Chester had been helping me with some paperwork after the regular day ended, and we didn't get through until about ten o'clock. And we were both kind of tired. I sure never did think I'd hold out, Mr. Dillon. I got a cramp in my hand and a crick in the neck. What I need is a beer. <laughs> I'll join you, Chester. I locked up the office and walked down to the Texas Trail with Chester. I guess the best thing that could be said for the night was that it was still... Not cold, not warm. Somewhere in that between that makes you wish it would be one thing or the other. Or maybe it was because we were tired that it didn't feel right. The bar wasn't crowded, and right off, Kitty came over to our table with beer. I thought she looked kind of worried. Hard day, Matt? Oh, no. No, nothing much. Oh, um. I declare, Miss Kitty, this beer tastes darker than usual. New brew, probably, Chester. Yeah, I suppose. Say, Matt, you ever seen the stranger before? The tall one, the bar? Huh? Ah, uh, no, no. My heavens, Mr. Dillon, he is a lofty man, and that's for sure. Look at him stretch out. Yeah. What about him, Kitty? Well, I don't know. Sam gave me the eye a bit ago just before you came in. Huh? You trying to make trouble? Sam's not sure. The fellow's been drinking straight for more than two hours, and he, he doesn't say anything. He just looks like he's getting ready. Maybe waiting for something. Yeah. Is the woman with him? Yeah. <laughs> He was a lean, almost stringy man, better than usual tall. And he might have served in the army once because he wore his gun butt forward. As we sat, Chester and me drinking our beer, he turned around a couple of times and looked at the door. I never saw a man with eyes as gray or with a skin to his face so dry and tough you'd swear you could get sparks off it with a flint. The woman standing next to him talked loud and often, but he didn't appear to be listening much. It was like Kitty said, he he was waiting. About an hour went by, and the place began to quiet down. Most of the men drifted out to wherever their way was taken. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> You uh, want to get on back, Chester? Well, yes, sir. I was thinking about it. This beer is so dark, it's making me sleepy. <laughs> well, you go ahead. I'll see you in the morning. You staying? Yeah. Yeah, for a while, I think. On account of that tall fellow? Yeah, maybe. Guess I'll get a little whiskey and sugar. Might keep me awake. No, you go on, Chester. It's all right. What do you want? Jack, how long you If it's all the same around? to you, Mr. Dillon, I ain't well, sleepy. But, Jack, okay. I'm tired. There's a hotel down the way, miss, that could put you up. Who? Well, Shut up. Nobody asked you. Oh, now, Jack, you ain't got no call to talk to the man like that. He's just being helpful. Say, Mr. Dillon, Chester, be quiet. Honey, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. A trip on the stage and traveling all day, I... I swear I've never been so... You talk too much. Be quiet. Stay in here with me. But Jackie... You've been talking ever since we come in here. Stop or I'm going to hit you. Might not be a bad thing if you did, Mr. Dillon. If there's anything in this world I hate, it's a woman who does nothing but clobber her guns. Uh, Kitty. I bet he is miserable to be wed to, though. What do you reckon's ailing him? I don't know, Chester. You still here, hmm? Uh, yeah. Uh, sit down a minute, will you, Kitty? Yeah, sure. You uh, don't know their names, do you? No. I came in on a six o'clock stage from Oklahoma Territory. That's all I know. She's been talking a lot, but mostly about clothes and liquor. He don't say anything. Yeah. 
You think they're married? She's wearing a ring. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a man drink as much, Matt. It's like water with Honey! Me. Hey, you! Honey! Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, Matt. Yeah, sure. Drink, then, sure. What do you want to drink? Huh? Sure. Huh? Oh, you want this? Oh, you want whiskey and sugar? Thank you, honey. Sure. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to freshen up, Jack. I'm coming right back. See you do. The woman had just got out of sight when we heard the horses coming down the street outside. There were only six of us left in the place. Sam, Kitty, Chester, and me, the stranger at the bar, and a cowboy sleeping it off at a table across the room. The tall man called Jack, with the sound of the horses, turned to the door, and there was a gun in his hand. You fellas at the table, get up. Come over here. (coughs) Where? Well, I kind of wondered what you were waiting for. I know you've been wondering. That's why you've been hanging around. I don't want no trouble with you. Stay out of the way, you won't get hurt. Why don't you put your gun away, mister? Don't bother me. There's trouble coming through that door any minute. Put it back. I don't allow gunplay in Dodge. What you allow ain't up to you now, mister. If you're in trouble, it's my job to protect you and your wife. This is private trouble. If you want part of it, I'll give it to you right now. In the belly. Jack, they're here, outside. I yeah, know. We can get out the back. I ain't running no more. You either. Come on, get behind the bar. Yeah. You two fellas on hit your belts. Leave them lay where they fall. Go on. Honey, you give me a gun, will you? I'll give you one, I'll give you one. Wait a minute. Okay. You two get around behind the bar. All right. At the end. You. You and the lady. Now listen, you can't shoot up this place. Sam, do what he says. Chester and I did as we were told and got behind the bar along with Kitty and Sam. The tall man picked up our guns and tossed one to the woman and then dropped the others beside him on the floor. And then we waited. All of us behind the bar, except for the cowboy drunk asleep at the table. You only had that mirror in for a month. It's going to be busted for sure. Honey, we should have kept going. Got the train in the morning further west. We had to stop somewhere. This is as good a place as any. Listen, mister, I'm going over and get the boy sleeping at the table there. He's going to get hurt. You move an inch from where you're at and I'll shoot you. Now shut up, all of you. I hear him out there. Yeah. Start shooting when that door swings in. Mr. Dillon? Stay down, Kitty. Don't worry, Matt. There's a big... Stop talking to the dog. They'll be in a saloon. Sure. I know, Farrell. Well, come on. Might as well start looking in here. Yeah, well, okay. Let's do it a drink. There he is. The shooting went on for about five seconds, and when the glass started to come down behind us, we covered up. And at that, I felt a warm trickle along the side of my face where a splinter had slashed me. There wasn't anybody behind the bar hurt beyond a scratch or two from the glass. But out there, by the door and sprawled out beyond onto the walk, were four men. They never had a chance. They'd never have another. Watch out for the glass, Jack. We got him, we got him. Yeah. Yeah, we got him, honey. When I'm still alive. Who is it? It's Acton. Let me. <laughs> Never did like him. Come on, let's go. All right, Jackie. 
Sorry, messed up your place, honey. Don't you try coming after us, mister. Jack's had a taste of blood. Come on, come on. Jackie, we're going to have to ride now? Yeah. Oh, honey, I'm tired. I'll take it easy later. Are you all right, Kitty? Well, I, I think so. Hey, look at that mirror. Just look at it. What happened? Chester, get some guns from the office. Saddle up and get back here. Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, all right now, folks. There's just been a little shooting, that's all. Everything's going to be just... Kitty, yeah. get Doc, quick. What is it, man? This man isn't dead. Huh? Well, go on, hurry up, will you? Well, yeah, sure. She ran out into the night for Doc. And I stayed in the Texas Trail watching the life flow out of the bullet hole in the chest of the man the killers had called Acton. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, you can help your fighting men and our children win the fight for life if you act now. On the battlefront, our fighting men need blood to replace the precious substance they have so valiantly lost. Only through contributions to your Red Cross fund drive can we keep up that lifeline of blood to our wounded men. But time is running out. Give now. Your Red Cross must also have funds to transform blood into anti-polio serum. The polio season is just around the corner. Red Cross Gamma Globulin is the one weapon that will spare our children from death or the crippling paralysis of polio this summer. Polio won't wait. Your community, your neighbors, perhaps your own child, can be saved from the horrible effects of the dread disease if we do something now. Your Red Cross will not distribute the anti-polio serum. It will be sent to critical areas by government health agencies. There will not be enough to protect every child this year, but many thousands will be spared polio paralysis this summer because you gave to your Red Cross. When your Red Cross fund volunteer calls, give generously. Do it today. You give, they live. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. His eyes were open, but he didn't see me. And when I talked to him, he didn't hear. While I waited for Doc, I went through his papers. His name was Brad Acton. That's all I could find. About two minutes later, Kitty came back with Doc. Didn't take Doc long to shake his head. Oh, poor fella. He's done, Matt. There's not a living chance. Yeah, if I could just get him to talk. We gotta find out who he is and what they've done. Those two. I don't know. He's pretty near gone. We can't... Yeah. Acton? Acton, can you hear me? Acton? Acton? Acton, that fella, Jack Farrow. He and the woman... What did they do? Oh, there's no use. Matt, he Acton. can't say nothing. Now listen to me, Acton. Matt. Acton, who are they? Uh, Why did they shoot you? He's trying, the poor devil. He can't... Come on, can't... come on. Now you're wasting time. I gotta get after him. Now what did they do? I'm dying. I'm dying. We've all gotta die. Oh, Matt. That... That ain't... Kindly, mister. Now, I want you to wake up. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I hear you. If I was on my feet... Now, listen to me. I'd... Pharaoh. I heard you call him Pharaoh. And the woman. Now, what about him? Why did you come gunning for him? Yeah. Had it come. Why? What did they do? Don't matter now. It matters. If you're gonna die, get it off yourself. Now come on. 
Uh, you and your pals there. If you did nothing wrong, you'll die more comfortable. Oh, Matt, let him be. It's not Matt, fair. Matt, don't. What about it, Acton? Matt, no, you That's can't. That's enough, Doc. Acton. California. Out in California. Farrell, me, and the boys. We held up a stage in Farrell. We took the money and lit out with that woman. We have... We've been followers. Look out for her. She's mean with a gun. Martha Lou... Yeah, he's gone, Matt. Yeah. I guess you had to do it that way, Matt. But... But what? <laughs> Nothing. All set, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. You going after him, Matt? Why not? They've done murder, haven't they? You have to figure the odds of a man forgiving you for what you do when a thing has to be done. And then you split the difference, and depending on the reasons for doing it, you feel better or worse. I had to do what I did because I had to find out about them. But it didn't help. Even if he was a gunman, I'd given no peace to a dying man. And for that he had to die harder. A man a long way from home. Chester and I rode out into the east, the way we figured Pharaoh and his wife would be headed. Sun's coming up, Mr. Dillon. I got eyes. Yes, sir. Now, there's a homestead up around the bend. We'll stop and find out if they've seen anything. Marshal, I was fixing to fetch some water when I heard him. They stopped, huh? Yeah. The woman looked tuckered out. Never see a woman with all them skirts ride, ride the way she did. It was some picture. How long did they stay? Five minutes, maybe. Wife had some coffee, and they drank it, scalded, and then took off. Headed east? Mm, yeah. They wanted to know how far to Kinsley or... Maybe they wanted to know the next station, and I told them, Kinsley, I don't know. Santa Fe is due in there for Hutchinson about eight. They do something wrong, Marshal? Just four murders back in Dodge. Come on, Chester. The Pharaohs had enough start on us that if they got the train in Kinsley before we caught up, we'd have to use the telegraph and hope they could be stopped further down the line. With killers like that, there'd be a lot of shooting. And I figured it was my job to be there when it happened. We rode hard. It lacked a couple of minutes before eight when we saw the smoke of the engine. We still had a couple of miles to go to reach the station. And she was moving out when we got there. I swung aboard and held out a hand for Chester. My. Running like that, give me a stitch in the side. And the puffs. Uh, take it easy, Chester. I sure wish we'd have had time to find out if they's on this train, Mr. Dillon. If they ain't, we've lost them good. Well, we'll see. Now, look, there's a lot of people in those cars up ahead. The Ferris see us, and they're going to start shooting. And I don't want that. So go slow. If we see them first, get out of sight. We'll wait until they get off the train. Yes, sir. Okay. No, Chester, put away the gun. No shooting on the train. Yes, Mr. Dillon. 
We started from the last car and moved up. That way they wouldn't see us first. I hoped we could get them without any gunplay at all. Mostly for folks who would get hurt. But I didn't have any stomach for shooting a woman, even if she was a killer. We got to the third car when Chester spotted them. There they are, Mr. Dillon. All right, get back. Okay, we'll just stay here. Conductor's coming this way. Good. Well, howdy, Marshal. Mr. Heinsohn. You on a pleasure ride or business? Business, Mr. Heinsohn. That couple, they're in the fourth, fifth seat from the front. The tall gent? Yeah, and the woman. Yeah, I wondered about them when they got on. Sure are a funny pair. She looks plumb wore out. They both done murder. Oh, Marshal, there's kids in the car. I want to get them without any shooting. As long as they don't see us, it'll be all right. Now, where's your next stop? About 30 miles down the line. No. Well, we'll try to figure something out. I hope you can, Marshal. The train rolled on. I saw Miss Farah take a kid on her lap, play with it. And the mother in the next seat looked on with fond eyes. I wonder what she would have said if she knew. Jack Farrow just looked out the window. We didn't make a move at the next stop. Two men got off, and there were still some 20 people left in the car besides the killers. About 15 miles beyond, the train pulled up again. I could see a big herd of cattle crossing the tracks. It was going to take a few minutes. Mr. Heinsohn came down the aisle to the platform where we were standing. Hey, Marshal, I got an idea. See what you think. Yeah? We'll be about 10 minutes waiting until that herd gets across. How about if I tell the folks in the car they can get out stretched legs for a bit? Might give you a chance. All right, go ahead. Hey, stay there, folks. And there's a little delay for a cattle crossing. If you want to get off for a spell, stretch out a bit. Plenty of time. We watched. And slowly, one at a time, they made up their minds. The women glad to let the kids work off steam. The men to size up strange land or somebody else's herd. And they straggled out. And there was one old couple that wouldn't move, though. And I saw Mr. Heinsohn making an eye and a shrug at me. And then they changed their minds and hobbled off. And that left the car empty except for the pharaohs, Chester, Mr. Heinsohn, and me. That's your deal, Marshal. Lucky they didn't decide to get off. I didn't think they would. All right, go ahead, Mr. Heinsohn, and get those people down the line a bit, huh? Yes, sir. All right, Chester. This ain't nothing like California, Jackie. I never seen anything so flat. How far you think it goes like this? I don't know. You know, I think it's going to take me in back. Yeah. You want to take my gun for a while? Dig him in the rib. Hold on to it. Oh, honey. I said hold on to it. All right, get your hands up, both of you high, and don't turn around. But she must have had her gun already in her hand, wanting to give it to Farrah to hold. She was fast. One minute she was upright in the seat, and then she was gone. Fire into us from behind the seat. Jackie! Jackie! All right, throw out your gun, Miss Farrah. Jackie! Throw out your gun and stand up. I don't want to hurt you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you! Look out, Mr. Dillon. She's going for his gun. Yeah. No, no, I Chester, give me a hand, will you? Now stop it. Stop it. like a crazy woman. It took both of us to hold her, and we couldn't even do that right until we had her handcuffed to the seat. And then she shut up. We just sat there looking at her husband's body. When we got off at the next stop to wait for the next train back to Dodge, 
Jack Farrow was taken away in a wagon to be buried. His wife stood by the tracks watching it as it moved off. And it wasn't until the wagon became a dust cloud out on the plain that she started to cry. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett and Tom Tully, with John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jack Crucian. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Scholastic standards are rigid at Madison High. You must have a sense of humor to attend. Listen in to Eve Arden as English teaching our Miss Brooks any Sunday evening and you'll get the point. When Eve takes over the class, everybody's favorite subject is comedy. So don't forget your Sunday Eve is our Miss Brooks over most of these same CBS radio stations. Be sure to enjoy her tomorrow night. George Walsh speaking. America's 45 million radio families listen most to the CBS radio network. And now for the adventures of Lightning Jim. It was midwinter, and the icy winds from the north were sweeping across the plains as two riders pressed on through the drifting snow. Whoa. What are you stopping for, Ned? Listen, Scar. Are you sure this is you sure this is the right trail? Yeah. There's the trapper's trading post up ahead. We'll stop in there long enough to warm up a mic. Bless that wind. Say, do you, you think them raw badges are still following us? Don't reckon they is. Not with this storm blowing up. Hey, come on. We've got to move before we freeze up. Get up there. That wind is plenty cold. Yeah, buddy. Look. There's fresh tracks in the snow. Yo, yo, I see them. See, but if that starts to snow again, it'll cover up this tree. Yeah, no. Say, buddy. 
The Indians told us there's a trading post up this way. Uh, you think uh, maybe we catch up with them uh, at the trading post? Maybe. Come on. We failed them Jaspers this far. Can't afford to lose them now. Yeah, that's so. Well, I hope to get a nice warm stove at the post. Come on, Thunder, old boy. <laughs> Yes, Lightning Jim and Whitey were on the trail of two outlaws on the frozen trails of the Western Plains. Fearlessly and relentlessly, the marshal and his deputy tracked down and brought to justice the desperados and criminals of the old frontier. The adventures of Lightning Jim bring back to us the courage and daring of the men who brought law and order to the West. On the sloping bank of Moccasin Creek stood an old trapper's cabin. Annie. What? I'm going in the trading post. Well, you better get some more tea. We're nearly plumb out. Yeah, yeah. Hey, got some nice pelts this time, Penny. Ought to get a good price for them. Uh, you won't get good money for them as long as you have to do business with that old skin flint Pop Drew. Well, Pop runs the trading post. And I got to do business with him. Ain't nobody else buying pelts around here. Of course they ain't. Nobody else would live in this godforsaken country. All it's fit for is redskins and bandits and outlaws. Now, now, hold on, Fanny. There ain't no use talking like that. We've been over this a hundred times or more. Well, I'll keep saying it a thousand times. Nobody to talk to. Nobody to see. All of being afraid the law might find us. It's a living death. I hate it. Oh, you got to take me Fanny. out of here. I can't Fanny, stand Fanny, it. please, please, please don't take on so. I know how hard it's been for you. And I'm aiming to get you out of here. Oh, Steve, you don't mean that. You know we can't go nowhere. Yes, we can, Fanny. Where? Where can we go without running into the law? Fanny, I've made up my mind that as soon as the snow clears, it's it's back to Fort Anderson. Fort Anderson? Yep. Steve, you gone crazy? No, Fanny, I've, I've just come to my senses. Fort Anderson is your home, and that's where you belong. But, Steve... If you go back to Fort Anderson, they'll hang you sure. No, no. No, they won't. Because I ain't going with you. You ain't? Steve Slocum, what are you talking Annie, about? You know I didn't kill Mort Maxson. Of course you didn't. But everybody knew you had it in for Mort. And when he was shot down, was you the blame? Sure, sure, I know. I had to clear out, but I had no right to bring you with me. Is that so? You're my husband, ain't you? Yes, yeah, sure, Well, sure, you don't Fanny. think I'd stand by and see him hang you for something you didn't do? Yes, but that ain't the point. Oh, yes, it is. We run away from Fort Anderson and come up here, and I ain't going back to Fort Anderson without you. Fanny, you just got through saying you hated it and couldn't stand it no more. Ah, never mind what I said. That infernal wind outside the gun on my nerves, that's all. Ah, get along to the post with your pill. And you you better think it over, Fanny. I've done all the thinking right now. I'm sticking with you to the end. Fanny, you're all right. Oh, no, no, never mind. Maybe we can go someplace else. Out west, uh, to California. Hey, why didn't we think of that before? Yeah, maybe we can do that. You know, Fanny, I got my trap set to catch animals. Somehow I got the feeling that someday I'll be trapping the skunk that killed Mort and got us into all this trouble. Well, I'll be getting on down to the trading post. I got some pelts for you. Got some pelts for me? Oh, sure, sure. Well, come on, come on over here by the stove and throw out. Yeah, yeah. And she's blowing up hard, Pop, so I'll, I'll have to be getting back soon. Yes. Well, any strangers come through here lately, Pop? No, nope, ain't been nobody around. Oh, gosh, kind of lonesome, too. Ain't been nobody through here for a week. Yes, yes, it was, oh, last Monday when the troopers came by. What? Troopers? Yes, they, uh, they was going up to Fort Edward. Oh, oh. And uh, nobody else, eh? No, no, man. Uh, expecting somebody? No, no. Well, of course, it ain't none of my Say, business. Say, who tacked but... up that reward sign? Well, well, one of the boys left it here about a month ago. Who's it for? 
Two bandits? Mm, and both of them killers. Oh. Yeah, the, 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 the one on the right there. Take a look at them. Yeah. Boy, he is sure a tough-looking customer. Uh, the one named Scar. Yeah. This other one ain't got, ain't no angel for looks. <laughs> Here's the Oklahoma kid. Uh, he's the Oklahoma kid. I'm Buffalo Bill. You mean he ain't the Oklahoma kid? Yeah. Well, uh, leastwise, I, I don't think so, Pop. Steve, you know the Oklahoma kid? No. No. Say, uh, here's a list of grub I want popping. Well. And take a look at them pelts, will you? Oh, sure, sure. I'll... I'll... Well, looks like we got business. Yeah. Howdy, Spears. Uh, howdy. You the boss of this outfit? Yes, yeah, sir, sure am. Uh, Bob Drew's my name. Yeah. Hey, you uh, mind if we use your stove to warm up a bit? Sure, sure. Make yourself at home, boys. Come on, Steve. Let's go outside. I'll, uh, I'll look at them skins you got. Come on. All right. Come on, Nat. Get up close to the stove. Did you see that Jasper that just went out? Yeah, what about him? That's Steve Slocum. Used to live down at Fort Anderson. Hey, 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 Nance. Look at this reward sign. What sign? Right here on the wall. Read it. $1,000 reward for information leading to the capture of the Oklahoma kid and Scar. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, who do you suppose that could be? <laughs> <laughs> so they got a reward sign for us even up here, huh? Well, <laughs> looks like the law badges have been here. Yeah, well, here's one sign that ain't going to stay up. Here, fort and fire. Yeah. Ain't no use taking no chances. Well... Even with them pictures, nobody'd know us with these beards we growed. Yeah. Come inside, Steve. Yeah, here they are. Come back. Yeah. Gosh almighty, that wind's kind of chill out there. Yeah. You getting thawed out, boys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be with you as soon as take care of Steve. Uh, Steve, <coughs> over here. Got my money over here in this little box now. I'll get right out for you now. Let's see here. 20, 30, 40, and... Two. Forty-two, that right, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. It's a good deal, I think. Well, <clears throat> give my best to your wife, Steve. Yeah, I... <clears throat> Funny fella, Steve. He never has much to say. Hey, where does he live? Down on Moxon Creek. He lives in a trapper's cabin with his wife. Uh-huh. Where'd he come from? I don't know. I... That's one thing you never ask a man in this country, partner. Yeah. How long has he been up here? Oh, about a year, I guess. Yes, here this month. He, uh, he's, uh, a little peculiar, but, man, he's gotten on his face. You can always tell a man by his face, I said. Yeah? Sure. Now, <clears throat> you take the pictures of them two bandits there on the wall. I... Say, what the... Hey, what's the trouble, trouble mister? Huh? Well, uh, well, 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 there was a reward sign on the wall. Reward sign? Sure, sure. Who for? Well, two outlaws. The, the Oklahoma kid and, and, and a fella called... A fella called a scar. What are you looking at? Uh, nothing, nothing. Pardon that. Nothing at all. Oh, that's funny. I didn't see no sign. No, I didn't see any sign either. Yeah, maybe I put it here on the shelf. Hey, hey, drop that gun, mister. I got hey, your cover. Now, now, drop it. Now, don't shoot me. Uh, get his gun, partner. Uh, give it uh, uh, you turn around and get oh. your hands in the air, mister. All right, but just get the money in that cash box, partner. Uh, get away from that box there. Now, oh, now we'll take care of this hombre. Oh, Grab yeah. that rope over there by the window and we'll tie him up. Yeah. Yeah, oh. Now, wait a minute. You don't need to tie me. I won't try to pull you. Yeah, well, we're aiming to see that you don't. Oh, hey, no, two riders coming down the mountain trail. Uh, what? Uh, to see them through the window. Well, all right. Get moving. We're clearing out. <laughs> inside the trading post. Oh, that's a good idea, like. I could stand some heat, I tell you that. Yeah, look, there's nobody here. Oh, you're right. Put up your hands. Hey, look out, Jim. Don't you move now, I'll drill you. All right, mister. Put him up, Whitey. Oh, sure. No. No, I thought you was the other two hombres. You mean the two riders we saw heading down the river trail? Yes, Durham. Who are you, Jasper? I'm Jim Whipple, United States Marshal. Lightning, Jim? That's right, mister. This is my deputy, Whitey Lawson. Oh, dear, but they can't shake your hands with my hands up in the air, you know. 
Yeah, take him down, boys. Oh, all right. You know, <clears throat> my name's Pop Drew, and I yeah, just had a run-in with two outlaws. They robbed me and tied me up. And I just got loose as you come up. Any idea who they are? I'm darn certain who they are. It's Oklahoma kid and a fellow called the Scar. I see it, MC. You guess we are looking for it. Yeah. How do you know there was the Oklahoma kid and the Scar? I had a reward sign with the pictures. They got heavy beards now, but I'm sure it was them. One was tall and he kind of walked with a limp. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And the other had a scar uh, on his right cheek, right near his eye, right about there. Yo, see, that's him, boy. Come on, We got no time to lose. Hey, Scar. All right? My, my horse has gone lame. He can't make it in the snow. Holy smoke. You'll have to ride on my horse. Put up your hands, both of you. Huh? Who's that? He come out from back of the boulder. Get down off of them horses. I got you covered. Uh, sure, mister. Say that. Said hombre was here at the trading post. Yeah. If you get a chance, shoot. Oh. Well, what do you want, mister? Oh, you got him. Yeah, that flesh to wind blended him. Get his gun. Yeah. And there's his two horses over yonder. Good. Good. We can use them. Come on. Let's get. Oh, oh, Thunder. Hey, what is Wind blowing drifts over the trail. See that thing? Look up there by those trees. Yeah. Looks like a man lying on the snow. Come on. Yeah, we'll let him. Yeah, we'll take it easy now. Take it easy. Get it, boy. Get it now. Woo, thunder, woo. Woo, boy. Woo, boy. Come here, Whitey. I can hardly stand up in this wind. Look here, buddy. You believe me. That is the man. See, I wonder if he's dead. No. He will be. You don't get him out of this wind and cold. Oh, see. I wonder who he is. Oh, no. Wait. See. I can't believe it. What's the matter, Lightning? This, this Jasper's Steve Slocum. Slocum? Yeah. You believe me. That's the fellow they want to post Anderson for the murder of Mort Maxson. Yeah. Will Lightning Jim and Whitey take Steve back to Fort Anderson? And what about the two outlaws Jim and Whitey were trailing? The surprising climax of this thrilling story will come in part two, which follows immediately. And now for part two of the thrilling story of Lightning Jim and the Trapper's Trap. Lightning Jim Whipple, United States Marshal, and his deputy Whitey Lawson were trailing two outlaws, the Oklahoma Kid and his partner known as the Scar. Their trail took them into the wild Indian country to the north. On the snow-covered trail, they find the body of Steve Slocum, a trapper who had lived in Fort Anderson. Steve had been accused of murdering a man and fled north to escape the law. After finding Steve's body... Lightning Jim and Whitey locate a cave and take shelter out of the cold and wind. Well, there you are, Whitey. I got his shoulder all bandaged up. You're Lightning, as a doctor, you make a swell morsel. Never mind trying to be funny. 
Hook up that fire, will you? All right. See, that was lucky we found this cave and this dry wood, though. Yeah. Oh, good. It's coming, too. Yo, look, he's opening up his eyes. Oh. Hello, Steve. Who? Who are you? Look at me, Steve. Can you see me? Yes, I... I can... I can Jim. Yeah, that's right. I didn't kill Mort. You gotta believe me, Lightning. Take it easy, Steve. We got lots of time to talk. Yeah, but you... You can't take me back to Fort Anderson. They'll, they'll hang me. They think I done it. Never mind what they think. Please. Please, Lightning. I... I can't go back. Let me die. Tell... Tell Fanny she can go home now. You ain't gonna die, Steve. That bullet went through your shoulder and it's all fixed up. Yo, and yes, as soon as you feel a little better, old man, eh, we can take you home. Who's who's that? That's Whitey Larson, the deputy. You remember him? Yeah, sure. Tell me, who shot you, Steve? There. There was two of them. Yeah? I saw them come in the trading post. <laughs> Come on, Scott. I can't, Ned. I can't. I can't go on. I want to lay down. Listen. I can't. You can't do that, Scott. You, you've got to keep walking or, or you'll freeze to death. I want to... want to ride my horse. God, listen to me. Listen to me. God, can you hear me? Listen, you can't ride. You, you'll freeze if you don't keep walking. No. No, I, I can't. I can't walk. No more. No, wait. I can't. Wait. I wait, can't. Tomorrow. Wait. I, can't. I see a light. Look. At the cabin. By the creek. No, uh, I want to... Ma'am, me and, me and my partner got lost in, in the storm. Well, come inside, quick. Yeah, bring him in here and put him on the bed. Yeah, yeah. I was expecting Steve. Steve? Yeah, he's my husband. Put your friend down on the bed. Yeah. Uh, uh. Careful. There, there, that's fine. I'll heat up some water and fix some tea. Well, now, uh, he'll be all right, as soon as he gets thawed out, ma'am. Steve ought to be here pretty soon. Well, Steve, your story about more killing sounds reasonable. It's gospel truth, lightning. I, I swear to it on a stack of Bibles. Steve, you know me well enough to know that I'll do everything I can to help you. Sure, I I know you will, Lightner. But if we can't find the evidence up here, well, I got to take you back to Fort Anderson to stand trial. And it'll be a fair trial, I guarantee you that. All right, Lightner. Good. Now, if you're strong enough, I reckon we better head for your cabin, Steve. Sure. It ain't far from here. Hey, Lightning. Yeah, what is The storm is letting open the wind is dying down a little All bit. All right. Let's get going. Well, how are you feeling now, Scar? Well, all right, I guess. Uh, this fire sure feels good. Yeah. Say that. Where's the old lady? She went out back. Hey, listen. Huh? She's been waiting for her old man to come home. Yeah? Where'd he go? To the trading post. But I got a hunch she ain't coming back. What do you mean? Uh, she said his name was Steve. Well? Now that was the name of the Jasper you drilled on the trail. Same fellow we saw on the trading post. You sure? Yeah. 
Uh, here she comes now. Yeah, seems like the wind's dying down, ma'am. Yeah, it is. Would you like something uh, to eat now? Well, now we don't want to put you to no bother, ma'am. Well, I can eat. <laughs> I ain't bashful, ma'am. Put up your hands, huh? both of you. I got a loaded gun and I know how to use well, it. Well, now, hold on, ma'am. What's yeah. the idea? Yeah. Keep your hands in the air or I'll let you have it. Turn around and face the wall. Come on. You may not think much of women handling shooting irons, but I reckon I know a few of the tricks. I'll take your gun. Uh, Keep your hands up and turn around. Well, now, be reasonable, ma'am. Reasonable? Maybe you can explain how you come to have Steve's horses. Steve's horses? You heard me. Them horses outside are Steve's. Where did you get them? Hey, hey, somebody's coming. Grab her, Scar. Let go, man. Oh, you're no, breaking no, it. No, don't move her. I'll kill you. I'll see who's coming. Well, who is it? Three riders. Well, get over by the wall so you'll be behind the door when it opens. And pick up the gun. Sure. I got him. All right. Now let him come. Put up your hands, all of you, and be quick about it. Don't be in, Minnie. He ain't dead, Nat. Shut up. Well, looks like we got our party all together. Yeah, Nat, you've got the drop on us now. But the law will get you sooner or later. Uh, You're good at making speeches, Lightning Jim. But when I get through with you, well, you'll be wishing you was back in Fort Anderson. Get the gun, Scar. Sure. Give me that. All right. Come on. All right. right. And who'd have thought I'd have run into you, Steve (laughs) Slocum? And the marshal. You almost caught yourself a murder if you hadn't got caught yourself. Marshal, the man killed a fellow named Mort Max. That's a lie. He was the one that's killed Morton, you know it. Yeah, you'd have a hard time proving that, Steve. The law said you've done it. That's why you come up here. You killed Mort Max. <laughs> the marshal says the law is going to catch up with me sooner or later. Well, maybe so. But I got a way of fixing law badgers. What are you aiming to do with them, Nat? Kill them all. The marshal and his deputy come up here to get Steve. They had a gunfight. And nobody lived to tell what really happened. <laughs> oh, how's that for a story, Lightning? <laughs> that won't help you none, Nat. You're wanted for robbery, rustling, horse thieving, and murder. Killing us won't stop the law from staying on your trail. Maybe not. But I'll have the satisfaction of drilling the famous Lightning Jim. And since I ain't got nothing to lose, I might just as well have some fun. Where's your cash, Steve? My cash? Yeah. I kind of figure you got some cash hidden around here. Now, where is it? Come on, speak up or I'll start billing and I'll take your wife first. No, no, wait, wait. If if I tell you where the cash is, will you promise not to kill her? I ain't promising nothing. I'll think it over. It's in a box under that trap door in the floor. All right, keep them covered, Scar. I'll get it. Sure. Keep your hands up, Lightning Jim. I don't see no box, Steve. Reach down under the floor. Well, I don't feel nothing. Oh, oh, my arm. What's the matter, Nat? What's your arm? Oh, reach up. for the sky. Are you? Don't move, Scar. Good work, and uh, I think that was the quickest gun grab you I ever seen. Oh, let me get out of here. Oh, my arm. You won't get out of there, Nat. Now I've got you right where I want you. Gee, what's holding here? Take a look. When Nat went after the cash box, he stuck his arm in a bear trap. A bear trap? You've been in a minute. Don't get me out of this trap. It's killing me. No, not until you confess that you was the one who killed Mort Max. No. No, blast you. Mort Maxon hired you to steal government horses. You had a fight with Mort and killed him. Then you told me Mort wanted to see me, and when I went over to his house, he was dead. Folks know that I didn't like Mort, and I was blamed for it. Yes, Nat, you killed him. Oh. Now, are you confessing that, oh. or do you want to die in that bear trap? Oh, yes, yes, I killed him. <laughs> Lightning, when Nat and the Scar came in the trading post, I recognized them, even with their beards. And when they drilled me on the trail and took my horses, well, seems like they kind of got lost in the storm and the horses led them to my cabin. Yeah, the horses were going home. And thanks to you, Lightning and Whitey, me and Steve are going back home, too. Back to Fort Anderson again. <laughs> Funny how these things work out, Steve. Whitey and me was trailing Nat and the Scar. Running into you was kind of accidental. Accidental? Yeah. I'd say it was providential. 
When I set that trap to guard my cash box, I didn't figure a bear trap would help me catch two bandits and set me straight with the law. Yo, I say, that's the first time I ever heard of catching three poor cats in a bear trap. <laughs> the rugged Indian territory rides a tall young man on a mission of mercy. His medical bag strapped on one hip, his six-shooter on the other. This is Dr. Six-Gun. Another episode in the exciting adventure series... Dr. Six Gun. Ray Matson, M.D., was the gun-toting frontier doctor who roamed the length and breadth of the old Indian territory. Friend and physician to white man and Indian alike, the symbol of justice and mercy in the lawless west of the 1870s, this legendary figure was known to all as Dr. Six Gun. <laughs> A purveyor of fine treasures, a bearer of gifts. Well, if you must, a peddler. My place of business, a thousand mile trail in the Indian territory. Ah, good night, good night. <laughs> ah, this is my business associate, Mr. Midnight, a talking raven. And although he never says much of consequence, he is a good companion. We have a friend, Midnight and I. Perhaps you've heard of him. Dr. Sixgun. We three have had many adventures together. Like the one which began one hot afternoon, I was on the road to Fort Apache with a carload of trinkets to sell to the cavalry. And I rode out on the retreat of Loredo. What's the matter? <laughs> you, uh, you object to my singing all my time? <laughs> or do you see something? Eh? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Just hold something. Don't move, peddler. Right. I am like a statue. Drop your gun. Pablo has no gun. No gun, no gun. Get down off the wagon. Good. Walk over here. Behind this rock. Really well. Stop. Help me up. Help me up, I said, or I'll kill you. You are bleeding badly. I know that. Help me up. Really well. Oh. Now, get me to your wagon. Very well. You have been beaten badly, my friend. I don't need your sympathy. Now, help me up on the wagon. If you will permit me to, to take you to a doctor. Just do as I say. <laughs> I think you had better do as I say, friend. You are in no condition to fight. I can pull a trigger. I can pull... Come, Midnight. I think we had better take this stranger to Dr. Sixgun before he dies. Uh, take it easy. Oh. Oh. Hand me those spirits, Pablo. Here. <laughs> what? <coughs> Who are you? This is my friend, Dr. Sixgum. And you are safe. Oh. Who beat you this way, stranger? Nobody. These marks on your back weren't self-inflicted. I fell. 
Mm-hmm. What's your name? Smith. Yeah. Your rank? What do you mean, rank? You're a cavalry trooper. Says who? Says the callus on your saber hand. Also your boots. And the fact those clothes are obviously not yours. Well, I suppose it was crazy to think I'd get away. I suppose you tell me the truth. What happened? My name is Dale Franklin, Sergeant U.S. Cavalry. Where station? Fort Apache. Who beat you? Brock. Brock? Sergeant Hamilton Brock. Colonel Crown's private executioner. Sergeant of the disciplinary platoon. Disciplinary platoon? Yeah. You were in the guardhouse? <laughs> they call it the slaughterhouse at Fort Apache these days. Are you trying to tell me that the commanding officer permits prisoners to be beaten like this? Not just beaten, Doctor. Staked in the sun for ten hours, kept in a hole like a dog made to eat out of a dish on the ground. Oh, take it easy, soldier. You're all right now. Yeah. I've met Colonel Crown many times. He impressed me as a stern but fair commander. You haven't met him lately. Why didn't you see the military surgeon, Dr. McKenzie? Dr. McKenzie has been dead for over a month. I didn't know. How did he die? He was murdered. By whom? I don't know. They must suspect someone. They do. Who? Me. I see. Did you kill him? No. Then why did you escape? I told you Brock was beating me. Yeah. Well, I'll have to return you. I, I can't keep a deserter. No, I suppose not. Are you afraid of facing trial? No. Well, then... I'm afraid I won't live to face trial. I find it hard to believe that Colonel Crown would permit such treatment of prisoners. In case you don't know it, Doctor, Colonel Crown is a madman. Do you think you're qualified to judge? I think so. Well, we'll have to turn you in, Sergeant Franklin. You uh, don't seem frightened. I'm tired of running, Doctor. You know what they'll do to you for attempting to desert? Yes, sir. Well? Brock will kill me. Well, come in, doctor. Come in. Hi, it's good to see you after all these months. You're looking well, Colonel Crown. Strange you should come to see me. I was going to send a messenger to you. Oh? Yes, I'm without a contract, surgeon. I, I thought you might help out until I got a replacement from Fort Dodge. Yes, I know. I, uh, I heard that Mackenzie was murdered. Yes, one of the stockade prisoners turned on him. Stabbed him with his own scalpel. The man escaped before we could try him. What was his name? The killer? Hmm. Franklin. Dale Franklin. I see. You interested in finding him? Well, that's a naive question, Doctor. He's outside my friend Pablo's wagon. Are you serious? Sergeant Brock. Yes, Colonel. Franklin is outside in the peddler's wagon. Bring him in. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Sir? Franklin was badly beaten. I know his condition. I think he deserves a fair trial. You don't think I beat him, do you? He says you did. Is that true, Sergeant Brock? Maybe the prisoner knows, sir. Very well. Bring him in here. Yes, sir. Oh, this Franklin is a bad fellow. Somebody beat him, Colonel. He needs hospital care. Well, naturally, he'll be treated humanely until his trial. If you accept the job as contract surgeon, you can check on him yourself. I think I can take it on for a few days at any rate. Yes, I'm conducting a raid on the Apaches tomorrow. We'll try him after that. Raid? Yes, my scouts tell me they're getting ready to make trouble again. I thought they were peaceful now. Oh, I know better, Doctor. Colonel, I visited the Mescalero village only a couple of days ago. There was no sign of war dancing. There are hundreds of them threatening this fort at this very moment. Easy, brother. Help a man. Here we go. Well, Franklin, I see you've decided to rejoin us. Yes, sir. Still no guilty conscience about Dr. McKenzie? I didn't kill Dr. McKenzie, and you know it. Don't address me in that tone, soldier. Brock, take him to sick bay. Yes, sir. Oh, and Brock. Sir? See that he's treated well. Yes, sir. 
Now, you'll find quarters for yourself and your companion in officer's row, Doctor. I have to supervise training on the parade ground, but I'll see you at dinner. They've been training six hours, sir, in this hot sun. Nonsense. Call them to attention. Yes, sir. You men, you call yourselves cavalry soldiers? Don't you know that your lives will depend on how smartly you execute these commands? Apaches are the best mounted soldiers in the world. You... Sir? Wipe that smirk off your face. I, I wasn't smirking, sir. Don't answer back. Sergeant, have this man's pack filled with stones. I want him to circle this parade ground until sunup. If he stops walking, send him to the hole. Sir, I, I, I didn't smirk with all respect. <laughs> Maybe the taste of the whip will teach you to shut your mouth. I will not have this insubordination. I know what you think. I know what you whisper behind my back. Well, by Godfrey, I'm going to make soldiers of you all kill you. Sergeant, no water for these men until dawn. Not a drop. Sir, we're going on a raid tomorrow. Don't question my command. Dismiss. Yes, sir. Hey! Hey! Uh, 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 what is it, Peddler? You've come out here to spy on me for your doctor friend. No, you? Colonel, I have not come to spy. Only to request permission to keep my wagon in your state. You're lying. Colonel. Very I... well, keep it where you please. And stay in your quarters. I won't have strangers skulking about my camp. How it happened. Just like I said. Well, that sure doesn't sound like the behavior of a rational man, Pablo. You are the physician, not Pablo. However, my opinion... Pablo, old friend, one thing a doctor learns is never to make a diagnosis on too little evidence. Sometimes you can put the patient in his grave long before he's dead. Well, I suppose it is not easy to command a large group of men like this without strict discipline. But still, oh, okay, I... Pablo. Oh. Come in. Doctor? Yes? You're wanted over at the prison stockade, sir. Trouble? There's been an accident. Anyone hurt bad? Sergeant Franklin, sir. Franklin? What happened? He's dead. There's the body, Doctor. How did this happen, Sergeant Brock? He tried to escape again. I was forced to shoot him. These bruises weren't there when I examined him this morning. No, sir. He must have fallen after I shot him. I see. Too bad. Yeah, too bad. I'll have to make a report on his death. You can use Dr. McKenzie's old office. Just down the corridor. Thanks, Brock. Not at all. Any time at all. (laughs) 
Yes? Colonel Crown. Uh, what is it, Doctor? I've just prepared my report on the death of Sergeant Franklin. Well? I think Sergeant Brock should be placed under arrest for his murder. Now, just a moment. Franklin was shot trying to escape again. He was beaten first. Can you prove that? He has bruises on his body that were made after he returned here. Yes, but he fell when he was shot. Dead men don't bruise, Colonel. That's a medical fact. I see. May I have that report? You may. Thank you. Would you mind telling me why you're tearing that up? Not at all. You'll write a new one. Accidental death. Will I? Doctor... Sergeant Brock is the best man I have. I need him to discipline the men. If he gets so overzealous, well... Are you insane, Colonel? He's murdered a man. A prisoner, a misfit who couldn't soldier. A man, sir. A man. Doctor, I have only soldiers in my command. I cannot permit any other sentiment. Listen to me, sir. This army post is surrounded by thousands of Apaches. Armed to the teeth. They're out there in the hills. Watching us. Their knives are sharp. We've got to train and be tough in order to defend ourselves. And that's what I'm doing, Doctor. I've made these men into machines. Machines that can stand up to those evil men. I'm going to destroy every Apache in the territory. Colonel, there are no unfriendly Indians within a thousand miles of this fort. Ah, uh, sir. That's where you're wrong. They're out there lurking. I know. I I can feel their eyes on me when I ride past those gates. I, I can sense them all around me. I see. Yes, that, that's why I need men like Brock, Doctor. I, I can't have weaklings around me. I've got to weave them out. You, you, you see what I'm driving at, don't you? Yes, I think I do. Good. Then you'll go to Dr. McKenzie's office and rewrite that report. Yes, Colonel. I'll rewrite the report. You wanted to see me, Fred? Yes, Pablo. Listen, you're leaving this afternoon? Yes, I go back to Frenchman's Fort. I want you to head north to Fort Dodge instead. Fort Dodge? With a message for the commanding officer. About Colonel Crowley? Yes. Here, I've written it out. I'll make it as fast as you can. Very well, I go now. Just a moment, peddler. Sergeant Brock, take that paper. There it is, Colonel. That paper is none of your business, Colonel. On the contrary, everything that happens at Fort Apache is... Uh, my business. Well, well, I see you have rewritten the report considerably. Hmm. Would you mind telling me what this medical mumbo-jumbo means? All right, sir. I'm writing to the commander at Fort Dodge to tell him that it is my considered medical opinion that you're a madman, Colonel Crown. You don't say. Furthermore, I've taken the liberty of examining Dr. McKenzie's records. There's a copy here of a half-written report. I found it stuffed behind the desk drawer. Give me that. Seems that Dr. Kenzie concurred. According to this report, he too believed you're insane. How very unfortunate that was. More unfortunate than he ever realized, Colonel. The stains on this unfinished report are blood. Evidently, someone surprised him at writing it and stabbed him with his own scalpel. Yes, an Apache named Blackhawk. Or a white man named Crown. I think you're the one who is insane, Doctor. That is for a medical board to decide after my report is filed. Unfortunately, your report will never reach Fort Dodge. You're both under arrest. Don't move. Sergeant Brock has you covered. I see. Just what do you intend to do? Place these two under arrest, Sergeant Brock. Yes, sir. Colonel, you can't hold on. I think I can. In a few minutes, I'm leading my troops into the hills to wipe out the Apaches. When I come back, I'll take care of you two gentlemen. All right, Brock. See that they're treated well. Yes, sir. All right, Doc. 
tractor inside. What about my friend? The peddler? He's coming with me. We're going to have a private entertainment. Inside. Brock, you'll have to account for this. Uh-huh. Come on, peddler. We'll have a talk. Hey. <laughs> Come on. Here's your friend, Doc. Pablo. I think he needs a little medical attention. Pablo, are you all right? Yes. He hit me many times. That's rotten war. Pablo is very wheezy. Just, just lie down. And, and Pablo, listen. Don't move, no matter what happens. Oh, it, it should not be hard, my friend. Sergeant! Sergeant! What? Pablo! He, he's dead! You're crazy. He's dead. Look for yourself. I'm coming in. Stay back or I'll shoot you. Pedler. Pedler, get up. Maybe, maybe I can bring him to. Try. All right, I, I'll need some water. Do without all I can do without water, Sergeant, is... Drop that gunner up. Break your back. Ah, ah. Your knee. Oh, yeah. Pick it up, Pablo. Hey, Herbie. Now, back against the wall. My back. It's broken. Not quite, though I was tempted. You're the lowest form of human scum, Brock. Pablo, lock him in. A pleasure. But first, what is it? A small debt. I come back later. Now what? We've got to work fast. You hitch up the best horses you can find to that wagon of yours. I'm going to the telegraph office to see if I can contact Fort Dodge. I'll meet you at the gate. Village, Colonel. Yes, double the flanks. Yes, sir. Right, Bob! Five! Five! Out! Oh! Now, have the men dismount and leave their horses from here on. Yes, sir. Maintain silence. We have to take them by surprise. Yes, sir. you men. In a moment, we'll be within earshot of our objective. Our absolute silence will be maintained. According to my intelligence, there are some 800 Apache warriors down there, armed to the teeth and waiting to move on Port Apache. Follow me and fight with honor. See the village from the top of the trail, Colonel. Hold them in. Oh. Let's have a look through these glasses. Hmm. See anything, Colonel? Hmm. <laughs> and they're as thick as flies. Hundreds of them, all in war paint. What's the plan, sir? Mount the column. When I give the word, move the column down the trail toward the village. When we reach the bend in the trail, we'll sound the charge. Isn't that trail too steep for a gallop, Colonel? We will charge at the gallop with bare sabers. Those are my orders, and I'll shoot the first man who reins his mount. But, sir... Sergeant, mount the column. Very well, sir. The tail him out! Move! Draw sabers. Draw! Now at the gallop. March. Sir, it's suicide. I will count to three, Sergeant. Either you give the command or I'll run this saber through your chest. 
Very well, Colonel. At the gallop! Colonel! Colonel, look! There's a wagon rolling down the cliff top. It's headed right for the trail. You can look out! What the hell? That looks like that peddler's wagon. Move it aside! Move it, I say! Hold it! Don't touch that wagon! Hold it! Nobody lay a hand on that wagon! It's the dock. I can get a clear shot from these rocks. Nobody touch that wagon. Doctor! I don't know how you got here, but I order you to put up that gun and step down here. As you say, Colonel. Sergeant, arrest this man. Just a moment, Sergeant. I have an order telegraphed from Fort Dodd. We're leaving you a command, Colonel. It's a fraud. Here it is, Sergeant. Sergeant, don't let this man trick you. He's a spy for the Apaches. He's trying to hold us up until they can attack. This order is countersigned and verified by Major Dobbs, Colonel. He's our post adjutant. Give me that order. Here, sir. This is what I think of your order, Doc. Now, Sergeant, order the charge. I can't do that, sir. You idiot, there's an army of savages down there. A thousand evil painted faces in the valley all around us. Sir, you've been relieved of command. Relieved, eh? Relieved. I'll show you how a soldier behaves. Bugle boy. Bugle boy. Sound the charge. That's the Lord God. Stand fast, then. Follow me. Charge. Colonel. Colonel, stop. He's headed for that cliff. Colonel. Good Lord. He rode clean off that cliff. We'd better head back for Fort Apache, Sergeant. Uh, what about that village full of Indians? If they've got war paint on, we'd better... Sergeant, take a look through these field glasses. Go ahead. Okay. Good Lord. The village is as peaceful as can be. Nothing but squaws washing blankets and few braves sitting around? Why, the colonel must have been crazy, sir. He was a sick man, Sergeant. His sickness was fear. And there's nothing so dangerous or so contagious. have been listening to Dr. Six-Gun. Dr. Six-Gun is played by Carl Weber. And Pablo by William Griffith. Today's script was written by George Lutz. Heard in the cast were Bill Gray as Dale Franklin, Arnold Robertson as Colonel Crown, Ralph Bell as Sergeant Brock, and William Keene as the sergeant. Presents has brought you 55 minutes of Western Adventure with Half Gun Will Travel and Dr. Six Gun. Join us again tomorrow night at the same time, 9.05, when FBN presents Half Comedy and Half Detective Drama. Fibber McGee and Molly and Broadway is My Beat. Tomorrow night, Fibber McGee and Molly are leaving for a vacation in Hollywood. On FBN Presents, this is Navy journalist Dan Jerkinson.
Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! In case you've forgotten or never did know, I'm Chad Remington, frontier lawyer from the cow town known as Dos Rios. And as I've said a time or two before, out on the brawling, sprawling frontier, a lawyer gets into all sorts of things, especially trouble. And trouble out our way not only starts with a capital T, but often ends with capital punishment. I guess it was last month and an old friend of my father's, Harvey Burnside, wrote and asked me if I had time to come down to where he lives, a town which he had built himself from practically nothing, a town named Burnside Falls. Harvey has a brother, Milo Burnside, who owns the little bank in Burnside, and between them, I guess Harvey and Milo pretty well control that section of the country. Well, while Cherokee O'Bannon, the former medicine man who now runs the Dos Rios livery stable and bangs around with me, was trying to find two horses from his stable that would take us to Burnside Falls and back, the situation which caused Harvey to write me suddenly started getting worse. So much worse that Harvey paid a call on his brother Milo at the bank. Milo, let's quit mincing words now. Let's get down to cases. All right, Harvey, let's. What's on your mind? And I've been hearing things about you, Milo. Things I don't like to hear about any man, let alone my brother. Oh, <laughs> man. You don't say. I heard you've been over to War Dance last week. And what if I have? War Dance is a mighty nice and bustling little town. Harvey, it's high time you were getting some sense through your head. When the railroad agreed to build its western terminal into whichever town the voters choose as the county seat of Buckshot County, nobody figured a dreamer like you would build a town out here, right in the middle of the prairie. Prairie, my eye. Burnside Falls lies between three trails and two rivers. The best dad blame place in the whole state for a county seat. That's what I thought once. Uh, you mean you changed your mind since old man McCall put some of his jerkwater railroad's money on deposit in your bank? Money. That's all you ever think of. Well, you'd be a lot better off if you did sometimes. Ah, Harvey, stop being blind. That new town of War Danes is a good 80 miles closer to where the rails now end. And it'd make an ideal county seat. Bar dance. What is it? Nothing but a hideout for a bunch of owl hoots like Cap Kilmore and his gang. Sure, McCall and the railroad is like that. Building into war dance would save them a couple of hundred thousand dollars because it's closer. But they got their franchise on the strength of connecting up to whatever town the people select. Oh, the people, my neck. Now look, Harvey. It's worth good cold cash to me. And I'll see you won't lose. If you help me convince the people that War Dance and not Burnside Falls should be voted the county seat next week. Yeah? They'll vote just how they please. And you, your bank, are that railroad's not going to interfere. Well, you pig-headed old fool. If you weren't my brother, I... I'd tell you to go for your gun. And if you keep trying to interfere, you may still have your chance, brother or no brother. And if you don't lay off, Milo... I may go for my gun first. Well, that was the situation when O'Bannon and I arrived in Burnside Falls. A wide open split between Harvey and Milo Burnside. But being brothers, Harvey was reluctant, more than reluctant, to make a public issue of what he believed and knew. 
And his wife, Sarah, hoped that somehow I might be able to talk sense into his money-grubbing brother's head. And that's about the whole story, Chad. The railroad can save upwards of $200,000 building in the war dance instead of here. And that's why the railroad can afford to offer my low money to try and throw the election to war dance. Well, I'm reluctant to say this, but your brother sounds to me like a nefarious little nickel nurser. Yes, that's the way it looks. And I'd bet Milo would sell the railroad out even now if anyone offered him five dollars more. How does he figure to swing the election? Figure to swing it? Why, he's swinging it right now. People are actually pulling up stakes here and moving to war dance already. Yeah, and enough of a move, I suppose they'll have a majority of the votes. <clears throat> well, folks, I don't know what good it's going to do, but come on. Let's ride into town and pay a call on Brother Milo. <laughs> Burnside Falls looks quite prosperous. We've already passed seven stores, two saloons, saloons. <laughs> oh, Ben, and I don't mind your admiring the saloons from the outside. But this trip, you're not pouring what they peddle down your insides. And where's this bank your uh, brother's located, Harvey? Uh, just down at the end of this block, Chad, that gray and white building. Good grief. Do you see what's happening? The bank's being held up. There go the dirty buzzards who held up the bank, getting their horses and hightailing it out of town. Come on, boys. Even with a head start they've got, we may still be able to overtake them. Get up there, you. Get ready. Excitement brought everybody in town out into the street. By the time we'd threaded our way through the crowd, the bank bandits were out of town and into the hills. The trail ended in the rocks. We all turned our horses and piled back into town, back to the bank itself, to find out what had actually happened. Boys, 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 now, if you'll only quiet down, maybe we can all hear what Milo has to say. Our neighbors, I hate to tell you this, and if you'd have caught the men who rifled the bank, the story would be different. But the way they clean me out, to keep up my legal cash reserves now, I... I'm forced to declare all loans due and payable immediately. Oh, hey, now, hey, men! Hey, men. Hey, now, men! Men, I'm sorry. And as sorry as I am, the law's the law. And to tell the truth, as soon as I've got things straightened out here, I'm closing up. And trying to make back what I've lost by moving my bank... Over to War Dance. You don't mean there's some connection between the bank robbery and your moving to War Dance, do you, Burnside? That's the kind of idea it would be healthier never to put into words again, Remington. Oh, so? Well, I've heard of men being railroaded to jail before, but this is the first time I've ever heard of a railroad being the cause of moving a whole bank and its president up to the federal penitentiary. Burnside, after all I've been through today, you don't have to have a little uh, drop in the house, do you? Well, if you're as weak as all that, Cherokee, we'll go to the drugstore and get you some smelling salts. Besides, right now, none of us has got anything to celebrate. Milo's little bank robbery was too successful. You mean to think that Milo arranged the robbery? Oh, I ain't denying that Milo's ornery, Chad. Well, I can't believe Harvey's brother would frame a robbery on his own bank. Well, maybe not, Sarah. But Harvey did say that this other town, Wardance, is the hideout of a lot of owl hoots. Mm, you blamed right. Fellas like Cap Kilmore moved in there. And the question is, how come and why did Kilmore move down here from his own stamping grounds, the Dakotas? Well, I don't know anything about that, Chad, but Kilmore showed up in these parts about, uh, well, let's see now. About, uh, about three months back. Three months ago, huh? And when did you first hear about this railroad thing and their anxiety to make war dance the county seat? Well, now, uh, let's see. Well, it seems to me that that was about, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was three months ago, too. Uh, do you think there's a connection between the railroad and Cap Kilmore, Chad? Well, I don't know for sure. But there certainly could be. 
The railroad starts working on Milo, deposits money in his bank, and Milo writes a letter and hires himself a handyman like Cap Kilmore. Yeah. Do you honestly think Milo would go out and hire a crook and drive folks over to war dance? Claimed if I know. It certainly makes a reasonable supposition. With the election only a few days off, all we can do before we're sure is sit back and wait. Wait for action. If you're still in Burnside this time tomorrow, you and your old family will stay in Burnside. From my home? Yeah? Well, then maybe some of those dead you know. They won't move, huh? Well, we'll move them like that, too. Dad, I know my husband brought you down here to help us. But we just can't go on this way. We can't go on just sitting around while these gun toters blow Burnside falls apart. Now, now, Sarah, it ain't Chad's fault, you know. Well, maybe it isn't. But it was Chad who said sit back and see what happened. And look what's happened. Folks shot down, places burned up, and almost half the people over here picking up and moving to war dance to save their lives. My dear Mrs. Burnside... Even though I used to sell a medicine which was a miracle, it's going to take more than a miracle to stop this lawlessness as quickly as you'd like. Yes, but you don't understand. Folks are moving away from here a dozen families a day. Just like sheep, that's what they are. And the blackest sheep of the lot is that no good brother of mine, Milo. It isn't all right even saying things like that, Harvey. Even though saying and proving in Milo's case are as far apart as Pikes Peak and Death Valley. Prove? How can you prove anything on a gang of cutthroats like that? Thousands upon thousands of dollars behind them just to buy votes and bullets. And that's just the frame of mind they want you and other folks around here to stay in, Sarah. They want you scared to death. They want you to give up before you're licked. Don't you see that's winning half the battle for them? Well... They're not only making this a war, they're making this a war of nerves. Well, they've got my nerves so frazzled that I'm even willing to take a drink of my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. <laughs> There's nothing else handy around the house, of course. Cherokee, the only thing around this house is trouble. If war dance is made the county seat, Harvey and Sarah Burnside will have lost everything they've worked years to build up. And the people of this section will be saddled with a reign of crime and corruption that'll make Custer's last stand look like a Sunday school picnic. Now, that's what I mean, Chad. You've got to do something. And we will do something, Sarah. If we can ever figure out something to do. Believe me, I haven't come down here to console you. I've come down to help. I'm not going to sit by and see this county referred to in the history books later on as another gun trouble valley. <laughs> Return to the second act of Gun Trouble Valley, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. to Frontier Town. Well, I might as well admit it. All that high-sounding talk I gave Sarah and Harvey Burnside was really just whistling in the dark. A little pet talk to keep up their confidence. It wasn't until later that afternoon while Cherokee and I were jogging back toward Burnside Falls that any idea hit me at all. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad, this whole situation is thoroughly sorted. It sure is, Cherokee. A man not only turning against his own brother, but all of his neighbors and friends. A normal man might suffer from a thirst, like me. Normal thirst. <laughs> of course you mean thirst, as in thirst for knowledge. <laughs> well, knowledge is what gives me my thirst. 
My brain is so full of knowledge it requires considerable lubrication. Well, I'm glad to learn that, Cherokee. Because next time your thirst overtakes you, I'll just stake you to three rounds of axle grease. Well, even axle grease is better than water. However, referring to Milo Burnside's thirst, his is an unnatural thirst. Thirst for gold. And just about as unquenchable as the... Ab- Cherokee, whether you know it or not, you've just given me an idea. Well, if it has anything to do with axle grease, I don't want to hear about it. Far from it. This has got something to do with gold. And I hope the solution to making Burnside Falls the county seat at the election. Gold? What has gold got to do with it? Well, if we can get about three ounces of gold dust and tailings, it may have everything to do with it. Come on, Cherokee. You and I are going to the lion's den. We're riding over to war dance. Cherokee and I were prodding those livery stable nags across the county over to war dance, Milo Burnside apparently reached there ahead of us as the result of a summons from Cap Kilmore. If you think because you're the president of a two-bit bank, Burnside, you can give me orders, you've got a few things coming. Yes? And you might as well understand this here now, Kilmore. I hired you and you're working for me. Yeah? Well, I ain't working for nobody. McCall's Railroad is putting the bill, and you and me, well, we're just partners. And the way I'm starting to feel now, I might be happier if I didn't have any partners at all. You can't threaten me. I promised the railroad we'd move a thousand people away from Burnside and over here to war dance. And if you can't live up to your obligation, I'll get somebody else to do it. Why, you fat-headed buzzard. You're a bigger crook than I am. Double-cross your own brother, rob your own bank, and then move over here like a rat leaving a sinking ship. Why, you cheap murderer! I was just hoping you'd do that. Come on, my throat! You're choking me! Don't! Don't cap! Don't! I've got a good mind to bang your head to the floor! Yes, yes, yes. We're in this deal as partners. Yes, yes, Cap. Anything you say. Uh, go on, get up. And remember, next time you think you're giving me orders, you'll find it's me who's doing the order. Ordering you a $10 funeral. <laughs> Two high-grade gentlemen, those two. Either one of them would happily arrange to murder a man for a silver dollar. But of course it was this love of money that not only was the basis of the whole trouble, but also what I hoped would be the solution for Harvey Burnside and Sarah. Cherokee and I were talking it over as our horses slowed up and we hit war dances rutted in dirty main street. Well, you realize you're asking me to risk my life by coming over to a town like this, Chad? Why, war dance is the perfect town for you, Cherokee. Wide open and lawless. That's what I mean. And being lawless, there's no law here. So there shouldn't be anyone looking for you for peddling that alcohol and water you used to describe as genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. (laughs) Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, indeed. (laughs) But with that poke of gold dust stuck in your pocket, somebody's sure to spot it and try to get it away from you. If they do, that means trouble. Well, I hope somebody spots the gold dust. You hope? Confound you anyhow, Chad. Just what are you up to? Well, according to you, I'm up to my neck in trouble. But if you want to know exactly what I plan to do to get the voters back to Burnside, all I can tell you is that I'm only certain of the first move. I'm going to locate Mr. Cap Kilmore and start from there. Okay. Where do you think you can find him? Well, the first place I'm going to look is uh, down the street there in that saloon. In that saloon? <laughs> Chad, my boy, you're a man of rare perspicacity. Lead the way, my friend, and depend on old banner to follow. <laughs> oh, Buck, give me another drink. This time, leave the bottle on the bar. Uh, pardon me, uh, you Mr. Kilmore? Yeah, who are you? My name's Foley, Mr. Kilmore. Fell over there, said you wanted to talk to me. Oh, well. Uh, you're one of the folks who moved over here from Burnside Falls, aren't That's you? That's right. That is, I, I ain't sure I'm staying here. I see. 
Well, maybe I can convince you that you ought to stay here a while. Huh? At least until tomorrow when we're holding the election for the county seat. I, uh, I don't see what you mean, sir. Well, us folks over here in War Dance have got a lot of pride in our community. Huh? And uh, if you'll stay here for the election and cast your vote for the best interest of the county, we'd be mighty happy to show you our appreciation. Well, that, uh... Sounds interesting, Mr. Kimar. You see, the law's funny. It says for a man to vote, he's got to own land. Yeah. So I figured maybe we'd just give you a quarter section of land and, uh, How's that sound, huh? Well, that ain't much of an attraction. The land I've seen since I got over here is so dry, a man couldn't raise gophers on it. Well, uh, since that's the way you feel about it, we might buy the land back from you for $50 yeah. the day after the election. Oh, 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 I see. (laughs) Fellas got to own land to vote. Then after the election... (laughs) You're a smart one, Cap. You sure are. And you'd better make sure you're smart too, Foley. Because I'm making it my business to get the name of every man who votes, and whether he votes for Burnside Falls or Warden. I think you get the idea, Foley. I'll see you later. Sure thing. I'll be looking for you the day after election. Hey, hey, bartender, I'll have a beer. Now, Cherokee, this is one time I'm going to buy you a drink. Uh, may we squeeze in here, mister? Yeah, yeah, you bet. Give me two fingers, no chaser. Be careful with those fingers, Cherokee. Don't chew them down past the nails. You, uh, fellas here to vote? No, far from it. I'm over here because of that crooked election Kilmore's trying to run on the people. Of course, it ain't none of my business, but, uh, I wouldn't say things like that too loud. Why? Has Kilmore got you bluff, too? Oh, oh. You're in for it now. Here's Kilmore coming back to the bar right now. No, sir, Kilmore don't scare me. I still think he's running a crooked election. What did you say, mister? What's that again? I said this whole election smells rotten to me. Or maybe you don't think so. The only thing I think is that your mouth needs closing. What's your name? What difference does my name make? Well, we got to put something on the headstone. Chad, take it easy. Now, look, if you think you're threatening me, you're not even getting close to it. Because I think you haven't got enough salt in your whole system to do anything about it. Not while I'm standing in front of you. Chad, you're loco. Remember, I told you your mouth needed closing? Well... Kilmore, you dare and you knocked his head right off his shoulders, you did. All right, you. Now, get up off there. Uh, Cap. Cap, what's that? That little leather pouch that rolled out of his pocket on the floor. Oh, what pouch? This pouch, right here. And look. Look, it's full of gold. Gold? Yes, gold. Wait a minute. Give me that bag. That gold dust is mine. Where'd you get this stuff? Well, I'm not waiting. Where'd you get that gold dust? She would never tell you if you didn't have me covered. But, well, I got it out of the bank on Wolf Creek over in Burnside Falls. With all men at the door there, we'd better be getting back to Burnside Falls. Well, your fools come back. Don't you see it's a trick? Come back. Well, you're smarter than I gave you credit for, Gilmore. It was a trick. Yeah, a trick that was just good enough to spoil your plan for a cooked-up election. And by the time they find it out, the election will be over, Burnside Falls will be the county seat, and you'll be in jail. Why, you dirty double dealer, the Cherokee duck! Now, let's see what you can do without your gun. Oh. Look out, Jeb! The way you're hitting him, you're going to fall against the bar and have that those beautiful bottles of oh. oh. That's the first time I've ever seen a man knocked out. The stimulus applied simultaneously. Look at him. He's just bathed in bourbon. Yes. But unfortunately, the bourbon's not going to wash away his sins. But I think by the time a few of the people admit on the stand to the bribes Kilmore offered them, that the state will wipe away his sins, although it may take 20 years. <laughs> Attorney at law, you certainly violate more laws than you learned about in school. Oh, I don't know about that, Cherokee. The 
The only law I was dealing with in war dance was the law of human nature. As you pointed out earlier and gave me the idea, it was just their thirst for gold which dumped Mr. Kilmore's apple cart. Strange you should mention thirst and apple cart in the same breath. <laughs> because of the callow youth, one of my dearest delights was imbibing a hard cider. An excellent libation, but I no longer like apples. <laughs> you mean you're an apple knocker? Well, not exactly, <laughs> my boy. <laughs> But a short time ago, I was revolted when I served a, a dish of applesauce. The whole thing was full of hairs. Full of hairs, eh? Well, maybe that was your fault. You didn't order your applesauce made from the right kind of apples. Uh, is there a certain kind of apple for making applesauce without hairs? Oh, certainly. Next time you order your applesauce, order it made from Baldwin's. <laughs> Baldwin's! <laughs> <laughs> Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby as a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action adventure story with your favorite young western star, Reed Hadley. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Action and suspense out of the Old West comes the most famous hero of them all, Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd. The ring of the silver spurs heralds the most amazing man ever to ride the prairies of the early West, Hopalong Cassidy, the same Hoppy you cheer in motion pictures, and the same California you've laughed at a million times. Raw courage and quick shooting have built a legend around this famous hero. Hopalong is a name to be feared, respected, and admired. For this great cowboy rides the trails of adventure and excitement. William Boyd as Hopalong Cassidy and Andy Clyde as California. What's our story this time, Hoppy? We call this one the Killers of Lion Canyon. California and I were riding into Skeleton Mountains. That's a range not far west of the Bar 20 where an old pal of mine had taken up homestead a few years back. He had written to me what good grass there was, and I thought we might use some of it for Bar 20 range. We were just getting up to where the pine trees grow. The horses had their heads down as they worked their way up a steep canyon trail. Hoppy, this here mountain air sure makes a man hungry, <laughs> don't it? <laughs> back there on the prairie, we cook more than you could eat. Yeah, yeah, I know, but uh, there's something about this here altitude. <laughs> Oh, gone. Hoppy, I thought you had friends around here. That ain't no friendly greeting. No, it isn't. Wait a minute. Look. There's someone coming. I don't know this man, California. Get ready. Guns right here in my hand. Howdy, friends. Howdy. Hey, put away your guns. I I apologize for the shooting. My mistake, friends. I I thought you was a mountain lion. Do we look like mountain lions, mister? <laughs> no, not at close range. I, uh, I saw something move, and this is Lion Canyon, and it's full of hungry critters. Sure, and that makes them mean, like me. I'm hungry, too, and uh, when Never somebody... mind, California. Uh, I, uh, I guess you must be strangers in here. I'm Lou Rucker. If there's anything I can do, just name it. Cassidy's my name, and this is California Carlson. It, uh, it wouldn't be hop along, Cassidy, would it? It would. Well, I'm sure proud to meet you men. Now, if I can help you in any way, you just go right ahead and ask. That's kind of you, Rucker. I'm looking for an old friend of mine, Ray Wilson, a homesteader. He took out some land at a place called Paradise Flats. Ray, uh, Wilson? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, Wilson was moving out. Moving out? That doesn't sound like Ray. Would anything be running him out, Rucker? Well, when a man can't make a living, he moves, don't he, Cassidy? I, I tell you, 
You ride up to the Paradise Flat store and ask about him. How do we get to the Paradise store? Follow this trail a short piece till it forks. Hey, turn right. The left fork won't take you nowhere. I see. Turn right, not left. Yeah, that's it. The left fork continues on up in Lion Canyon. Them varmints will jump a man any time. They're that bad, are they? Well, thank you, Rucker. I hope we'll see you again. Come on, California. I think that Rucker feller seems real friendly. Yeah, too friendly. Uh, what you mean? I think he took a shot at us for one thing. And I don't remember Ray Wilson as a man who would move away from a good piece of grassland. Ah, uh, Hoppy, you're just looking for trouble. I'm not looking for it, but I'm beginning to smell it. Well, here's the forks. We turn left. Uh, uh, hey, 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 hold on, hold Rucker said turn right. That's why we're going left. Rucker was too anxious. There must be something in this Lion Canyon, something Rucker doesn't want us to see. California, look. There's a horse running up the trail. And no rider on him. Let's go. That broomtail sure is running, Hoppy. We ain't never going to catch up with him. I know, but we can trail it and find out about the owner. Must be headed toward a ranch somewhere. Say, what you seeing, Hoppy? There's something else ahead. Can't make it out just yet. Looks like a man. Eh, you ain't wrong either. There, that is a man, all right. Laying there aside the creek. Yeah, and he's laying face down. Hold up a minute. Go down and have a look. Now then, here. Turn him over. Gee, Arsifat. Look at that face. Clawed by a mountain lion, sure enough. And that isn't all of it. This is Ray Wilson. Back to Hopalong Cassidy and our story, The Killers of Lion Canyon. Riding to see Ray Wilson, Hoppy and California are fired upon by Lou Rucker, who claims he was shooting at a mountain lion. Not trusting Rucker, Hoppy ignores his warning to stay out of Lion Canyon. There, they come upon a riderless horse, and soon afterwards, an unconscious man, Ray Wilson. That's lucky we got here as soon as we did. He isn't dead. It ain't the lion's fault. It done its best. Maybe Wilson was climbing this here cliff where the water comes over. He might have fell off and the lion jumped him. That uh, could have knocked him out. If it was a lion. I'm not so sure. Anyway, this bandana stops the blood. Now help me get him up on my horse. Steady him now. Let me swing up first. Uh, all right. We'll get him here in front of me in the saddle. There we are. Good thing he ain't triplets the size of him. I, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold still, you old lop ear. You, you. I think we can track that riderless horse. We'll get somewhere. Maybe to Paradise Flats. Yeah, and maybe we'll get someplace where we don't want to be. But let's go. <laughs> Well, there's the Paradise Flats General Store. But that horse, that isn't the riderless one. Sure ain't. That's uh, Palomino. Yeah, it is. The same kind Rucker was riding. What you figure that means, Hoppy? Trouble. Say, uh, look over there, across from the store. Looks like an old mine tunnel with the entrance boarded up. Yeah, but there are a lot of old mines in these mountains. Now he's over toward the store, California. We'll get Wilson inside. I wonder what they got in this store in the way of thirst-quenching, stomach-filling victuals. Huh? Cassidy, I thought I told you to... What's that you got there in your saddle? Oh, just like you said, Rucker. Mountain lines is bad in that canyon. This feller get jumped. Rucker, we need a doctor. A doctor? Why, why, sure, Cassidy. I'm lucky there's a doctor right inside. He, He owns the store. Now, uh, just to ease this man out of your saddle, I'll carry him in. All uh, right. There, I got him. Lay him there on the counter, Rucker. Uh, uh, too bad about this. It's your friend Ray Wilson, ain't it? I think you know that. Well, you can leave him with me, Cassidy. I'll take care of him. I thought you said there was a doctor here. What? Uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe well, I Well, you better produce that doctor now. Oh, oh, sure. Uh, Brody. Dr. Brody. Uh, uh, Dr. Brody, uh, uh, here's a patient for you. A patient? For me? Uh, that's right, doctor. I uh, got clawed by a mountain lion. Uh, this is Hopalong Cassidy and California Carlson. They found him. How come they did? What were they doing up Lion Canyon? 
How come they was let to go up Lion Canyon anyway? Well, they took a wrong turn. I, I told them how to turn to get to the store here. And why didn't they? Well, either they didn't remember my directions or they didn't want to remember. Dr. Brody, let's take care of this man. We stopped the blood, but something struck him on the head. Uh, I see. A, a cranial contusion. Concussion, no doubt. Best thing is to get him to my back room, my uh, operating room. Rucker, you carry him. I'll do the carrying. Well, uh, no need of that, Cassidy. He's in good hands now. Uh, you just leave him with us. Rucker, when this man comes to, I want to hear what he has to say. Maybe you understand why. Is that accusing me of something, Cassidy? I don't accuse until I have all the facts, Rucker. But I might do some accusing when Ray Wilson gives me the facts. Hoppy, uh, there's a wagon outside. Uh, there's a woman and a boy in it. Rucker, take the patient into the back room before Mrs. No, Wilson... Rucker, keep your hands off. Oh, Mr. Rucker. Mr. Rucker, have you seen Ray? Yeah. Dad's horse came home without him. And... <gasps> Dad. Ray. Oh, Ray. Ray isn't dead, ma'am. Now, please don't worry. Uh, Hoppy, uh, you want me to try Hoppy? and... Hoppy? Uh... Why, you're Hopalong Cassidy. And you're California. Ray was always talking about you two. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. This is our boy, Jimmy. How are you, son? Mrs. Wilson, Dr. Brody says he can help Ray. What do you think? Dr. Brody? Since when was he a doctor? That's just what I thought. Brody, I didn't think you were even a horse doctor. Mrs. Wilson... How far is it to your place? Only a mile, just over and down the first ridge. Well, I hate to move, Ray, but we must. California, you ease Ray up and get him out to the wagon. Cassidy, I'm warning you. Don't you move that man. Save your breath, Rucker. Go ahead, California. Mrs. Wilson, you and Jimmy, too. I'll be out in a minute. Coffee, I hate to leave you with these rattlesnakes, but uh, you're the boss. Uh, help me hoist Ray onto my shoulder. Huh? Uh, all right. I'm holding the door for you, California. Yeah. Rucker, you letting them get away with this? Unless you've got any better ideas, Brody, shut up. Rucker, that's very good advice. And I got some for you, too, Cassidy. Get out of this country. You and that partner of yours. Not till after we've heard Ray Wilson talk. If it's trouble you're looking for, Rucker, let's have it now. Yeah. You're plenty fast on the draw, Cassidy. But that ain't my way. No. You have what you call mountain lions do your fighting. A record tell your lions they can find me at Ray Wilson's place anytime tonight. All right, Mrs. Wilson. You've done what you can for Ray. He'll come out of it soon. He's comfortable on this couch, Miss. Just leave him a while. Oh, Hoppy, I'm so grateful to you in California. Now, please sit down. Any place. Oh, I, I didn't notice it's getting dark. I, I'd better light this table lamp. There. That's better. Jimmy, stay near your father and call me if he stirs any. Uh, ain't it funny how a table always makes me think of eating? Oh, why, you poor man. You must be starved. I'll go and fix something. Well, any old thing will do, Mrs. Wilson. Just uh, some uh, meat and potatoes and uh, coffee and a little cream. and uh, Maybe a piece of pie if you got it. <laughs> Are you sure that's all, California? Well, I could use some beans and a little hot gravy. And, <laughs> uh, and maybe a small plate of hot biscuits are dripping with the butter and honey. And Hold on, maybe, hold uh, on. I think Mrs. Wilson has the idea. Oh, dear. Well, I'll have to see what's in the kitchen. California is always empty, Mrs. Wilson. But first, I want to know a few things. Why were you and Ray leaving Paradise Flats? Well, everyone has left. We're just small homesteaders with only a few cows. But our herds have simply vanished, two or three at a time. Did the mountain lions get them? Well, that's what we had to believe. But the strange thing is, we never found any carcasses. Mrs. Wilson, why did Ray want to leave? Oh, Ray didn't want to leave at all. Paradise Flats has such fine grass. It's a big mountain meadow. Has uh, anyone else wanted it? For instance, uh, Rucker or Brody? Well, they have said Paradise Flats should be one big ranch instead of being filled with homesteaders, but mm -hmm. they always acted friendly enough. So you can't say what happened to your cattle? No, I can't. We had only a herd of ten cows left. Last week, they vanished all at once. And still no sign of where they went? No. Except last night, Ray told me he'd found something. Something he wanted to go out and take a look at before we pulled out today. I don't know where it was. Mom! Mom! Dad's talking! What did he say, son? I couldn't tell. Maybe he'll talk to you, Mrs. Wilson. Ray. What is it, Ray? Tell me. Don't... Don't whip Jimmy. 
He found... He found the... Uh... Well, Jimmy, what in the world is your father saying? Why should you be whipped? Uh, I guess maybe... Because I, I rode in the Lion Canyon yesterday. You've been warned about that. Yes, sir, but... But I just had to see it. Just once before we left. And what was it you found, son? A, a sort of a hole. A big one. Up behind some willows. I was looking in. Then a lion screamed at me. I sure got out of there fast. Huffy, that makes sense. Lions. Just like Rucker said. It begins to make something else, too. Son, could that be an old mine you found? Sort of, yes. I told Dad about it, and I think that's where he went today. Hoppy, uh, what you figure that makes? A shortcut, maybe, through the ridge. There's an old mine entrance up near the store, remember? And today, Rucker beat us over there from Lion Canyon. You did right, Hoppy. He sure did. If Ray could just tell us a little more. He hasn't even whispered. A doctor could bring him out of it, Mrs. Wilson. How far is it to a doctor? Twenty miles around the mountain by the road. But, Mom, it's only five straight across. I could ride it. Dad's horse is still saddled out there in the shed. Mrs. Wilson, it's our best chance. The boy can do it. Go ahead, son. On my way, sir. You got a fine boy there, Mrs. Wilson. No need to worry about him. Uh, speaking about worrying, Hoppy, my stomach's sure getting worried that maybe I ain't got the brains enough to feed it. <laughs> All right, California. If Mrs. Wilson wants to start supper. Oh, yes, I, I'd better see what there is. Most of our stores are packed, but there must be something left. Oh, there sure better be, because I'm getting mighty old fired wheat from... Uh... <gasps> Jimmy! Grab your gun, California, out in front. Over there, near our horses, come on. There he is, Hoppy, off to the left. I'll get him. Hold it, California, that's the boy. Head toward him. Hoppy, Hoppy! Right here, easy now. What happened, son? I was walking in the shed in the dark, and someone was here at your horses. He, he saw me and then fired two shots. Didn't hit me. Then he ran off. Could you tell who it was? In the gun flash, it, it looked like Mr. Brody from the Paradise Store. Hoppy, look. The house went dark. Come on. There he is. Mrs. Let Wilson. Me in. Oh, they're after Ray. They shut me on, locked the door. Let's break it down. Come on, California. Both of together now. Keep your gun ready. Oh. He's gone. Ray's gone. They've kidnapped him. Now, back to Hopalong Cassidy and our story, The Killers of Lion Canyon. While Hoppy and California are trying to understand what had knocked their friend, Ray Wilson, unconscious, sudden gunshots draw them outside the ranch house. A moment later, they hear Mrs. Wilson scream. Running back into the house, they find that Ray Wilson has been kidnapped. It was all so fast, I just don't know what happened. I see how it was, Mrs. Wilson. One man drew us out with a shot near our horses. Someone else sneaked in here through the back door and took Ray. Yes, Ray tried to sit up when you went out. He seemed almost well. I think he was trying to talk. Those two didn't dare let him talk. They had to get him away so he couldn't tell us what he knows. I heard their horses, Hoppy. I can tell which way they went, even in the dark. They're taking the Ridge Trail over to the Paradise Store. Good work, son. Have you got your dad's horse ready? Yes, sir. Can you lead us to that hole you found on the side of Lion Canyon? I sure can. We can go right up to it. It's it's around a sort of a rocky cliff. Uh, Hoppy, what internation's the good of that? I'm staking everything. It's a shortcut through the ridge. We might even get to the Paradise Store before they do. Well, dog go. Now, Mrs. Wilson, don't worry. Come on, California. Jimmy, let's go. <laughs> What's the use of having horses if all we do is walk? And up a stream, too. Keep on coming, California. You have one thing to be thankful for. There's a full moon tonight so we can see our way. Jimmy, how much farther? These here are the willows. The opening is just on through. There it is. See? This stream comes right out of a big hole in the mountain. Yeah, it does. Hold on a minute. Hoppy, that rock cliff we just come around is where we found Ray Wilson this afternoon. That's right. And this is an old mine entrance, high enough to lead our horses in. You got your gun ready? Why, you figure we might meet with that uh, there mountain lion? If we do, it'll have only two legs. You follow me. Jimmy, drop in behind. Come on. Plum black in here, ain't it? Mm, cold. Oh, cold as ice. Yeah, I can feel it. Jimmy, are you all right? Sure, Hoppy. 
I never did like being under no mouth. Like being buried in a grave. Keep up close to me, California. We're getting along fine. They don't! Doggone it! Hoppy, hoppy, hoppy. Wait, wait. I dropped my gun. All right. See if you can find it. Mm. Can you find it? No, no. The gall darn thing, but here's something. Feels like a piece of ice. I'd better strike a match. Jumping catfish. It is ice. Yeah. And look, here's a door with bars across it. Off at one side. Why, it's a room. The walls are coated with ice. Hoppy, have you seen what I'm seeing in there? Oh, oh, and the match went out. Here, I'll get it. See that? Yeah, that's butchered beef hung up on racks. Well, I heard hell of ice in mountain caves, but this is the first time I ever actually seen it. Let me see, too. Come ahead, son. See, I'll bet this is what Dad found. Well, if he didn't, he came pretty close. Uh, there goes the match again. I'll light another, Huffy. I'll... We don't need it. This explains enough. The cows were brought here by walking into that stream we followed. That's why they never left any tracks. Then they were butchered. You think it was Rucker and Brody that did it, Hoppy? Uh, that's my guess. Jimmy, how did Brody have supplies hauled to his store? In a big covered wagon. Sure. Then the beef was taken out the front entrance of the mine, the covered wagon hauled it off to be sold. That's the way the homesteaders have been robbed. That still don't get us out of here. The front entrance can't be far. I figure the ridge over us is high and narrow. This tunnel won't be long. You got your gun, California? Yep, yep, I picked her up. All right, come on. Go slow now. I see something ahead. Yeah, getting kind of light ahead up there, ain't it? The mine entrance is open. There's a little moonlight. That entrance was closed today. Maybe someone heard us. Better stop. California, you come ahead with me. Jimmy, you stay here with the horses. Yes, sir. You think you can manage all three horses by yourself? I'll do my best, sir. Good boy. All right, California. Let's go. <laughs> so good. No one in the mine and no one here in front of the store. I don't see how you know where you are. Turn near as dark in here as it was in the mine. Yeah. Follow me along beside the building. You remember Brody had a back room. Look, California. There's a light coming through a crack. Go up easy now. Looks like the light's coming from around a door. Here it is. I'll take a peek inside. See anything, Hobby? Ray Wilson's in there. He's sitting up on a box. Brody's with him. I wonder, wonder where Rucker is. He's right behind you. Drop those what? guns quick. What is? Now back to Hop Along, Cassidy. I thought you were smart, Cassidy, but you're as dumb as your partner. <laughs> Fallen for my trick. Yeah, but I didn't see you. If it wasn't so darn dark, I'd have... Never mind, uh, California. All right, Brody. Open the door. I'm bringing him in. Uh, smooth work, Rucker. Sure. I tailed him from the mine entrance and right up here to the door. Now go ahead, you two. And forget about your guns. I've got them. Hoppy. California. Ray, how are you? Now, ain't it nice for old friends to meet again? Too bad you won't be seeing each other very long. We'll be dead? Well, now, well, that's smart of you, California. The first smart thing I've heard you say. Well, if I could just get my paws on you... Rucker, I'd... you've done a lot of killing for a piece of grassland, haven't you? I see your game. Drive out the homesteaders, then you take over Paradise Flats. Well, that's real interesting, Cassidy. Got anything else you know? Yeah, I know a mountain lion didn't do the killing. You jump a man and knock him out. Then you cut him so there's plenty of blood. You make sure the lions will get him then. Right again, Cassidy. But that won't happen to you. Rucker, what do you aim to do with this bunch? Brody, I'll tell you. Cassidy and his pal and Wilson are going to be found dead in the morning. Killed each other in a gunfight. We, uh, we won't know why they shot each other. It ain't none of our business anyways. It won't work, Rucker. Tell me one reason why not. Well, because, uh, because... Well, Rucker, it seems to me you ought to know the reason yourself. <laughs> Keep talking, Cassidy. I like to hear you make a fool of yourself. <laughs> yeah, 
And this is the guy we thought was so smart. Well, Cassidy, did you figure out yet why it won't work? It won't work because you still got the rest of our bunch to deal with. <laughs> That's good. The rest of your bunch. Cassidy, nobody comes into this country without my knowing it. And I know you two came in alone. Hey, did I hear something? Ah, Brody, there ain't nothing to hear. Well, listen. Where? Wait, it sounds like a whole gang. Open the door, Rucker. See who they are. I can't make a mark. But whoever they are, here's a lead greeting for them. Tell them what you think. Tell them what you think. Uh, I've got the... Uh, I've got it. Uh, 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 Huffy, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, California. I've got this coyote pinned down. This here Brody feels more like a skunk. Ray, are you strong enough to get that gun over there? I sure am, Hoppy. Seeing that fight just about cured me. <laughs> That's fine. We got our hands full, so you cover them. I've got them, Hoppy. I just wish they'd make a move so I'd have an excuse to plug them. Why, are you... California, take that rope and tie them up. Right, Hoppy. And now for a talk with the rest of our band. All right, Jimmy, come on in. Jimmy? A kid? Gee whiz. What a mess. Hello, Dad. Hello, son. Hello, Hoppy. Hello, Jimmy. Now, what have you got to say for yourself? Nothing, sir, I guess. I'm sorry I didn't keep the horses down in the mine like I promised, but but I just couldn't stay away. <laughs> I knew you couldn't, son. I know boys, and I knew you couldn't keep away for long. To tell you the truth, Jimmy, I was counting on your help. Gee. Dad, Mom's outside. Here, Jimmy? Yes, she drove over in the wagon. Said she couldn't stay away. Here she is now. Ray. Oh, oh, that's Ray. all right. I'm all right, Nelly. I guess we're all all right, except those two there on the floor. Brody and Rucker, a couple of mountain lions who are going to have a nice long rest in the zoo. Hoppy, I guess there's nothing I can say, but thanks. Oh, forget it, Ray. Just tell the homesteaders they can come back to Paradise Flats. They won't be bothered anymore. Hoppy, I don't know how we can ever repay you in California. Oh, shucks, ma'am. I pain me's plum easy. I never asked for more than a good meal in my stomach. <laughs> there he goes again. <laughs> when a couple of land-grabbing cutthroats try attempted murder and blame it on the lions to cover up their crime, they'd better make certain first that Hoppy and California are nowhere in the vicinity. In our next adventure, Hoppy and California come into town to buy flour and bacon for the Bar 20 Ranch and find the townspeople in an uproar. The bank has gone broke, and the men responsible turn out to be the wastrels of what is. Hop Along Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is transcribed and produced in the West by Walter White, Jr., the Killers of Lion Canyon was written by Mike Jackson, with original music under the personal direction of Albert Glasser. All stories are based upon the characters created by Clarence E. Mulford. This is a Commodore production. my name. Luke Slaughter. Cattle's my business. It's a tough business. It's big business. I've got a big stake in it. And there's no man west of the Rio Grande big enough to take it from me. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, Civil War cavalryman turned Arizona cattleman. Across the territory, from Yuma to Fort Defiance, from Flagstaff to the Huachucas, and below the border through Chihuahua and Sonora, his name was respected or feared, depending on which side of the law you were on. Man of vision, man of legend, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. <laughs> I came from Texas to the Arizona Territory with 2,000 head of scrawny longhorns. 
but the good grass in the valley of the San Pedro fattened them up like butter. And when I got a contract to deliver a thousand head to the Indian agency at San Carlos, I signed with a clear conscience. When you sell beef to the government, they want good beef. They always seem to want it yesterday. Hey, Wichita. Where are the steers from the southeast section? Uh, well, Juan and Jose went for them. Uh, you, Frankie, don't run them critters. They gotta be delivered with legs on. Well, they won't lose much weight on the trail to San Carlos. Nope. A lot of grass on the route you picked. Have to hustle them to make it in six days, old Luke. Yeah, we sure can't let them do any sightseeing. Closer at the next batch, Frankie. Well, I wish we had a few more hands. 1,500 Longhorns is a big passel for six men and a cook. A thousand head, Wichita. That's what the contract calls for. If we deliver two out of every three we start out with, we're doing mighty nifty. Now, what are you talking about? If I lost one out of ten on a simple six-day trail in perfect spring weather, I wouldn't dare call myself a cattleman. Luke, you've been operating in Texas where there ain't no mountains, no rivers, no engines, no rustlers, and no legal acting robbers who charge you in cattle if you set foot on their grazeland. There ain't no problems in Texas. Matter of fact, there ain't nothing in Texas. <laughs> I knew I had some reason for coming to Arizona, but I'm still not losing one for three. Oh. Or... Buenos dias, Senor Slaughter, Senor Witch. The name's Wichita. And where's them critters you and Jose was supposed to cut and bring in? They come with Jose. Oh, why didn't you help him, Juan? We're in a hurry. It don't take Jose long. Only 50 little cattle. I told you to cut a hundred, you loafing scalawag. There were not a hundred left. I think maybe Ramirez visited the southeast section last night. Luke, I've been telling you it was Ramirez picking away at our herd. This time he's really hit us, and if you're asking me, you'd better get out of Parsi and go after him. Well, there isn't time, Wichita. If we don't hit the trail today, we can't live up to the contract. Uh, yeah, and now we ain't got more than about 1,300 head fit for the trail. And if you aim to deliver a 1,000, you better take them all. All right, Wichita. You know Arizona better than I do. But I'll bet we come back with at least 300 steers with my brand on them. I bet you six months' pay we don't. Easy, Streak. Easy. We're going to start them soon. Six months' pay. That's what I'll bet you. All right, I'll give you a real bet. Six months of your wages against Blue Streak here. Now, Luke, if you got to lose the best horse in your string to learn yourself a lesson, I'm willing to teach you. So far, so good, Luke. Right, Wichita. We'll make a good 20 miles again today. Yeah. Herd looks so much smaller than it did when we started yesterday. Anything happen while you was riding night watch? Nothing much, except now I know Ramirez is in the neighborhood. Well, why didn't you waken the boys and go after him? Well, they need their sleep if we're to deliver these cactus boomers on schedule. But you can't let that thieving Mexican keep cutting in on your herd like this. Right now I have to, Wichita. Well, if you was to ask me... I didn't. Now let's keep these critters moving. Yeah, get along there. Got the coffee boiling there, Cookie? Yeah, sure have, Mr. Slaughter. Fix your breakfast in two jerks if you're ready. Nah, I'll wait until the sun and the men get up. But you've been riding watch since midnight for three nights. Yeah, I'm a little tired at that. You know, this is a good night horse, but he's no blue streak. With streak, I can catch a few winks in the saddle and leave the watching up to him. Oh, you shouldn't have betting him against Wichita's pay. We ain't going to get back home with no 300 head. Uh, we'll see. This pony's learning. We got visitors out there. Well, wait while I grab me a Mustang and a gun, Mr. Slaughter. I'll let you know if I need any help. Let's go, boy. You looking for something, gentlemen? Whose outfit is this? Belongs to Luke Slaughter from down below Tombstone. You boys ever hear him? Not me. No. Me neither. You his trail boss? That's right. 
We watched you bed the outfit down from the mesa. I'd say you got something over a thousand head. Yeah, that's right. We were delivering a thousand to San Carlos. Government business don't pay. They're too fussy. But good luck to you anyhow. Thanks. Oh, by the way, you're crossing private grays. This is part of Wendell Miller's spread. Our maps don't say so. Map makers can't keep up with things these days. I don't blame you for taking this short trail to San Carlos. Only you understand it'll cost you a hundred head. Well, if this is Miller's land and that's his crossing fee, have your boys cut him out. I haven't got the time or the men to argue. Slash those logs tight, boys. If they come loose in midstream, we lose our chuck wagon. It looks like she'll float all right, Mr. Slaughter. Yeah, it's a good trick to get the wagon across, Luke, but... Uh... Texas trick. We did have one little river back there. But if we drive downstream 11, 12 miles, the critters can ford. Yeah, and we'd lose a day. Well, the current's running too strong here. Them lazy longhorns will let themselves wash down river, and we'll lose two days rounding them up again. Blue streak will make them swim. Juan, Frankie, you both got your top horses? Si, senor Slaughter. Good. Follow Streak and me and try to do what we do. The rest of you, head the steers into the river. Keep them coming steady. We're going to lose half of what's left. Come on, Blue Streak. Hop. Cookie, once that stubborn Luke gets something into his head. Hey, 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 look at that gray horse swim at them steers. Why, he's a, he's a hazing them like he was on dry land. And he's learning the other horses how to do it. Wichita, they got them brainless longhorns swimming across in a straight line. Maybe they do know a thing or two in Texas. I still don't see how you done it, Luke. We didn't lose more than ten head in the river. Uh, Blue Streak knows more about cattle than most waddies. Real thoughtful of you to rest them tonight. You can turn them over to me, nice and fresh. <laughs> Wichita, you really think you're going to win that bet? Well, I know it. If we got 1,100 head at this point, I'll eat them. No, don't eat them. They're sold. And we'll make San Carlos by mid-afternoon tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll have me a big grill of horse. Uh, maybe. What you stopping for? The show. What show? Those stars. Millions of them. Pretty, aren't they? Yeah, and mighty helpful when you're lost at night. No, I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about, well, about nature. Yeah. Hmm. For instance, that old owl and that coyote might even be talking to each other. Yeah, and they might be talking Apache language. You think so? Sure do. And we're going to lose another parcel of cattle if we don't ride out there and stop them. And get scalped in the middle of the night. We'll collect from them on the way back, in daylight. Well, my count was a thousand head plus 19. Agree with yours, Mr. Slaughter? Well, I had it plus 15. Yeah, shall I add the extras to the amount of the treasury draft, or uh, you driving them back? I'll throw them in free. Save the government a little money. Give your Indians a little extra beef. His engines got a little extra beef. They snuck about 50 head right out from under our noses last night. Oh, I doubt if they were reservation Indians. There's a renegade band somewhere south in the Aravipa Hills. Yeah, but the cavalry from Fort Thomas will dig them out for long. I'll get the draft ready for you, Mr. Slaughter. It's fine, sir. Well, Luke... You've done a better job than I thought you would, that. I'll let you ride Blue Streak part way home. <laughs> I'll ride him all the way, Wichita. <laughs> we may be starting home without a herd, but our bet pays off on how many we're driving when we get there.
In a moment, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone returns. Never mind the bait. Simply join us on CBS Radio later on today when yours truly, Johnny Dollar, waits with bated breath for the return of a missing fisherman. It's another exciting insurance fraud case for Johnny to solve. And another thrilling mystery for you. Join us on most of these same stations today as the plot thickens for CBS Radio's Johnny Dollar. And now, Act Two of William N. Robeson's production of Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. <laughs> We made our drive to San Carlos in six days. The men expected to get home in three, but I had some unfinished business to take care of. Look down in the basin there, boys. About 50 longhorns and six Apache herdsmen. Uh-huh. Bound to be our critters. The four of us going to tackle the six of them? Well, if we did, we'd have at least 20 more braves pouring down from those wiki-ups on the far side. Give me your guns, Wichita. Thanks. Now, Juan and I are going to circle behind the camp to draw those Apaches away from the cattle. When we do, you and Frankie hightail it in and drive them east as fast as they'll go. Well, now, we come a fur piece to pick up 50 measly longhorns, but east, we're, we're tombstone southwest of here. Sure. But like you say, we've come a fur piece. And when I get those steers back, I aim to keep them. <laughs> Four pistols loaded, one. See? Si. Bueno. Just circle and keep firing. And when the Apaches come after us, well, we've got better horses. Let's go. Luke's made a bad mistake, Frankie. We run the cattle east till they're ready to drop. And where do we wind up? I don't know. It ain't pleasant country, though, I'll tell you that. Uh, it's Indian country, that's what it is. Why, there could be an Apache behind every boulder. And Luke's got our six guns. And then we... Hey, there's one now. Where, where? Mr. Bagby? Well, I... well you ain't uh, an Apache. <laughs> no. Captain Marcotte, attached to the cavalry at Fort Thomas. Mr. Slaughter suggested that you might enjoy the company of some of my men as far as the fort. Enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> Your chuck wagon and remuda are there already. And Mr. Slaughter says he'll join you as soon as he herds those renegade Indians back to the reservation. The next order of business was the cattle baron, Wendell Miller whose men had charged me a crossing fee of a hundred head. He wasn't the kind you call out the United States Cavalry for. I went to his spread alone under the name of Link Slater. I told him I wanted to get started in the cattle business. I flattered him until he was treating me like a long-lost nephew. Now there's a head I have in mind for you, Link. And even a hundred head, prime longhorn. Well, I don't know that I'm much of a judge yet, but uh, well, they look fine to me. My foreman picked them up. The drover was going through last week, a little short of cash, I guess, and bought got them for $10 a head. You get them for what I paid for them. You've got a bill of sale, I suppose. <laughs> That's right, young fella. <laughs> In the cattle business, we don't take anybody's word. <laughs> oh, well, no, I didn't oh, mean Oh, it's that... all right. That's all right. You're a promising young man. And I'd like to see you make a real go out of that little place you told me about. Try to build it up to a, to a spread like this one. Well, I don't know that I can ever do that. You can if you're willing to take some advice. I'd be grateful for it. All right, Link. This is a tough new country. Man's got to make his own laws. He's got to keep his eyes and ears open and take what he wants. Prove you can do that, you'll be all right. That's just what I'm going to prove. Now, uh, how about that bill of sale? Oh, yes, of course, my boy. <laughs> the receipt for a hundred head at ten dollars a head, signed by a fella named uh, Luke Slaughter, or something like that. I see. 
The steers all seem to have a lazy S brand. Mr. Miller, can I tell you something about keeping your eyes and ears open? <laughs> Now, don't tell me that one of these critters here is missing a horn or that he bellows off key. <laughs> Look at the brand on my horse. And listen while I say Luke Slaughter and Link Slater. What? You heard me. And now suppose you show me a map of your spread. And I'll show you that these steers were taken off a trail five miles west of your farthest boundary. Now, look here, Slater. It's Slaughter. And I don't like having the name forged. My foreman brought in the cattle and the receipt. I'm not going to court to argue about it. Like you advised me, I'm making my own laws. And I'm taking those steers for exactly what you paid for them. Nothing. And finally, there was the business that started long before the drive. The business of Ramirez. Well, look, last camp before we hit the home range again. Maybe. How do you mean maybe, Senor Slaughter? We drive it easy tomorrow with so few cattle. <laughs> My golly, look, if you could have picked up 150 more of our own brand summers, you would have won our bet. Yeah, bet or no bet. Everybody's worked hard, and tomorrow we ought to have some fun. Who wants to go hunting? Oh, for the... Luke, you just want to put off handing Blue Streak over to me. I ain't a going. Me and Jose, we were the best hunters in all Sonora. Bears, deers, pumas, eagles, apaches. We hunt anything, Jose and me. Good. Then you're just the men I need for tomorrow. Gracias. What we hunt for? Ramirez. Ramirez? Sure. We know he's operating around here. Uh I think maybe not. Ramirez has moved. I bet he ain't moved far. That's right. With a couple of great hunters like Juan and Jose, we shouldn't have any trouble finding him. But uh, Ramirez has many men. We don't have so many. I've heard that Ramirez will accept a man-for-man -man challenge. All we have to do is get word to him somehow that you and Jose and I want to meet him and his two best men. Oh, Senor Slaughter, I would like to do this, but... I just remember my mother. She was very sick when I leave. I, I, I better go see her now, pronto. Well, I'm sorry to hear that one. It'll have to be Jose and me against Ramirez. Well, what about me? You said you wouldn't go hunting. Se Senor Slaughter, Jose's little brother, his wife is going to have a baby, so he better go to Hermosillo, too. You give us our pay? Well, of course, boys. Here's yours, Jose. Thirty gold for you, Juan. Frankie. Yeah, boss. These boys want their ponies out of the remuda. Gracias, senor. Jose and me, we would stay if you needed us for the cattle. But I understand. Caramba. I hope you find your families in the best of health. See, si, uh, muchas gracias. Oh, uh, Juan. If you happen to run across Ramirez. Tell him I'll be right plumb in the middle of Rio Verde Meadow at noon tomorrow. All alone. On a big gray horse. I can't bear to watch it happen to you, Luke. Then go on back and wait with the herd and the check wagon. Maybe Ramirez didn't get your message. Don't worry about that. He got it. Juan saw to that. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Well, Wichita, you can either go back or wait here on the rim. I'm riding into that basin alone. Luke, ain't you... Ain't you never heard how Ramirez fights? Sure. He'll come charging down with that big shotgun blazing and... and... tear you to bits before he's in your pistol range. You know, Wichita, the United States Army is always testing new weapons. The boys at Fort Thomas wanted me to try out this rifle. That skinny thing? Oh, how far will it shoot? Nobody's quite sure. So I'm going to aim and let Ramirez fire first. If this rifle's no good, well, I guess you'll have to take the herd in yourself. as ready 
as I'll ever be, Streak. Hope he doesn't keep us waiting too long. Hola! Right on the dot. He's way short. This rifle better not be. Tumbled him. Go, Streak! First shot, she break my hand, senor. The next shot, she break my arm. The next shot, she miss. I guess I haven't got the hang of this rifle yet. Your pistol, she's still loaded, no? If I let you go, would you take your men across the border and stay there? <laughs> I guess so. She's pretty nice in Sonora. All right. But if I ever hear of you setting foot on United States soil again, I'm coming after you, and you'll never go back alive. <laughs> a man does not see the branding iron twice by the hot end, senor. And there's one more thing, Ramirez. A matter of several hundred cattle with the lazy-ass brand. I aim to have them back before you leave. Sixty-six, sixty-seven, three sixty-eight. That would you make it, Wichita? I quit counting at three hundred, Luke. <laughs> oh my! No more wages coming for six months, and I ain't got enough cash to even buy me a pint of tonsil varnish. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have, except that you lost that bet before your pay got doubled. What? what? Come on now. Let's get those cattle to grass. Yeah! Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, starring Sam Buffington, was written by Fran Van Hartisfeldt and directed by William N. Robeson. Editorial supervision by Tom Hanley. Supporting Mr. Buffington were Junius Matthews, Don Diamond, Peter Leeds, Barney Phillips, and Norm Alden, with music composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. <laughs> Next week at this time, we return with... Slaughter's the name. Luke Slaughter. When we meet up again, you can call me that. Luke Slaughter. Dodge City entered the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Heavy, Matt? Oh, somehow it was easier carrying him up to your office and back down, Doc. Where are you going to put me, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, well, on the couch here, I guess. Uh, uh, you'll be all right there, Chester? Oh, yes, sir. This will be fine. Good. I'm sure sorry I'm so much trouble. Chester, next time, try to land on just one foot. 
Even if you break a leg. I know. A man's in a terrible fix when he sprains both ankles. Mm, he sure is, Doc. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what you're going to do. You're going to stay right there on that couch, and you're going to sleep there, too. Maybe Doc and I'll bring you in something to eat every day or two. Oh, no. It's better than you deserve. I know. I've been saying over and over to myself, Chester, you fool, you. Well, the wage is a sin, Chester. <laughs> you were lucky to get off as easy as you did. The way I heard it. Uh, come on, Chester. Tell us what really happened. Huh? <laughs> but I did tell you. I was a looking out this second story window, admiring the view, so to speak. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I fell. That's all right onto the street. He didn't say whose window, Chester. In Texas, Doctor, a gentleman don't mention such things. You ain't in Texas. Well, sometimes we should never laugh. <laughs> like now? Yes, like now. <laughs> Many a reputation's been ruined by just such loose talk that you're making, Doc. Never mind, Doc Chester. He's jealous, that's all. Oh, jealous? Of putting tracks in a man's yard? <laughs> Not me. Not by a long side. Why, no, sir. Oh. Good morning, Marshal. Oh, well, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Oh, there's Chester. <laughs> heard about you, Chester. I heard... Never you... mind what you heard, Torp. Chester just got thrown from a horse, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. What is it you want here, gentlemen? Yeah. All right, you tell him, Summers. Well, Marshal, it's about tomorrow night. Oh? So what about tomorrow night? Well, you know, it's the roundup. The sales season's over. There'll be a thousand cowboys celebrating in Dodge. Well, they always do at the end of the season. What about it? Well, there's going to be more of them this year, and there'll be a lot of homesteaders in town, too. It's going to be worse than ever. Well, I expect that. There could be a lot of trouble, Marshal. <laughs> yeah, there could be, Summers. Just what is it you want? Well, we've talked it over, and... Uh, we want you to get a lot of good, tough men together, maybe about uh, 20 of them, and deputize them. That way, there won't be any trouble. Yeah. That's what you want, is it? Yes, we do. Look, Summers, my job's to keep the peace around here, and I'm going to do it, but I'll do it in my own way. Oh, I know, Marshal. Now, you but... turn 20 deputies loose in that crowd looking for trouble, and they're going to find it. As soon as the wild ones heard about it, they'd bunch up and shoot it out with every one of them. Why, it'd turn into the worst slaughter Dodge has ever seen. I think that's about the most fool idea I ever heard of. Yeah, no reason for you to talk like that, Marshal. I think it's a good idea. I sure don't want my place wrecked just because you're mule-headed. You're a gambler, Torp. So? So you can take your chances along with everybody else. Now, if you don't want that, then close your place up tomorrow night. What, lose all that Texas money? <laughs> that's not likely. Now, we're not all gamblers, Marshal. They can wreck my dry goods store just as fast as a gambling house once they get started. And it's up to you. That's right. It is up to me. And we're going to leave it that way. Then uh, you won't do anything. I'll do everything I can. I don't know, Marshal. Look, Summers, I know you've got your doubts about me. That's natural. Some people think I'm too lax with Front Street. Some think I'm too severe. Well, that's the way of it in any town. If a peace officer does his job well, he pleases nobody. Marshal, we didn't come here for a lecture. What did you come for, Torp? Maybe you had in mind to help me pick out those deputies. Is that it? For a matter of fact, I could, Marshal. Yeah, sure, sure. In a couple of hours, yours would be the only tables open for play. No, that's not what it's I... It's been done before, Torp. Is that too, Torp? We're not going to take his word for anything, are you? I don't know. But anyway, he won't listen to us, so it's his responsibility. Come on, men, let's get out of here. I hope you can handle it, Marshal. Goodbye, gentlemen. That torp is no good. He is just plain no good, Miss Dillon. Well, I know one man that got skinned at his place, and torp gave him back $20 so he wouldn't be broke. Huh? Just how much did this man lose, Doc? Oh, well, five or six hundred, they said. And uh, then he... Uh... Oh, yeah, I see what you mean, man. I'm sure not going to be much good to you tomorrow night, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you can watch the jail right here, Chester. I know, but you just got to get somebody to help you out on the street. At least one man, anyway. You can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, but tomorrow night, Dodge will be overrun with trail boys and homesteaders. 
All looking for satisfaction. No, I wouldn't ask any man to face that. I know a few fellows who'd do it, and so do you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe. But I wouldn't ask anybody. How many were killed last year, man? I don't remember. Well, I do. Six, that's what. We buried them all in the saddle blankets. All except one. I remember he didn't even own a blanket. (laughs) Why, then he was sure out of luck all the way around, wasn't he? Come on, Doc. Let's go get some dinner. All right. We'll bring you a piece of bread, Chester. Maybe. I want a steak. Rare. (laughs) How come you're so hungry, Chester? Were you in such a hurry to get over there last night you didn't take time for supper? Mr. Dillon, I will answer no more questions about last night, and that is final. (laughs) Well, we'll bring you something. Yeah, I don't know if we should, though, Matt. A man can think about his sins better on an empty stomach. Close the door, will you? The next morning, I had Mr. Hightower print up some signs for me with a few rules that I made up for the roundup. They were fair and reasonable, and I hoped they'd be accepted without question. The principal restrictions were that there was to be no shooting and no reckless riding in the streets. That afternoon, I went from saloon to saloon and left a sign at each one. The Texas Trail was my last stop, and there I sat down with Kitty for a short beer. Town's beginning to fill up, Matt. Yeah, it'll be swamped to the dashboard by dark. You, um, expect trouble tonight? <laughs> I always expect trouble, Kitty. Yeah, I know. Matt, I heard something. Yeah? I heard Torp and a few of his men cut cards last night. So? I don't know who it came out for, but low man is supposed to kill you. Oh. Uh-huh. When? Tonight, I suppose. Why is Torp after you, Matt? Uh, Torp says he wants an open town, Kitty. But what he's really after is somebody who'll close down every game but his. Mm. Who's this, man? What? Rough-looking traveler headed this way. What? What? Well, I'll be. <laughs> Why, it's Zell Matlock. Matt Zell! Zell, you old... Badger, how are you? <laughs> well, it's been a long time. Hey, a long time. Man. Here, come on over here. Sit down. Sure. Uh, I'd like for you to meet Kitty. Kitty, this is Zell Matlock. This is Kitty. Uh, how I you know doing? you, ma'am. <laughs> Just rode into Dodge an hour ago. Yeah, it's your first time in the zone. Hey, would you like a beer? Huh? Don't mind. Good. I uh, aim to get drunk tonight, but before I got started, I thought I'd look up the peace officer and shoot him. I'd be sure to tangle with him before the night's out. I always figure it's safer to do it sober. So <laughs> he, he half means that, kid. So I asked around and found out the man's name is Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. I've seen it all now. Well, I hope you're not disappointed. I'll, so. I'll tell you, Miss Kitty, I knew Matt Dillon before he got civilized. Why, we had to tie his leg up to give him a haircut when he came to town. <laughs> Don't you believe a word that he says, kid. <laughs> ah, the wilder the coat, the better the horse, Matt. Mm-hmm. Well, you was all right. The only trouble with you was that fool honest streak you always had. <laughs> Are you rich now, Zell? Ah, nobody's rich on the Mexican border. Land of sunshine and pinna beans. Now, I hired out to a general over in Chihuahua three years ago. I lost 20 pounds and was lucky to get back at all. Well, haven't you learned to stay out of Mexico yet? No, I met the man he wanted me to shoot and turned out to be a better fellow than the general. So I told him I'd been hired to kill him and then rode for the border. The general lost three soldiers who tried to stop me from swimming the Rio Bravo. (laughs) Uh, You must be pretty handy with a gun, Zell. I'm just fair, ma'am. But when I take my gun out, I go right ahead and use it. Some people stop and think for half a second. Um, there's a roundup in Dodge tonight. Matt's handling it alone. Kitty, what the... Yeah, no, no, hold it, hold it, man. I heard about it. I heard all about it, and that's why I'm here. To say hello and uh, sign on for a night's pleasure. Give me a star, Matt. I've killed on the side of the law before. <laughs> I don't believe that in any way I... I don't want any killings here. No, I was joshing you, Matt. I know what you want. It's true. I was sheriff in Tascosa for six months. You what? Yeah, it's in the record. Well, they caught up with me there, but I 
Already done such a good job taming the place that the governor pardoned me. <laughs> I won't kill anybody tonight that don't need killing. All right, all right, I believe you so. But uh, I won't ask any man to come in when it's as rough as this roundup may be. Well, you didn't ask me. Any other objection? Well, uh, the men don't know you around here, so no telling how they'd take to a stranger. First night I ran to Ascosa, nobody knew me either. I'm not green at this business. Yeah, but man. it's my job. Why should you get mixed up in it? <clears throat> well, I I also heard somebody's planning a party for you tonight. Well, you did, huh? I've owed you something for a long time, Matt. Oh, that's got nothing to do with it. Right it has. You got no right to not let me pay it back a little. Now there's a chance to. <laughs> yeah, you're just as crazy as you ever were. <laughs> That's better. Well, come on, let's go find me a badge before it gets dark. <laughs> sure, nice to have met you, Miss Kitty. Well, good luck, Zell. I'll see you later, Matt. Yeah, sure. So long, Kitty. Sure been a long time coming to Dodge, Mr. Matlock. What do you mean, Chester? Well, I've heard Mr. Dillon mention you a lot, but the way he talked, I wasn't never sure you were still alive. <laughs> oh, well, I was never sure either, Chester. You know, Zell isn't the most cautious man I ever knew. You think being a U.S. Marshal isn't asking for an early grave, man? Oh, maybe. But at least it's a way to do some good before you die, whether folks think so or not. No, men like Torp, that's all. Oh, no, Chester. Even good men have got a strange twist that makes them suspect any man paid to handle the bad element. Hey, you just can't help thinking that some of its dirt is rubbed off on him. And I never thought about that before, Matt. Sure, how it was in Tascosa. They wanted me there, all right, but they wanted me to uh, keep my distance, too. It makes a man kind of lonely. Yeah. They just don't know what's good for them, that's all. Uh, Instead of a real lawman, they'd rather hire some killer with a lot of notches carved on his gun. Well, there are plenty of them around. You sure are. Bragging kind. I never did like a man who has to notch his gun to keep his courage up. Yeah. yeah. My goodness. Look yonder. Mm-hmm. The street's about full already and it isn't even dark yet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, give yeah. me a hand here, will you? We'll move Chester's couch away from the window oh, then. All right. There, that should do it. Yeah, you'll be safer here, Chester, in case somebody gets it in mind to shoot up the jail. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. I can watch both doors from here. Uh, just hand me my gun belt, if you will. Oh, yeah. There you are. Well, come on, Zell. Uh, Chester, I'll get somebody at the Dodge House to fetch up some supper, huh? Thank you, sir. And, and good luck, both of you. So long, Chester. I see you, Chester. Well, how are we working, man? Uh, I tell you, Sal, you take this uh, side of the street. Uh, I'm going up to the Dodge House, and then I'll be on the other side somewhere. All right. Oh, say, you mind if I go back later and get that Spencer carbine of yours? Make a mighty handy club if I don't have to use it any other way. <laughs> sure, it's yours, Sal. Who they got there? That fella on their shoulders. Oh, that's Mr. Hightower. He runs the printing press here. Shall, shall we stop it? Oh, no, no. They're just carrying him into the Longhorn to make him stand some drinks. Oh, They like Hightower. They won't hurt him. Well, I guess that sort of officially opens this here roundup, huh? Yeah, I guess it does. Well, I'll leave you here, Zell. Yeah, sure. Sure, man. And, uh, Zell, I, uh... I want to thank you for what you're doing tonight. I ain't done nothing yet, but I'll do plenty if someone shoots you in the back. (laughs) I can promise that. Well, I'll see you later. Sure, Matt. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, Sunday nights, you are cordially invited to escape via CBS Radio. Yes, every weekend for drama that will take you right out of this world, listen for Escape at the Star's Address. Also, tomorrow evening, CBS Radio brings you Lionel Barrymore on your Sunday night playhouse. Now, for the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs>
When I came out of the Dodge house, Front Street was so full that if anybody had been shot, the crowd would have carried him along like one of the living. I had a feeling that the word was out about Torp and his bunch cutting cards to see who'd make a try for me. And that the crowd knew it and was waiting for it. I stood for a while with my back against Summer's dry goods store. Then I left the street and cut down an alley, thinking to change my position with as much irregularity as possible. I was passing the back door of the Texas Trail when I heard the first shot of the night. I entered the saloon from the rear and made my way into the crowd. Yeah. It's all right, Marshal. There's no fight. It's not all right, Sam. I made a rule that there'd be no shooting for any reason. All right. Who fired that shot? Oh, it's outside. It was Torque, Marshal. He, he just took a shot at the moon, that's all. Yeah. All right, Torp, put the gun away and come over here. I'm bothering nobody, Marshal, excepting maybe you. Stand back, everybody. I said that's enough, Torp. No, it ain't, Dylan. This time I got the jump on you. You ain't pushing me no more. Torp's bullet just grazed my arm. Then I put one in his head and another in his chest. And at the same time, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a figure with a gun in each hand move out of the shadow of the alley and turn toward me on the boardwalk. And without really looking, I dropped him with one shot. And then I faced the crowd and waited for the next move. But for some reason, none came. Marshal? Yes, Summers. That uh, man you just shot, Marshal. Torp got what he deserved. Yes, I know. It's the other one that so I... So did he. Marshal, you'd better go take a look at that man. He's dying. Who is he? I don't know him, Marshal, but you do. What? He's wearing a star. No. No. Oh, so. So. Man. I think that did it. No, so. No. It's my fault. I crossed the street a while back. Left the carbine with Chester. It's no fault of yours. Matt? That old, who they, uh, old man. Uh, how, how is he? Oh. Oh. Oh, goodness. No use, Doc. Thanks. So I, I now listen, listen to me, Matt. You did right. The only thing you could do. It was my fault. I shouldn't have crossed over and come up behind you. Anyway, Matt, I ain't been living on my own time ever since that day you pulled me out of the mob in Almogordo. I never thanked you for that. Guess I never will now. Matt. So long. Well, I'll find someone to carry him over to your office, Matt. No. I'll carry him. <laughs> Dylan, what happened? I heard the shooting. Put a blanket on the floor there, Doc. Yeah, sure. Yeah, spread it out right here. He's dead, sir. Well, who shot him, sir? I shot him, Chester. I didn't know it was him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. It sounds like they're going to hoorah the town after all, Matt. Sure does. No. No, they're not. 
It's going to be kind of hard to stop now, isn't it, Matt? Maybe. You taking a shotgun, Mr. Dillon? Matt, why don't you just let them fight each other? What are you going to do? I'm going to close Front Street. You're going to close... Oh, no, what? The party's over in Dodge. Mr. Dillon, you can't do that. There'll be trouble if I don't. The mob's tasted blood now. They'll shoot you sure as I'm laying here. Will they? All right, I can't stop you, but I sure do wish I could go with you. Yeah, Matt, I'll go. Maybe if they see me, they won't be so quick. Thanks, but this isn't your job, either one of you, but thanks. Close up and turn out your lights. What? You heard me! Now listen to me! Front Street's closed! Now get out of here and go home, all of you! My home is in Texas, mister. If you ever had one. I ain't going home tonight. Not tonight, I ain't. Don't interfere, fella. You got no chips in this deal. I could buy in, mister. <laughs> Now I'll use this shotgun for what it was meant on the next man. Well? All right, Sam, close it up. Yes, sir. Streets closed. Put out your lights. Huh? You heard me. Lock the place up. I uh, know. I ain't going to do it. Now, don't tell me what you're going to do. Uh, all right, boys. We're closing up. That took care of the Texas Trail and the Longhorn. And I moved on through the Oasis and the Olifraganza. And then to the smaller bars that infested the outskirts of town. When I came back up Front Street, the crowd had thinned. Its fever broken. I'd left Torp's place for the last. Thinking to give his men a chance to get out of town before they faced me. There was a gambling hall on the same side of the street as the jail. And when I reached it and entered, there weren't more than a dozen men there. And most of them stepped quietly past me out into the street. What was left didn't seem to count for much. Looking for somebody, Marshal? You a friend of Torp's? Well, yes, I was. Why? Who else here worked for Torp? Everyone's gone, Marshal. They heard you were all riled up and they left. And you're alone. And still in bad company. I wouldn't ordinarily take that. Well, go ahead, mister. You're calling it. No. Not now. What's stopping you? No, if it's the shotgun... Now, does that make it easier for you? I haven't been looking for you, Marshal. You were in on the cut, weren't you? Torp's dead, Marshal. Isn't that enough? Torp! Mister, one of the best men I ever knew died tonight. And I killed him. I'm not a gunman, Marshal. You wouldn't be proud killing me. What does a man like you know about pride? Now, you get out of Dodge and you get out fast. But I don't... You want to die in this place right now? No. No, I'm leaving. All right, Hurry. The rest of the night, I walked the dark, empty street alone. And just before dawn, I got a spring wagon and loaded Zell onto it. A couple of hours later, I buried him out of the Arkansas in a little grove of cottonwoods. Maybe I should have put a marker on his grave. But I didn't. What I did instead, I did partly out of scorn for the kind of men Zell said have to notch their guns to keep their courage up. And partly as a kind 
of a cross that I'd bear from now on. So instead of a marker on his grave, I took out my gun and I cut a single notch on it. Smoke under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Boehner and Harry Bartell, with Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, and James Nusser. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen to CBS Radio for Spring Byington as December Bride. And say, after you hear December Bride tomorrow night, listen for the important announcement about its new night and time on CBS Radio. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. There's a saying in the West that a cowboy is a man with guts and a horse. This is the story of one. His name was Slim. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner... This is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had bought a horse in Cheyenne and was riding to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. I wanted a chance to really look at this grazing country and the thousands of heads of cattle dotting its plains. I rode north of the railroad tracks until the telegraph poles lining it were lost in a dusty haze. And I saw clouds, heavy and bronze, over the distant mountains. It was during the afternoon that I came upon the cowboy, a lean man of about 30, with a cigarette hanging from his lips. He was examining the right foreleg of his horse, and he looked up as I approached. Hello. Howdy. You need any help? Horse stepped in a gopher hole. Don't seem to be no spring, though. Ah. Uh, fine looking animal. He ain't a bad old buzzard head. Hey, you English? <laughs> yes. You a ranch man? No, no. A newspaper correspondent. Oh. Well, maybe if you was a ranch man, you'd be looking for a hand. Uh, I'm sorry. They don't make no never mind. I'm chassaying over to Laramie. They're going to get me a job on them new layouts I hear tells open up. I'm bound for Laramie myself. You. Mind if I ride with you? Well, I take it as real friendly. Quit it, you moon-eyed son of a gun. Hold still. You think we'll have rain? Eh, don't feel like it. Of course you can't tell with them clouds. I've been on the range and there ain't been nothing but blue up there. And wango, down she comes. Hail as big as your fist. I tell you, nature's a skittish beast. Ain't no how bridle-wise... Oh, incidentally, my name is Kendall. Slim. All right. Slim. Been in these parts long? Oh, a few weeks. I came down from Montana Territory by way of Deadwood. That's so. Yeah, here, Wild Bill Hickok got plugged a while back in Deadwood. Yeah. I was there when it happened. That's so. Mm. What happened to the feller that done it? McCall? Yeah, that was his name, Jack McCall. He... He was tried, 
The jury found him not guilty. That's so. Mm. Mm. Did you know him? No, just here. Oh. What do you write about in your newspaper? Well, I see people out here, their way of living. Kind of different in England, huh? <laughs> yes, it's quite different. Ain't no plains or mountains or rivers. Ain't nothing back east or in England like we got here. That's true. Don't figure how come a man want to live back here. Well, it's a different kind of country, a different kind of life. It's a... What? Didn't sound like no regular shooting. Oh, oh still horse, I'll mash your sight. Seems to come from the hills. Yeah. Reckon someone's in trouble. Let's go. A range of hills, low-lying, somber, about a mile to our north. It was from that direction we heard the shots. Slim's horse easily outdistanced mine, and by the time I reached the first slopes, the cowboy had disappeared into a canyon. matter with him? Looks like he's been locking horns with some Indians. I was just riding up to him when I fell down. There's half an arrow in him. Broke off. Now, take it easy, part. <coughs> Kendall, you better take his rifle. Keep an eye out. Yeah. No shells in him. Arapaho. Arapaho's got it. Where? Where? Where did they go? Up the canyon trail. Wagon horses. Clara. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad. He ain't gonna have no breakfast again forever. That's for sure. Well, what about the woman? Clara. I guess she's still alive. Though maybe she'd rather not be. Indians keep captured white women around. Sometimes for hostage. Sometimes for... Other thing. Well, do you think we'd have a chance of catching up with them? It might. Depends on how long a start they got and how many. I'd kind of like to bury him first. It ain't fitting for a man to lie out in the open after he's curled up. Well, but it'll take time. What about the woman? It won't go no better or worse with her for the time. Well, that ground's too hard for hand digging. I'm going to have to make a rock grave. Tell you what, though. You start on it. I'll work up the canyon a bit, see if I can find signs. Now, if you hear three shots, come a run it. I'll do the same for you. Right. We oh, may have some shells left for the Winchester. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something. Eight of them. You better keep the rifle here. So long. I began the task of burying the dead man. From letters and a homestead deed in his pockets, I found that his name was Theodore Belding. There was also a tintype of a young, rather pretty woman whom I gathered to be his wife, Clara. It took the better part of 45 minutes to complete the grave, and it wasn't until almost an hour later that Slim returned. Well, I found the trail, followed it away up. There was four Indians in the wagon. They cleared the wagon and left it burned. Took the horses, though, and the woman. What are our chances? Can you shoot? I'm fair. Well, I ain't done any trailing since five years back, but we ain't got nothing to lose. Be getting dark by and by. We'll keep going till light gives out. You know this country, Slim? Not much, but a man can read a lot of things from places he ain't been. Here. That's where they stopped the wagon, see? Oh, you mean those double wheel ruts? Yeah. Must have ambushed them from over there. And the feller fell here. See the blood spot? Guess he made things hot for him for a spell. Were you an Indian scout, Slim? Yeah, for a while. Worked with Custer. Oh? What do you think of him? For him, I got a can of cuss words and I best keep the lid on it. Yeah, we'll save our breath for breathing from here on. I want to be able to hear what there is to hear. Well, 
We went on up the canyon, Slim reading the ground, or, as he put it, following sign. For a mile or more, the trail was obvious, even to the most unpracticed eye, but after we passed the burned-out wagon, it became more difficult to follow. For another hour, we rode in silence. The sun was beginning to set. A cool breeze was sweeping down the canyon. Who now? You hear that? Could mean Indians made a camp. Those crows ain't flying. Figure they're sitting in the trees waiting for a handout. Uh, unless they're feeding on carrion. It wouldn't be corn if there were. Sounds as if they're in those trees. See, you just over the rise? Don't seem smart enough for Indians to make a camp this early. Or oh, they know we're following and they're waiting for us. Now, shut your mouth, you glandered, spavin coyote. Oh, smells them. Now, we better tie the critters up. All right. Pull down that injured rubber neck of yours. Pale pink wall eyed son of a gun. I'll skin you alive. Did you think that slim? That it might be an idea to work our way through the trees instead of along the canyon wall, huh? I sure do. That old sun's right behind us. We make awful pretty targets. Keep in the shadows as much as you can. We'll just figure they got no weapons, except in bow and arrow. That gives us a mighty advantage. You all set? Yes. Come on, then. And watch out for twigs and dry leaves. Walk soft. Ahead of us, through the trees and shrubs, lay the brow of the rise. We made our way upward until we were within ten yards of the top. That's when I saw a glint in the sunlight and a trickle of sand moving down the slope toward us. Get down! In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Does that sound go with this music? Sure it does, when it's the sound of the shutters coming off the summer place in the woods, in the mountains, or at the shore. Only five more days from now, all America opens up the summer place as we swing into the three-day Memorial Day weekend, the first great outdoor holiday of the year. But first, what does your summer place need? In the refrigerator, on the kitchen shelves, the bathroom shelves, round the grill. Check now. Make a list now. Buy at your grocer's, your druggist, your hardware store. Then you'll be all set for that great big three-day weekend. And say, don't forget to have your portable radio checked and ready. Wherever you spend your happy holiday, there's a CBS radio network station to keep you posted on the weather and the news. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. Phew. You got good eyes, Kendall. I sure could feel the sawdust in my beard that time. Where are they? Well, one of them's between the boulders. A little to the right of the clump of alders. There, you can see the rifle sight. Want to try a shot with a Winchester? No, not yet. Only eight shells. We better save them. How many rounds you got for your gun? About 20. I got near the same. Say 50 rounds between guns and rifle. Not bad if it don't take too long. How many you figure we're shooting? Two, from the sound of it. Sharps repeaters, that's for sure. Well, we sure cut a big gut that time. Seems to me the only thing to do now is to wait until it's dark. There's no other way to get at them without being seen. I'm wondering what our chances are after dark. We ain't in the best position. Might be we ought to pull back down canyon, wait for morning before we pick up the trail. What about the woman? Well, if she's still alive, she knows there's help around. Nice man! Come out from trees. We make medicine. <laughs> Here's the Indian couldn't drive nails in a snowbank. He's trying to draw a fire. Locate us. Well, let him. You want to make medicine, Siwash? You come down here. came from the left, higher up. One of them must be in a tree. I think I can see him. Yeah, there's enough sticking out. No, gone now. Not on this side. Now there's one good Indian. Where'd you learn to shoot like that, mister? Odd places. Uh, I'm hit. Where? Oh, I'm hit on the arm. Oh, man, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Let me see now, Slim. Oh, well, 
It ain't the gun hand, anyhow. Can you, can you bind it up? Yes. No. I keep down now. White man! You want white woman? We talk. Maybe you pay gold to her back. Come down here. We'll talk. How does it feel now, Smith? Like a brand in irons inside. Well, uh, there's not too much bleeding, though. That's something. Sure wish we had more cover. I feel naked as a painted cat laying out right, here. man. We come down top. You shoot, woman die. What do you think? We might have them buffaloed. Let them come. But watch them for tricks. They got a hundred. Come down. We'll hold our fire. Only one of them. Now, if he ain't a setting duck against that sky... Well, there's two more, though. They must be with the woman. Yeah, maybe. Keep your eyes peeled. White man has been wounded. Huh. Indian has been killed? We are many. You are two. Climb down, Siwash. There were four of you, now there's three. I have Little Knife, chief of the Arapaho. Your Little Knife, a renegade dog who steals women. Little Knife, not renegade. Fight with Crazy Horse. Little Knife, not steal woman. Take woman. Like white man, take Little Knife land. Maybe kill white woman. Like white man kill Indian woman and child. The war is over. There's no more killing on either side. White man say war is finished. Not Indian. Quit your coyote around the rim, Indian. What about the woman? You give me your guns, rifle, and gold. I give her to you. I'll see you hung up to dry first. Not our guns or rifles, but perhaps some gold. How much? How much you got? A hundred dollars? Not enough. That's all there is. All guns and hundred dollars. No. I go back. Maybe you hear a woman die. Then you pay. Maybe you don't go back, Siwash. What about that? Like all white men. Break word of truce. You speak of honor and murder with the same breath? We can kill you all. We wait for night. Then we kill. I got a finger it's itching right now to wait for nothing. Little knife not afraid to die. Little knife. You... You took the belongings in the white man's wagon. Return the woman and we let you keep it all. That and a hundred dollars in gold. You'll let little knife keep what he already has. Not a trade. Listen, you double distilled son of a gun. I seen a fair-sized anthill down the canyon away. How'd you like to be staked out? I make good offer. Woman for guns and hundred dollars. You say no? I go back now. Soon as the night. Then we take your guns and the gold. The Indian turned and moved back up the slope. For a moment I had an uncontrollable desire to shoot. Then I thought of the woman, of what would happen to her. I lowered the rifle. We shifted our positions a few yards to the right, and we lay there, waiting, and the darkness settled into the canyon. Funny thing. Huh? What? We ain't heard no sound from the woman. Yeah, I was thinking that myself. Wonder if she's all right. Should be better in three-quarter moon tonight. Coming up in a while. They gonna try something. It'll be afore the moon. Slim, I think we'd better sit back to back in case they circle around us. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking. Wish I had me a drink of red eye right now. I know a place in Dodge. I tell you, Kendall, a shot of that tornado juice would draw a blood blister and a raw hide boot. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Shucks, that ain't nothing. Tell her what runs the saloon. He serves a free snake with every drink. Shh. Shh. Ah! That ain't what you think. 
It ain't no woman. That's an Indian. I know. I heard him before. They want us to think it's her. Are you sure? I'll show you. Hey, you crow bait dogs. Which one of you's a squaw? See what I mean? Yes. One thing I don't understand. What's that? Why do they stay here? Why not ride off with the woman? Yeah, I figure there's two reasons. First, Little Knives probably left the reservation. He ain't got no particular place to go. Second, they want our guns. Indian will do a lot of fool things to get hold of a gun. Come to think of it, there's... There's something else. Oh? Yeah. Maybe they're low on bullets. You reckon? Yeah. It's quite possible. That's why they haven't attacked. Sure. Sure, they're using sharps for Peters. That feller's Winchester ain't the same caliber. So whatever shells they picked up in the wagon ain't worth a thing. In which case, we don't wait for them to attack us. Oh, uh, I know what you're getting at, but it won't work. Well, why not? I wouldn't be no good. Not with his busted wing. Slim, you stay here. Cover me with the rifle. Uh-uh. No, he'll hear you before you get ten feet up the rise. Slim, I'll admit that I'm a comparative greenhorn in your territory, but I've had the dubious pleasure of slitting a number of throats under similar circumstances in India. Those chaps didn't hear me. I'll take my chances with these Arapaho. Are you... you going to use a knife? Oh, if I have to, yes. <laughs> you sure are a funny kind of Englishman. Here, take your rifle. Mister, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> So do I. I crawled out of the hollow and inched my way up the slope. I had seen the flash of the Indian's rifle and knew his approximate location. In the direction I was taking, I planned to reach the top of the hill some yards from where I had last seen him. It was slow. Slow. Then as I raised my head over the summit, I saw the great orange glow of the rising moon... And silhouetted against it, the crouching form of an Indian half turned from me behind a boulder. I drew out my knife. <laughs> he died without a sound. Then I made out Little Knife and the remaining Indian. They were a few feet away, standing over a gagged and bound body. And in the constantly growing moonlight, I saw the chief bend down, the glitter of steel in his hand. This time I knew it would be a woman's scream I was going to hear. Little knife! Huh? Hey, look. Hey, look. It's all right, Slim. She's alive. She's all right. I cut the ropes, loosened the gag from the woman's mouth, and for a long moment she only looked at me. Then she began to cry. I carried her down the slope to where Slim was waiting. Then I went back to get the Indian horses and the things which had belonged to Belding and his wife. After that, Slim and I took her to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Moyles as Slim and Lawrence Dobkin as Little Knife. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful. 
and a little lonely. Take good care of him for you. My gracious, Mr. Dillon, look at that clutch of keys. He sure does use a lot more than we do back home. Yeah. Well, they always did things up fancy in Wichita. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah. There's a lot of people who wouldn't agree with him. Hey, can I buy you two a drink? Well, say, now, that's mighty nice. No, thanks, Tom. Not right now. I got half the trail dust from here to Dodge on me. What I need is a bath and some sleep. I'm heading for the hotel. Sure, Matt. I'll catch up with you before you head back. Come to think of it, I guess I could stand and take a bath, too. <laughs> Come to think of it, you could. Uh, I'll see you at the trial tomorrow. Now, good night, Tom. Good night, night, night boys. Well, I guess you're right about going to the hotel, Mr. Dillon. I sure will be proud to get these boots off. Yeah, it's been a long ride. Seems to me like they'd ought to pay extra for it, too. For what? Well, for doing all that traveling harness to a prisoner. You sure don't get a chance to enjoy the countryside much. <laughs> there isn't much countryside around here to enjoy. Well, that's true. Excuse but even me, so, gentlemen. Mr. You, uh, want to talk to me? I believe so, sir. I believe so. If I'm not mistaken, you're the marshal from Dodge City. You're not mistaken. Matt Dillon, what can I do for you? I'm pleased to hear you offer your services, Marshal. I keep writing the folks back home, and some Yankees are gentlemen, but I swear I don't think they believe it. Look, mister, you're keeping me from a hot bath. You've got something on your mind. You speak it out, huh? My name's Clayt Morley. At your service. Well, Mr. Dillon, ain't that those... I thought you'd recognize the name. I just brought a man named Reed Morley in from Dodge. Are you related? He's my brother, Marshal, my younger brother. Uh Oh, Well, he's in bad trouble. I'm bound to agree with that. I left him at the jail, Marley, if you want to see him. Oh, I'm not wanting to see him, Marshal, not tonight. I want you to get him released for me. The boy's being held for murder. Brother Reed didn't do that thing. I didn't arrest him without a reason. Nobody with the name of Marley would kill a woman, Marshal. Your brother will be tried. He'll have his say. You'll be testifying, won't you? Yeah, I'll be testifying. Your words could have a powerful effect, one way or another. I'll be telling what I know. I think maybe you ought to know something else, Marshal. What's that? I think maybe you ought to know that if this stain on the family name isn't removed, if Brother Reed doesn't walk out of that courthouse a free man, you won't live to see him hung, Marshal Dillon. What? Don't threaten me, Morley. Why, I'm not threatening you, Marshal. This is just a simple appeal to your sense of justice and honor, that's all. A sense with which I know you are highly endowed. Good evening, gentlemen. Well, now, just what did you think of that? Not much, Chester. Come on, let's get some sleep. place we're staying at ain't one bit better than a Dodge house. Not much to choose from, I guess. And that smart alecky clerk don't have no right to go putting on air, so... He been bothering you? Oh, well, he ain't done nothing, but he acts like anybody from Dodge City come right out of a hole in the prairie. <laughs> he must have seen us when we came in last night. Well, yes, I know, but I got cleaned up as nice as I could. Never mind, Chester. Just eat your dinner. And and that's nothing, Mr. Dillon. This piece of beefsteak just ain't worth the fat to fry it in. Oh? You haven't had much trouble eating it. Well, no, sir. I was hungry. But I'll tell you something. Back at Delmonico's, they really know how to fry up a piece of meat. That's not the way you talk back in Dodge, Chester. Yes, sir, and I've been thinking about that, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I guess it must be all this traveling around the country that we do. Up to Larned, over to Hayes City, all the way here to Wichita. Now, what about it? 
Well, it just kind of teaches a fellow about things in the world. Makes him really appreciate a place like Dodge City. Oh, eat up, Chester, and let's get out of here. Huh? I trust you gentlemen are enjoying your dinner. Well, if we was, we ain't now. You, uh, got something else on your mind, Morley? Why, no, Marshal, nothing new. Just my continued interest in your health and welfare. Well, don't worry about it. I'm just hoping that you'll worry about it, Marshal. I told you not to get in my way. Well, now, I wouldn't want to. This is just a, a friendly reminder, Marshal, that I'm still in town. That I'll be here until after the trial is over tomorrow. You listen to me, Marley. I'll be listening tomorrow at the trial. And I just know that judge is going to set Brother Reed free. I, I feel it in my bones. He'll set him free if he thinks he's innocent, Marley. That's the only way. Oh, I know that, Marshal. I know it just like I know that Brother Reed couldn't have done that terrible thing. Just like I know that you want to go on living. Marley. I'm through warning you. Now, you stay out of my sight starting right now. I'll see you at the trial. Good day, gentlemen. I swear he's acting clear crazy about all this. It ain't your fault if that boy gets himself hung. No, it isn't, Chester, but Morley thinks it is. That's enough for him. Well, it don't have to be enough for you, Mr. Dillon. And I hope you're right, Chester. Sorry you made the trip for nothing, Matt. Yeah. Well... Old Bowers never has been a hanging judge. I thought this case would hold up, though. I was sure the boy was guilty. I don't think my testimony was much help to you. You couldn't help that, Matt. You weren't even in on it till a week after the murder. All you did was make the arrest when we asked you to. Yeah. And he didn't have any evidence on it. I hope he didn't do it. The law says he didn't. That's all we have to worry about. There's still a woman's death unanswered for it. Sure there is. We meet again, Marshal. Stand aside, Molly. Well, now, that's not very manly of you, pushing aside a man who's come to thank you. I don't want any thanks from you. But you got thanks coming to you, Marshal Dillon. Brother Reed's a free man. And in the name of the family, I want you to know that we're grateful. Listen here, Morley. I didn't do anything for you or for your brother or for your family. That was very nice testimony, Marshal. Nothing incriminating in it at all. Yes, sir. We are all grateful. I want you to get something straight. What I told the court was just exactly what I know about this case. No more, no less. You didn't influence me, and I didn't try to influence the verdict in any way. Of course not, Marshal. Of course not. We're just glad to see that you believe in Brother Reed's innocence like we do. I don't. What? I don't believe in your brother's innocence or his guilt any more than I did before, but the judge says he's not guilty, so that's all there is to it. Now, you get out of my way. I don't take kindly... I'm through listening to what you take kindly... Now, Marsha... And if you know what's good for you... He'll stay out of my sight. Want me to lock him up, Matt? For disturbing the peace? You do what you want, Tom. It's your town. But I'd just let him lie there. It may do something for his family honor. I guess you're right, Sam. Better order some more glasses. I swear, it seems I just got some now. <laughs> Customers ain't very gentle with them, Kitty. That's a fact. Customers aren't too gentle with anything around here. Oh, hello, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Sam. Hello, Marshal. You want to take your poison standing up or sitting down? Well, I think I'll sit down, Kitty. Yeah, pour a couple of beers, will you, Sam? Oh, sure thing. Hey, how was the trip to Wichita, Marshal? Oh, not too bad, Sam. A little dusty's all. Here you are. Thanks, Sam. 
You want to carry him to the table, Nick? Sure, Kitty. You look tired, man. Well, I spent the day helping Joe Hatch break a string of cow ponies. Those horses are bigger than I am. <laughs> and younger, too. Yeah, they sure are. Well, anything been going on around here, Kitty? No, been pretty quiet, man. That's good. I'd like an empty jail tonight. Well, there is one thing that I've been kind of wondering about. No? What's that? Well, it's that Reed Morley. Uh, the boy I took to Wichita? No, he's back. You know, I'd have bet my last dollar that he wouldn't want to come back here. He didn't. What do you mean? His brother, that Clayt. Do you know him? Yeah, we've run into each other. Well, Clayt's insisting that Reed come back here to live. How do you know all this, Kitty? Well, the boy spends most of his time in here drinking, Matt. He says Clayt's making him stay in Dodge. Does he say Why? Well, Reed says he has to stay here until folks stop talking about the killing and that woman until everybody's convinced of his innocence. For the family honor, huh? Yeah. How did you know? Oh, I heard about it somewhere. Well, Kitty, we better enjoy the quiet around here while we can. What do you mean, Matt? It's my guess that either that boy or his brother is going to blow up. And I don't know which would be the worse. Here you are, Mr. Dillon. Burning good and bright now. Thanks, Chester. I'm so damn sorry it fizzled out on you that way. I could have swore I put coral oil in it just yesterday. No, that's all right, Chester. Uh, no, sir, it ain't all right at all. Call it order to do the job he's being paid for, to my way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, there's some jobs that's got just too many little details in them for a man to keep up with proper and all. Yeah. You know, like sleeping out, redding up, making coffee and fetching mail, all that stuff sometimes just gets to be too much of a Chester, sure. Chester, but... what are you muttering about? I, I, I was just saying, Mr. Dillon, that there's an awful lot for a body to do around here, keeping up the office and all. Oh? You think there's too much work to do, do you? Well, I was just kindly thinking that... You think that... I should hire a younger man, maybe, you, oh, huh? No, no, sir, Mr. Dillon, indeed not. It's, it's just then that... why don't you shut up and let me read through these papers, please? Yes, sir. Chester, quit that rattle, and will you settle down someplace? It ain't me, Mr. Dillon. I am not doing nothing at all. All right, Chester. I guess it was the wind. No, sir, Mr. Dillon, that ain't the wind. Is somebody working the door that way? We'll see who it is. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, I land, Mr. Dillon. Somebody laying there. Look. What? Yeah. He's hurt bad. Here, tell me, get him in, Chester. Yes, sir. I will. Oh, my land. Easy. Easy now. Hey, we'll put him down on the cot here. Well, Mr. Dillon, it's Reed Morley. What do you suppose? I don't know, Chester. From the looks of him, he's not going to be able to tell us for a while, either. Now, go get Doc. Tell you, Matt, that's about as bad a beating as a man can take. Yeah. Uh, you 
going to be all right, Doc? Oh, yes, I think so, but he, he's going to be sore for a while. Awful sore. <laughs> hey, look, Doc. Looks like he's about to come, too. <laughs> I shouldn't wonder with all that water I splashed on him. There we are. That'll do. I won't be needing any more hot water, Chester. You can take the rest of these things out. Okay, Doc. Mm. Can he stay here for the night, Matt? He should be able to limp away by morning. Oh, yeah, Doc, sure. Uh, can I talk to him? Oh, talk shouldn't hurt him. Just don't go slapping him on the back, though. Okay, and I'm going to go back to the office. I'll try not to have any more riots tonight, will you, Matt? I'm short on sleep. I'll try, Doc. Matt. Yeah, Doc. You better hope that this fellow was the loser in that fight. Because if he wasn't, the other man is sure to be dead. Thanks, Doc. Good night. Good night. Reed? You, you better lock that door. You're all right, Reed. Just settle down. You'll be after me. Oh? Who'll be after you? You've got to protect me, Marshal. Now, come on, speak up. Who's after you? Clayton. Clayton? Your brother? He's going to kill me. you got to stop it, Marshal. Well, what happened? He beat me. And he says he's going to kill me in the morning. He'll do it too, Marshal. Now, you got to stop him. He was trying to save your neck back in Wichita. Yeah. He found out. Well, what did he find out? About that woman. Oh. Uh, you killed her, huh? Didn't want to tell him, Marshal. I bet you didn't. I was drinking. I ain't been able to do nothing but keep on drinking since I got back to Dodge. Every place I go, I see your face. Except when I got drunk enough. And Clyde was making you stay here? Yeah, Marshal. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to. I, I wanted to go anywhere, anywhere else. That's what happened tonight. Go on. I was trying to get him to say I could go away. Just move on. He was being bullheaded the way he's always been. Going on about the family name the way he does. Well, I wanted to shut him up about it. So you told him? Yeah. Yeah, I told him. I thought he'd throw me out, tell me never to come back. That's what I wanted. Looks like he did a pretty good job of it. Well, he's not finished, Marshal. He, he's coming after me. Now, you got to protect me. Now, that's where you're wrong. But, now, what do you mean? I don't have to protect you. But you don't understand, Marshal. He's crazy. He'll kill me. Now, the law's got to take care of the me. The law tried to take care of you once. Yeah, but I was acquitted. I'm all square on that, ain't I, Marshal? Yeah. All you got to worry about now is the family name. Now, you can stay here tonight, but that's all. <laughs> Morning, Chester. I land that Reed Morley back there, sure sleeping like he was dead. He ain't showing no sign of moving at all. He's sleeping off a bad beating. Oh, say, did you mean to leave that cell door open that way? Yeah, I meant it. He isn't a prisoner, Chester. No, I can't think of it. I guess he ain't at that. <laughs> funny thing, ain't it, Mr. Dillon? No, what's so funny? Well, the, the law can't touch a man again after it's tried him, even if he does turn out to be guilty of sin. Now, the law's stood up for a long time, Chester. I guess it knows what it's doing. Well, it still don't make no sense to me. Oh, uh, you be needing me for a little bit, Mr. Dillon? No, Chester. You can go ahead and eat. All right, sir. Ain't you coming? No, not yet. Well, all right, I won't... Oh, say, uh, you want me to close the door into the back? No, oh, never mind, Chester. I'll do it. All right, sir.
Marshal Dillon? Uh, hello, Marley. This is not an easy call for me to make. No, I guess not. I want you to know, though, Marshal, when a Marley makes a mistake, he admits it. I want to apologize to you and to the law. That's a little late for that. I know that, Marshal. I found out last night my brother did kill that woman. That's too late, too. He can't be tried again. No, Marshal. It isn't too late. I mean to see justice done, even if the law was unable to do it. Just how do you intend to do that? I will take care of my brother, Marshal. For the honor of the family. All right, you take care of him, just so you keep him away from me. Oh, he'll be away from everybody, Marshal. What do you mean? He'll be dead. Now, listen here, Morley. I don't blame you for wanting to skin him alive. I don't blame you for beating him the way you did. I got no mind to protect him, but I can't stand still for a killing. You better understand that. Did you just mention a beating? How did you know about that? I saw him. He's here, isn't he? He came to you for help. I should have known. Yeah, Clayton, he's here. I didn't expect you to hide a killer, Marshal. Stay out of there, Clay. I'm not hiding. Not him. anymore, you're not. Clay, no. No. You're a fool, Morley. You've killed him. Had to be done, Marshal. It was a matter of honor. The law will call it murder. I'm locking you up, Morley. You saying I'll stay in trial? And this time the court will make it stick. I won't hang, Marshal. There's never been a Morley hung. Don't be a fool, Morley. Drop your... Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, I heard them shots. I would... Oh, my gracious, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. They both dead? Yeah. It's like he was saying... The Morley is never hung. It's a matter of family honor. with Poncho and me on this exciting adventure which we have called Silverton Swindle. In the 1870s, Silverton, Colorado was a bustling little village. Silver had been discovered in its vicinity and many of the drifters, gamblers, and gunmen on the frontier headed for the new silver strike. Early one morning, a wagon and team carried two of the shrewdest of these outlaws toward town. Look yonder, Vance Perego. Let your eyes feast upon the busy activity of the thriving little metropolis. Yeah, things are sure humming in Silverton, Dandy. That town's ripe for a neat swindle. What setup are we going to use? Such a momentous decision requires momentary concentration. We'll have to split up and go into town separately, like always. I'll ride that saddle horse we got tied behind the wagon. Naturally. Now to ponder the proper method of fleecing the sheep. Well, how about the diamond ring, Swindle? I think that, Vance, my boy, that would necessitate our vacating this fair city with a degree of promptness. And since the silver strike, an odor of great opportunity emanates from Silverton. Besides, we used the diamond ring, Swindle, back in Denver. Somebody may know about it. Yeah, that's right, Dandy. Well, what Swindle are we going to use, Mastermind? Why not the steel helmet worn by Hernando Cortez when he invaded Mexico? What helmet are you talking about? The one we got from that opera company which went broke and was stranded in St. Louis. Oh, yeah. The one with the Spanish writing on it. Well, what do we do with it? I will approach the local yokel of a merchant and explain that due to a temporary lack of funds, I am willing to part with one of my most valued treasures, the helmet 
worn by Cortez. Now, look, Dandy, even your gilt edge blabbing isn't going to convince him to buy it. I have no intention he should. My objective is to have him display that valuable piece of merchandise for a possible sale. Then what? I will inform the little pigeon that we will share and share alike in whatever profit he receives from the sale over my original investment of uh, $1,000. Oh, I begin to see how the key fits the lock. I'd go to the storekeeper and offer him $2,000 for the helmet. $3,000. Well, $3,000. For a hunk of iron that cost us $2. The consummate greed of the yokel will prove to be his undoing. He will pay me the thousand himself, so he will not have to split his anticipated profits. <laughs> He'll be a mite surprised when he finds out I'm not going to buy it. How sad a commentary on human nature. You know, Vance, actually we are benefactors to mankind. We'll be teaching him a lesson he richly deserves and sorely needs. And we'll pocket a thousand beautiful dollars. <laughs> Silverton, Cisco? Si, Pancho, it is. I want to stop at the general store for some ammunition. Oh, all right. Pancho, go with you. There's a store over there, no? Si. Oh, they have a... Oh, oh hold on. Oh, hold on. Since the silver strike, the population of this town must have tripled itself. Si, they come from all over just to dig in the ground. Oh, <laughs> they're local. Well, their little store certainly has a lot of merchandise. Si, with all these people here, they got to carry a lot of different things. Your easy-going, shipless ways will be the ruin of us yet. But, but no, no. Yeah. Oh, oh, that senor and senora, they got to be married. No buts about it, Josiah. Now, you tend to your own business and tend to those customers. Yes, but no, no. Buenos dias, senora, senora. Hey, buenos dias, senor. Howdy. My husband here will sell you anything you want to buy. You remember what I told you, Josiah. Uh, I have to do everything around here. Tent the stock, and take care of the orders, do the cook, and I'll buy the every pan to them ever will know. Wow, that senora like a Texas tornado. Pancho, I need a box of forty-five caliber ammunition, senor. Uh, what kind of ammunition, mister? Forty-five caliber, senor. Oh, yeah, now, let me see. It should be... Oh, now, where was it last? Perhaps under the counter, senor. Oh, yeah, that's you. How do you know? Oh, hey, here, here you are. How much do I owe you, Senor? Uh, uh, uh... Gittledock. Name is Josiah Gittledock. I can't charge these outlandish prices, but don't you've got Mark? Five dollars for a box of ammunition? You can't charge these folks so much just because they're over a barrel and can't get the stuff nowhere else. Well, is that what you and the Senor are arguing about? Pancho, that is none of your business. Do not ask us questions. Oh, but Cisco, this Senor, he a good hombre. Why don't you like to do what Cisco always do and help him with his problems? No, I'm afraid there ain't no help for me, Cisco. But I sure do like talking to Pancho. You see, I don't get much chance to talk when Bedonia's around. Si, si, Senor Gilgal. Pancho, know how you feel? What all the trouble's about? Well, a nice eastern feller come in here with that fine steel helmet that they're laying on the counter there, see? Oh, that one. Well, that is the kind worn by the conquistadores when they first landed on this continent. Oh, that right. Pancho sent them back in Arizona at the mission. Well, well, you know, that dude Easterner said this is the one worn by Cortez himself during the invasion of Mexico. Oh, is that for really truth? Yeah, Pancho, that's what he said. And he told me if I could sell a helmet, we'd split the profit for anything I got over what it cost him. Now, I'm doing that there fellow a favor, and we stand a chance to make a fair and honest profit. Now, don't you think, but don't you could see that? Well, I should think so, senor. Well, instead, she tears into me for cluttering up a store of junk. Says nobody'd be fool enough to pay a thousand dollars for that silly contraption. Josiah! Josiah, Gildas! Uh, uh, Ain't you finished waiting on them customers yet? Uh, yes, Bedonia, I am. Uh, thank you very much for your purchase, sir. But I did not pay you yet, senor. How much for the cartridges? Uh, one dollar. <laughs> one dollar? The price on that box is plainly marked, and it says five dollars, as any fool can see. I can't even trust you to sell a simple thing like that. Just look what happens when I ain't here. 
Five dollars is a lot for that box of ammunition, senora. That's my price. Take it or leave it, mister. I ain't standing behind this counter for my help. Yeah, but, but don't you? We make a fair profit selling it for a dollar. You shut your trap, Josiah. Standing there gabbing about that fool helmet. Instead of collecting the money like you'd ought to. Oh, that is very fine helmet, senor. He'd like the helmets of the conquistadores. Pon to see back any missions. He, you are Cisco. Cisco tell you. Cisco? The Cisco kid? See, si, senor. Get on that. I might have known this worthless husband of mine would take up one of the worst saddle traps in the territory. Mother and me, Cisco, the senora, take that shotgun from the wall. <laughs> Momento, senora. What do you think you are doing? I've heard about the kind of bandit the Cisco kid is. And I'm warning you, turn right around and march out of here before I let go with both barrels of this shotgun. We don't want your kind or your trade around here. And if you come back again, I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you and I'll kill you. Well, you look positively prosperous, Vance, my boy. <laughs> uh, wait until you beat Mr. Josiah Gibson. The naive little lamb pleads to be fleeced. Uh, we'll see. We shouldn't be together, Dandy. That's a store across the street there. Among all these people, there's slight chance we'll be noticed, Vance. However, I'll await your successful return down the street so we won't be seen together. Good luck. Trying to keep this store going. Well, thanks, I get for it. Are you any help to me, Josiah Gildock? No, but don't you. Well, wait on the customer. We'll finish this later. Yes, but don't you. Uh, you want to buy something, mister? Josiah Gildock. A hundred times I've told you that's not the way. Especially to a gent like him. Uh, what do you want to buy, mister? Uh, uh, sir? Uh, my name is Vince Vertigo, ma'am. I'm from St. Louis. I'm interested in antiques. Objects of art. Oh, we got nothing like that around here, Mr. Borrego. Oh, I can sell you a side of salt pork or a barrel of flour, but we got nothing like that. Oh, wait just a minute, but don't you? What about that helmet? Oh, nonsense, Josiah. This gentleman's an antique collector, not a junk collector. Uh, what helmet? Uh, may I see it, please? Uh, over this way. Here it is. Hmm. Well, yes. An excellent example of the type worn by the conquistadores during the invasion of Mexico. Uh, that, that's right, mister. That, that's the helmet worn by Cortez himself. Now, that might very well be. The maker of helmets worn by these Spanish explorers is a name well known to us art dealers. Oh, the, the name is inside, mister. Here, go ahead, look. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Antonio Gonzalez. Well, this is it. Mr. Gildock, I'm a man of prompt action. I don't want to quibble about the price. I'll give you $3,000 for this helmet. $3,000? That's what I said, $3,000. Well, mister, you made a deal. But, but, but don't you, Mr. Van Swearingen said... I don't want to hear another word out of you, Josiah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to kind of polish that helmet up for That'll you. be fine. I have a bank draft in my wand. I'll have to cash it to pay you. I'll be uh, back this afternoon. Well, you do that, Mr. Brago. It'll be ready and waiting. How did you fare? Let's get out of here. They'll see us from the store. Not the chance, unless they walk out on the street and they're too busy figuring a way to make me accept a thousand dollars, aren't they? Yeah, they are. What's the matter, Vance? Why did you stop? Those two hombres riding down the street. What about them? The one in black on the big horse, that's a Cisco kid. I owe him for running me out of Santa Fe. Keep that gun in your holster, Vance. You can't shoot him down here in the street. I can if you and I pretend to have an argument. When I kill Cisco, it'll be an accident. I'll say it was really aiming at you. But he's liable to get you first. Not if you go for your gun when Cisco gets close to it. That'll draw his attention and leave me free to put a bullet through his head. I'll be in the clear, and he'll be dead. Look, Cisco, from starting down the street. Pancho, that big hombre, we know him. Si, Cisco, he's the one you run out of Santa Fe when he tried to cheat the store owner back there. Look, what a coyote's name? Vance Borrego. Oh, si, si. He's trying to prod that little hombre into a gunfight. I'm going to take a hand, Pancho. Oh, there, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sir, for that insult you have paid me, you will pay him with your life. For the little hombre, go for his gun, si. 
Oh, bueno, you should have gone out of the little one's hands, Cisco. Oh, look out, the man. Yeah, you try, Gus, will it work, man? Yeah. Yeah. You were lucky to shoot the gun from my hand, too, Cisco. Yeah. It's a surprise, Cisco. Uh-huh. I'm going to finish it, my Cisco. But I started with my gun. You. Sorry for the surprise, you weasel. Up on your feet. Yeah. You'll have to remember. Yeah. You'll never try and draw it out again. Yeah. You'll get a beating. Much worse than this. Yeah. Cisco, you should have used your gun to kill me. You had a chance. And that's what I'm going to do to you when I get the chance. And I will. There it is, dear lady. The bill of sale for the helmet of Cortez. Made out to Mrs. Bedonia Gittelbach and signed, sealed, and delivered by yours truly, Dandy Van Swellen. Here's your thousand dollars, Mr. Van Swearingen. Money all there? To the last Santi, Mrs. Gittleback. You are now the sole owner of that fine helmet. <laughs> well, now that it's mine, I don't mind telling you. I outfoxed you on a business deal. <laughs> Why? Why, what do you mean, dear lady? I already got a customer for this helmet. He's going to pay me $3,000 for it. <laughs> now, that ain't fair, but don't you? By rights, half the profits belong to you, Mr. Van Swearing. No, 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 Mr. Gittledock. Your wife and I transacted a legitimate piece of business. <laughs> I'm afraid she's quite right. She did outsmart me. <laughs> well, I must mm. wend my way elsewhere. I'm sure in the future we'll both stop and cogitate on this momentous event that has occurred this day. I bid you a fond a farewell. Yeah, that's how a real gentleman acts, Josiah. And you still hadn't ought to take advantage of him, but don't you? I was able to scrimp up the thousand dollars to pay him because of my way of doing business, not yours. If I'd listened to you, we'd be in the poorhouse the rest of our lives. Senor, it's Senor Gildock. I have to tell you something that may be of great importance to you. Stand where you are, Cisco kid. Well, the senora go for the shotgun again, Cisco. Giving you one last chance to listen. For your own sake, senor. And I'm giving you one last chance to get out of here for your own sake. Now get, before I blast you both out of your books. <laughs> Those mavericks, they not try nothing yet. I wonder what kind of deal they made with Senor Josiah about that helmet. Oh, it seems they're working together, just like when they tried to dry gold shoe. Perhaps you can find out something from Senor Josiah. There he is in front of his store. Oh, see that boy? What is this, Senor Josiah? What is this, Senor? Oh, I'd sure appreciate it if you'd stop a minute. I'd like to have a word with you. Oh, see, Senor. How do you have a word? Oh, 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 hold on. Uh, what can we do for you, Senor? <laughs> See, we we like to help you. Uh, I've been trying to get out to your camp all week, but but no, you wouldn't let me go. Cisco, we've been swindled. You have, senor? The Spanish helmet? Well, yeah. That... No, I ain't going to tell you. I'm going to make her do it herself. Well, the senora threatened us twice with a shotgun, senor. She made it clear she does not want our help. Well, she'll do no such a thing this time, Cisco. And we really do need your help. Please. Come on, then. Oh, all right, senor. Lead the way. Well, maybe you'd better we leave the door open so Pancho can get out of here in a hurry. If they say they want to go for a shotgun again. Oh, I wouldn't do anything like that, Pancho. I'm awful sorry I've done it before. Well, why the sudden change of heart, senora? The thousand dollars that we scrimped and saved and then paid out to Dandy Van Swearingen for that helmet. Oh, you mean the helmet of the conquistadores? He's right here, no? It was all my fault, Cisco. If we listened to Josiah, we'd still have our money. I understand. Vance and Dan, they only wanted to swindle you out of the thousand dollars. See, that Vance Borrego, he, he, he's not going to buy it at, uh, at all all the time. Can't you like to try on this helmet? <laughs> he makes Pancho feel like the Grand Caballero. <laughs> Oh, Cisco, Cisco, this helmet is tied up on Pancho's head. Pancho, lucky, get it off! Take it easy, Pancho. Here, 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 let me try to... Oh, you hurt Pancho! Leave him alone! Don't put on the helmet, Pancho, Josiah. 
Let me get it off that way. Steel go with Pancho, too. Quickly, me, senor. Give me that first, senor. Then the nameless editors won't cut through steel. No, but they will cut the leather liner inside the helmet. They will be able to get it off. Oh, Steel's go with me. Careful with you. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, oh, oh. All right, all right, all right, Pancho. Oh. Yeah, you are not hurt. Oh, hello, gracias, Cisco, gracias. You saved Pancho's life again. Hey, look there, Cisco. That paper fell out in the helmet when you got it off of Pancho's head. I know, senora. It looks like a map, Cisco, and it's got burn writing on it. Why, it's only to you, senora. It is Spanish. Oh, what did it say? What did it say, Cisco? Well, it seems to be a diagram of the stage directions for one of the actors from La Operata Espanol. The Spanish Opera Company. Why, the swindling liars saying that helmet was wore by Cortez. Well, they were lying, all right. Senor, it's Senora Gildak. I have an idea which, if it works, will get back your money for you. Oh, what is the idea? We'll do anything you say. You said, senor, that this paper from the helmet looks like a map. Now, if you were to let that thought of yours be known around town... Hmm. There'd be nothing wrong in my saying I think I found a treasure map. Tell me, is there anyone else in town who can read Spanish? Mm, no, since going out of soul. I'm sure of that. Then we will take the chance. If those coyotes stand in advance, fall into their own trap... Sell them back the helmet with the paper we found. Punch and I will be in the back room when the trouble begins. And we will finish it. <laughs> it worked. Everybody in town's talking about the treasure map. They all want to throw in to help me find it. What about Van Swearingen and Borrego, Sr. Josiah? Well, they're hightailing it over here right now, Cisco. I saw them headed this way when I come in the door. Well, then we got to get in the back room quick, no, Cisco? Gee, come on, Pancho. Now, what we'll do, Josiah, when they come in here... But don't you? I'll handle it. Yes, Josiah. Can I stay and watch? Mm, you can stay, but you keep your tater trap closed. Greetings, gracious lady. I intended to pay my respects sooner. Get to the point, Dandy. Oh, uh, yes. Well, now, uh, ethically and honestly, this helmet is really mine. I was not aware of its contents when I sold it to you. I'm prepared to buy it back. For a thousand dollars? My don't you? Well, I don't know. All right, how much do you want? We're willing to pay you a profit. It's not the profit. Uh, you sure you want it? Oh, positively, my dear Mr. Gittleback. Now, uh, here's the money. Uh, count it carefully. Uh, now, the helmet. All right. Uh, here it is. And the paper that was in the helmet. Oh, yes, yes, the paper. Uh, let's see. Oh, here it is. The paper and the bill of sale you made out to my wife. Uh, the map. The map. We've got it. Now, now all we have to do is to get that Spanish writing translated, and we'll know where to look for the treasure. Perhaps I can help, senor. Well, I... Um, I read Spanish. Is this gold kid again? Si, sí, and Pancho. The Spanish writing on that paper explains the stage directions to the member of the Spanish opera company who wore that helmet. Vance, we've been swindled. No, no, senor. The helmet and a piece of paper were sold back to you. You insisted it was a map. Now, if you try any more of your swindles anywhere, I will hear about it. And you will put in a long stretch behind bars. Come on! Robert, <laughs> oh, Josiah, I'm so proud of you. You got our money back. I'm so happy. Now, <laughs> Everything will be all right. I'm so happy, too. And Pancho's so happy for both of you. Pancho like to see a happy ending come to good people who have got trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, those two swindlers, eh, eh, they not try never no more to, to, to do no more swindling, Pancho Dink. <laughs> well, 
If they have any brains at all, they will not punch you. Oh, that right, Cisco. Pancho, no. Because Pancho got brains. You know, Cisco, Pancho and Big Maria together, we know everything. You and Big Maria know everything? Oh, come now, Pancho. Oh, that is right, Cisco. Pancho and Big Maria know everything. Very well, then. I will ask you a question. Go ahead, Cisco. Go ahead. Ask the question. All right. Tell me, who was the first Presidente of the United States? Uh, well, uh, that's one question Big Maria knows. Oh, Pancho. Oh, <laughs> 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 Cisco Kid returns next week with another thrilling adventure. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.